दर यूट्यूब फेसबुक लाइव अभी बोला कर दो कर दो सर अभी एट फिफ्टी थ्री हो रहा है नीचे सेइंग दे टेक फ्यू मिनट्स टू स्टार्ट अप द लाइव थिंग चेक कर लो क्या आ रहा है अब बस चेक करो देखो यूट्यूब टू मिनट टाइमर लगाना एट फिफ्टी फाइव पे स्टार्ट कर दो पोर्ट बना के बना के फिर आप तो पोर्ट बता आ, देना जब लाइव स्टार्ट हो जाए नहीं इस माइक को ऑफ करना कोई नहीं मैं बना दूँगा लाइव पोर्ट बना के फिर क्या दिखा रहे हो आप मैं अभी आप क्या दिखा रहे हो नौ बजे से पांच मिनट पहले पोर्ट बना दें कंफर्टेबली बैठो असिस्टेंट की चेयर के पीछे भी टॉवल लगा दो टॉवल लगा दो इस पे ठीक है ठीक है सर बस आराम से लेटेगा हाथ ऊपर नहीं लाना आपको
morning, everyone. Uh, we welcome you to the Retina Workshop uh, 2022. And we have uh, lined up a wonderful program for you. And uh, we hope you will enjoy it. So initially, we'll start with the live surgery. And uh, we'll show a few cases. And after that, we'll have a, a few sessions on medical, surgical, et cetera. So now I'm transferring you to the operation theater uh, for live surgery. Thank you, sir. So a very good morning to all participants. Operation theater. And uh, uh, a very good morning to all participants. And we have with us uh, for surgeons, uh, Professor Rajpal, who is head of Vitroretna ROP and QVR services here at RP Center. And he himself has got vast experience in the field of vitroretinal surgery and has special interest in macular surgery, like macular hole. The first case that we are having in the live surgery session is a 53-year-old male which he complains of diminution of vision in the right eye for five days. And he had history of cataract surgery two months back. Next slide, please. So the vision is hand movement close to face. We are accurate in the right eye. And uh, fundus uh, photo, can we see? Okay. So it's a subtotal detachment yes. with bullous mm -hmm. configuration superiorly with two HSTs, so one center temporal and one superior nasal. So sir, we are <coughs> doing uh, uh, VR surgery. Uh, uh, gas. Over to you. Good sir. morning. So, sir, is uh, Professor Arshad is being Dr. assisted Pajaj. by our senior resident, uh, uh, Dr. Ravi, and by sister Navjoti. And we are also joined with Dr. Rohan, who is also standing by for special comments. This is a regimentation retinal detachment. We are having a multiple break, two break, big break. And the core with me. Eight minutes. But other center. Okay. Okay. The ports have been made at 3.5 millimeter. And sir has started with core with me. Well, this is a big break. I am doing the trick me around there. <coughs> Save mode, Captain. <coughs> you know, when you are near the break, you should have a less suction more cutting. You should relieve the, all the traction around the brake. This is hard to tear, as you can see. And I am just cleaning the vitreous around the brake. You should be very careful while removing the vitreous. I think PVT is already there. But still, I will check. Suction compress. This is another brake. And Dr. Rohan is with me, Dr. Soria. As you can see, with this, it is important to clear the peripheral vitreous around the brake. There should not be any traction. It is a pseudo fake cardi. Little bit of vitro sandwich in clearly. Just tell us the machine parameters. So we are operating at 5000 cut rate and uh, maximum suction what we have kept is around 400. Infusion is 25. And which mode are you using? So uh, proportional vacuum. Yeah, thank you. 
track out all the pvd is there but i will just put the track out Keep start this Keep shooting. Keep my call then. Okay, decline. Ah, see, the left side. Trackout makes the visibility of vitre more clearly vitre can be seen with the trackout. सेकेंड बार आना चाहिए As you can see, tricot is coming, so this shows that it is not adhering to the PVD. The PVD is complete. This is the one sign which we should do. Section come for this. It is important to do complete mattress removal around the brake. Any of the delegates have uh, questions, kindly type that into your chat box and we'll try to get back. What are the questions? They will type in the chat box. Okay. Okay, Dr. Ron, then yes, you can come. Yes. Thank you. Good morning. We are using a wide angle lens with an inverter, contact wide angle lens. Now, sir has already performed the core vitrectomy. Yeah, Rohan, there's a question from Dr. Vivek. Uh, it says, what does the tricot present on the posterior pole seen in this case signify? So, uh, sir had put the tricot and he tried to aspirate it. It was coming easily and without any uh, crystals sticking to the vitreous so that shows that there is a complete pvd so we'll remove the remaining tricot later now it has no purpose it was just to identify the vitreous whether there is a posterior highlight still sticking to the posterior pole or not so in this case there the pvd is already there 
Yeah, don't you just tell us if you are diluted the tricot or you are diluted? Uh, we use one is to one diluted. So the most important thing in these surgeries is that we need to clear the vitreous from the breaks. So I think you can see the break. Is there any change in your parameters now? Uh, so I generally don't change the parameters much, but I keep adjusting the suction with my foot switch, foot pedal. So as it is proportional, if I press less, the suction will automatically reduce. What is the suction at this time, sister? 185. So we have set it at 500, but the actual suction which is coming is only 185. But you also move to the shave mode, I presume. So actually, we are using 5000 cut rate, so I have not even changed to shave mode because I have become accustomed to it. Although, yes, like there is saying, it might become safer in the shave mode because the vitreous cutter stays open for even a lesser time. Yes, what Rohan is indicating here is the two different types of surgeons. Okay, some of them uh, operate with the full throttle on. Their, uh, their foot switch is almost completely pressed down almost throughout their surgery. That's a little risky. It may decrease your surgical time, but it also tends to increase the risk of hydrogenic tear formation. Okay, so the control with your foot switch is extremely important and as youngsters I would request to not learn the habit of operating with the foot pedal completely pressed down. Center maker. Yes, what you note over here is that there is no tricot particles visible over there, but we're still seeing the vitreous. Okay, so one way of seeing the vitreous uh, efficient way, that the posterior vitreous base, is to elicit the Tyndall effect. Okay, and when you elicit the Tyndall effect, the directionality of your endoluminator is extremely important. If Rohan moves the endoluminator beam away, it seems like there is no vitreous. Okay, so always try to elicit the Tyndall effect in the periphery, and that will improve. Or your vitreous removal. So even where the retina is attached, it's better we can remove as much of vitreous as possible. Although, yes, there has to be a balance between not being too aggressive and then creating a break. Dr. Pradeep, if you may allow, then can we move on to our second case while the, in the meanwhile, sir can finish the peripheral vitrectomy? Yes, sir, yes. Yes. So, can we have the slide for the second case? Yes, so the second case that we will be operating is a 62 year old male patient. We are com with complaints of diminution of vision in left eye in six months. Next slide, please. Yes, on examination, the vision is 2 by 60. Yes. And on fundus yes. evaluation, we see a full thickness, large macular hole. So there is a uh, you know, you can see the live on over yes. large yes. macular hole right yes. in the center. Yes. 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 You can see the uh, MLD is 433. Yes. And this surgery. Will be performed by no, Dr. Vinod and Professor Atpal. And uh, Dr. Vinod is additional professor here and uh, is a prolific surgeon. So now I hand over to Dr. Vinod. Andy. Am I audible? Yeah, we know. Audible, I guess.
but uh, okay so this is a patient with the large full thickness macular hole so we have already done he is a pseudo phakic patient we have already done core vitrectomy pvd was there pre existing so i checked with tricot that uh, pvd was already there you can see some tricot particle on the surface of the retina as well as on the disc so once we have confirmed the pvd next step would be to stain the ilm and we routinely use brilliant blue g dye for uh, staining of the ilm it's a very potent dye so i have loaded it in my 2 ml range and there is a soft tip cannula and now i am starting to stain the ilm so some people like to stain it under air but as i said bbg is a very potent dye so all you need to do is some puffs over the surface of the retina and uh, again it's a, perf a personal preference while some surgeons like it to like that ilm is stained densely for their ilm peeling but once you are experienced enough even a mild staining of the ilm would be enough so as you have seen we just done fused puffs of uh, bbg dye over the surface of the macula and then we are going to wash off the dye so i am using cutter for this purpose uh, uh, the passive uh, active vacuum of the cutter with the cutter function off i am using to wash off the dye so if you can see there is a uh, mild uh, very light staining of the macula uh, ilm in the macular area and most of the times it would suffice so once all the dye and tricot particles have been washed off we'll be moving towards a uh, uh, high magnification lens that is uh, we use flat lens by chellam so we'll shift to that lens now ilm so again there the most important step in ilm peeling is a uh, uh, creation of edge so in the past we used to use barbed mbr or hypodermic needles uh, then we moved on to ddms and now we have more sophisticated instruments like finus loop uh, which are present with us but by and large here in rp center we are using a card type ilm forceps uh these are gish harbor disposable forceps by elcon and uh, uh, pinch and peel technique is used lens center center lens so you can see the ilm has been stained nicely there are some tricot particles on the surface of the macula that does not bother us and uh, usually you start in the temporal macula to pinch so i pinch the ilm uh, if you saw and uh, so sometimes the ilm will tend to break off but uh, it should not be a problem you can start it off again and it's like you know cricket wickets moment you touch the retina they go off red similar thing happens with retina also so ilm tends to so at times you may not be able to peel continuously but ek second 
uh, just change the lens so there is a air bubble underneath the ilm uh, sorry lens so which is just So some cases you would notice that ILM tends to break off, but again, you can re-grasp it and peel it again. So Vinod, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Any any advantage with the ingenuity that you're using? Uh, sir, the magnification is excellent, and uh, of course, uh, once the magnification is enlarged, you can uh, peel it very nicely. And of course, they say that there are filters, but usually we stain only, and then only we peel. Uh, other and advantages, I think. Especially in the periphery, the magnification may be higher. So, uh, and anything to do with the illumination also, we know? I can't hear you, sir. Uh, anything to do with the illumination, illumination also? Yes, sir. Illumination is definitely advantage because normally, if you, uh, we use thirty at thirty or forty. Uh, uh, the illu illumination power, the light power. But once uh, we are using in uh, Angenuity, the illumination used is much less. So we'll be using around 10 to 20 uh, power of the illumination. So that way it is said that it reduces the phototoxicity of the macula. Yeah, so what we know says is very important, okay, because most of the surgeries we operate, the macula is already deranged, so we don't talk much about photic maculopathy, unlike in cataract surgery, okay, but these surgeries, you're seeing the amount of intense light that you're focusing on the foveal area, so the risk is really there, okay, so with the ingenuity, you can bring down the illumination to significantly lower Was values, water or that may reduce the risk of... Uh, Retinal photo or macular phototoxicity. So you can, if it breaks it off, you can peel, uh, grasp, and re grasp, and then you can peel it off. I'm just trying to give it finishing touches. So we have peeled around two disc diameters, and I think that should suffice. Uh, once the ILM has been peeled, the rest of the work is very simple. <laughs> That's a very difficult question to answer, sir. Uh, by and large, nowadays, we will peel almost all the cases, except in traumatic cases, you know, where there is underlying macula is not healthy, the RP has degenerated due to trauma or patients with traumatic optic neuropathies. Okay, okay. Those are the ones we don't like to uh, operate. And uh, also, uh, the long standing, once we have a history of more than one or one and a half years, then uh, those are the cases, even if you close the macular hole, vision is not likely to improve. So, what are the various uh, macular induces? Uh, again, a very important question, sir. Uh, in the past, we used to use uh, several indices like macular hole index, hole form factor, uh, which we were using. 
but nowadays the most important parameter which we use in a macular hole is the minimum hole diameter and by and large if the holes minimum hole diameter is less than 400 microns then they close off very well and uh, if they are more than 400 microns then we uh, like to do certain changes like inverted flap technique so my vitrectomy is already complete ilm has been peeled so i'll go to air fluid exchange no sir i think uh, that is something we used to do in the past but nowadays we don't do that air on air on please so air has been put on i am using active suction in the middle of the cavity sister so dr vinod if you will allow us we will go back to dr rohan sure sure to sure see the finishing steps of the vr surgery over to you dr rohan okay so while uh, you have seen the ilm peeling there we were completing the vitrectomy over here and this one step i wanted to show you that you must remove the vitreous with your left hand also so adjacent to the ports you should do some vitreous base shaving and in between we have removed the vitreous and we have also marked the break edges with cautery so here we need to go quite close to the retina keep the suction down while i am moving the cutter here if the flap moves it means there is still some vitreous left despite the cutter being little away from the flap so that is an indication that the vitrectomy is not complete yet or if the retina moves so you have to shave it a bit more if the vitreous is clear from the horns and around the break then the chances of redetachment chances of pvr are all reduced so what is the question sir we have two breaks extending over two clock hours more than that and the rather than two breaks we have three breaks because the smaller one is in a lattice and when i have done vitrectomy over it a small hsp again has opened so in these cases what we feel with now modern instrumentation the success rate for one single surgery is best with a vitrectomy let not me so now the vitrectomy again is uh, okay around this break and now probably we'll go ahead with drainage yeah, i got it like, uh, uh, was mentioning you have a specific uh, specific uh, indicators where the success rate of pneumatic is likely to be high and this is not one of them now we will uh, be proceeding with removal of the tricot and then air fluid exchange to the break itself uh professor rajpal will be taking
Hmm. Uh, to uh, see both of the silicon tips that we use, the silicon tips over here have been trimmed. But uh, what I guess for longer tips, longer tips. Yeah, they are longer tips. They are. Huh. It takes a little longer to insert into hmm. the valve cannulas, but with a little patience, uh, and you do will be able to get it in. Yes, and yes, that, yes. That will decrease the risk of you touching the choroid. Yes, it yes. Decrease the risk of touching the choroid. So at least when you are learning your initial cases. We try to use a full length uh, silicon tip with a little patience. Mm -hmm. huh? But that a periphery man. Uh, I want what's your uh, parameters? Uh, Mm -hmm. yeah. So we have kept mm -hmm. the air pressure at 35. Mm -hmm. The vacuum for extrusion is around 380 millimeter of mercury maximum. Sister, hai long tube. Uh, why why are you there the posterior retinotomy in the situation? So we thought it's a uh, large size break, so we probably might get away by draining through the break itself. And even if little bit subretinal fluid then remains at the posterior pole, we can leave it. That will absorb later. But if we are having a problem, then any time again we can always make a retinotomy supranasal to the disc. Too heavy. So we are creating an extra hole in the retina. Sometimes once you laser it, sometimes a membrane can form over it. Although now I have seen that with the small incision surgeries and the good removal of vitreous that we do, we hardly get an ERM even on the retinotomy. Earlier when we were making larger ones, we used to get membranes there. And, uh, so, if you can drain from the pre-existing hole itself, then why not? Why create an extra break in the rectum? Yeah, what would you suggest for uh, resident surgeons? Would you say that they avoid a posterior retinotomy or make it a habit to make a posterior retinotomy in their initial cases? So for beginners, retinotomy, a small posterior retinotomy can, is always helpful. So you are, the surgery that you do, you should be comfortable in doing it also. I think it is better to... The long needle, long, long tip is sister. Dana? Yeah, okay, so there's always a difference between what the experts operate and what you're going to do as a young surgeon, okay? So don't get carried away by what you're seeing today. Go back, discuss with your peers, see what how they learn when they were young, okay? So we all learn the hmm? and we have somebody with us guiding us. So don't try to implement all the steps you will see yeah, all the time. It breaks, it breaks, okay? you know. it Hmm. Hmm. Certain, uh, situations or they prefer to use uh, VHCL, uh, but that probably was not indicated in this situation, hardly any fixed poles. But I think despite that, many centers prefer to use VHCL and train uh, using VHCL. Okay? 
Yes, so that is also an option. Uh, we can put PFCL on the posterior pole and take it in the edge of the brake. So that settles the posterior SRF, and whatever is remaining anterior can be drained through the brake. But it increases the cost of surgery, and we have become habitual of doing it without PFCL. So we are managing without it. But yes, like sir said, some centers do use PFCL uh, assisted drainage. कौन सा कन है फोर्थ बना देना सुनो विद डायबिटिक विट्रेक्टिंग पूरा कवर कर देते हैं मैं आता हूं विट्रेक्टिंग सुनो मेरे को 10 मिनट में जाना है 10 बजे So we generally make a two step entry only and what's the angulation commonly so i do it around 30 degrees and then change it towards the center of the globe uh, some people do it at 15 degrees also and then they make a through and through entry with 15 degrees so you see here marking the brakes with diathermy is important because then you don't have a very good reflex Uh, from the RP, sometimes in these myopic fundus, after air fluid exchange, it becomes difficult to identify the original location of the break. Mm. Is that slightly longer silicon bit, so your safety margin increases? Okay. Now we have this fluid at the posterior pole, but the fluid from here has almost gone. Uh, do you have to stop indenting in the periphery, or you still prefer to indent and uh, complete your vitreous removal? With these wide-angle systems, now most of the time I get away without indenting with the contact lens. And uh, do you do anything under air? Can you treat me under air for the peripheral vitreous? So that is an option that you can do to treat me under air. But personally, I don't do that because I feel that the end point is not very well defined in that. And sometimes there is a risk of probably touching the retina also with the cutter. Although I think Dr. Vinod prefers to do treat me under air at all. So again, there are many ways of doing the same thing. You should probably learn some of them or all of them, and then whatever you are comfortable with, and you can safely perform. That is the technique you should adopt. Is it? Sir, you know there with you, the one. Sir, around there. You have to join the discussion. Okay. Yeah, we know. Sir, I think uh, I personally uh, always uh, do vitrectomy under air. Uh, that is something which helps me to reach uh, up to the aura uh, in almost all the eyes without any indentation. So, especially in patients with retinal detachment, I am very skeptical about leaving any vitreous. Of course, we can't clear 100% in all the eyes. But whatever I can, I do my best to remove as much vitreous as I can. You know. All the retinal detachment eyes. So vitrectomy under airs one, it but it causes is pushes the retina back. So there are the risk of uh, 
uh, retina coming into the cutter decreases quite a lot but uh, as dr rohan mentioned uh, especially in the uh, initial few cases it is difficult to define what is the end point but uh, i think over a period of time as you do more and more you realize when to end it and uh, of course uh, risk of peripheral breaks is always there whether you do it under air or without air so mm. that is something we have to always balance our vitrectomy uh, as a general rule uh, we do as much vitrectomy as much we can do without uh, creating any further breaks so it is it is surgeon preference and it is important to remove but uh, the thing is in the beginning when we were there where a wide angle system was not there at that time it was very difficult to remove but we used to have a scleral indent we used to press periphery so that the vitreous uh, should come in the anteriorly and we used to do vitrectomy to complete the vitrectomy in a pvr cases it is very important to remove all the vitreous peripheral Yes. now in how many cases uh, there is a controversy regarding uh, the the formation of erm i mean certain cases erm forms so some people are doing ilm peeling so we know would you like to tell in which cases you would like to have a ilm peeling sir any patient where there is hardness of the or any uh, uh, or if i feel there are a lot of uh, retinal folds in the macular area these are the cases where uh, i almost always feel ilm in these cases uh, earlier i used to do uh, ilm peeling in detached retina but now uh, i've shifted mostly to uh, ilm peeling under pfcl in these eyes uh, i feel uh, under pfcl ilm peeling is more controlled in uh, retinal detachment eyes uh, i think uh, i have a talk later about ilm peeling and i will be talking about a study where we performed ilm peeling compared ilm peeling versus no ilm peeling in fresh retinal detachment and we did find that while uh, it made no difference in the visual outcome the chances of macular erm formation are definitely lesser with ilm peeling in these eyes we are just going back to the peripheral vitreous removal in patients with retinal detachment that's the most important thing for you to prevent the, the occurrence of anterior pvr subsequently okay so there are three ways of removing the peripheral vitreous one is with indentation 200%. one is you remove the vitreous at your power but also under your white feet and the third i will not say goes to do it under air now all of these you must understand what the principle behind all of these is i'm still not Uh, comfortable uh, not indenting. So, in majority of my patients, at least in two to three patients, I would like to indent some quadrants at least and try to remove the vitreous. But when you're doing it under air, what you must understand is that you're already sure that there is a bulk of vitreous in the periphery. If you've already done significant amount of vitreous shaving under fluid, or you remove your vitreous under indentation please do not try to do your vitreous uh, i mean repeat your vitrectomy under air because there is not enough vitreous for you to get any purchase over there so you may inadvertently touch the retina in those cases okay so only when you sh- when you are kind of not done adequate peripheral vitrectomy during your initial steps only then should you attempt doing a vitrectomy under air okay that tends to send the retina back and remove that residual fraction Like you know, we're also mentioning it's more intuitive. There are certain reflections that you can see in the periphery when when there is vitreous there. You can see a kind of shimmering reflex. Uh, that's one of the indicators, but more or less it becomes new intuitive. So, but again, for beginning residents, please do not attempt that form of vitreous removal. Uh, Doctor Mahavir has asked about the pneumatic retina pexy. So, please discuss what are the side effect complication pneumatic pneumatic retina pexy. You know, you should not do in all cases. Which are which? What are the indications and what are the contraindications? Like in this case, it's sort of faking multiple breaks. So we should not try new retina pain. Doctor Pradeep, sir, could you discuss the the complication? Yeah. Uh, one is it's supposed to, there was single success rate of pneumatic when they did it initially. The Tronby and Hilton when they get there. 
results of 500 odd patients, they claimed a single success rate of uh, 75 to 80 percent, and that's pretty good for a fresh retinal detachment. But like I mentioned, you have clear cut indications of when you should use this method. And it's more successful in fakic patients, okay, less successful in pseudo fakic patients. So uh, these cases that we're operating these days, most of them are already pseudo fakic. Now the complication that you generally tend to see uh, following pneumatic retinopexy is related to the bubble. There's a bubble failure because the technique of injection, the way you load the air gas itself, Many a times you leave it to leave it to your assistants to load the syringe. So the amount that you're injecting may be 0.3 of CTF8 or 0.6 of SF6. But the next day you see the bubble is already shrunken to a significantly small size. Okay, that's typically a bubble failure. That's not a failure of the technique, but a failure of how you have to undertaken the procedure. So in those situations, you can consider repeating the gas. That's one. If you've got an adequate bubble, okay, how do you detect the bubble adequacy is to have the pupil well dilated, see the bubble uh, margin, the lower margin, how much of the pupillary area is occupying. Okay, that's one way of judging if the bubble adequacy is there. The second reason for failure of these cases is inadequate patient positioning and that it's not easy to maintain that position for long hours. And Patient has position yes, and even then you have a failure, probably having a missed break or a new break formation. And if okay. a pneumatic detachment, uh, pneumatic retinopathy fails, the risk of posterior uh, proliferative vitro retinopathy is much higher. Okay? Yes. So you've got to take care of uh, these factors. You have to tell your patient beforehand that you're trying a simple procedure. If it succeeds, it's the best thing that can happen. But if it fails, you're probably encountering more complications. So okay, thank done you, Dr. Pradeep. have a wide laser around this hole because after this drainage, I was not exactly sure of where the edges are. So we've done a wide laser around it. We cover the entire uh, large break here. And the other breaks have also been lasered. Now, three six. I would just examine the... Retina and the Ora 362 look for if any other suspicious area is there. In such a fresh case, probably I will not do a 360 degree laser. There is this one suspicious area here. While we were doing vitrectomy, I saw a hemorrhage. Just as a precaution, I am covering this also. Uh, we know there is a question for you. Many, uh, this is from Preeti JN. Many times, mentor says it's challenging to do ILM peeling in detached retina. Tips for the same for a beginner. But we know seven seven. Hmm? Yeah, Preeti, I think we know they'll be discussing this in detail at a later presentation, and I think we could uh, come back to this uh, at that point if it's all right with you, Preeti. So, Dr. Pradeep, actually, we know. Start, Dr. Vinod has started start. the other case okay. simultaneously, so we'll be answering the question once we move over to him. Again, just anterior to this large break, there was this thin area. So I don't want to take a chance with lasering that or as well. Uh, Rohan uh, and Dr. Rajpal, so there's a question for you. What's the role of 360 degree laser in the periphery in pseudo fake retinal detachment? So in such a fresh detachment where you know definitely where the break is, and I, like I said, I screened 360 degree, I did not find any other break, so I personally have stopped doing it. But yes, if you are not very sure of the breaks, or if the patient has some PVR and you have done some membrane peeling in various quadrants, then it's a 
good idea probably to do a 360 laser also and uh, then the laser should be three to four rows at least broad not a very thin just one or two spot laser so like in this case as i said i won't be doing that 360 yeah, but still it's not very critical to do a 360 degree laser uh, intraoperatively. You would also do this postoperatively, either using a slit lamp delivery or even an LIO. Okay, so if you have constraints with doing a 360 degree laser for want of time or for want of a proper instrumentation, you could always do it in the immediate uh, postoperative period. So before putting gas, I just remove this pre retinal fluid once again because i don't want an underfill so slowly the fluid from the sides settles down on the disc so you see despite drainage earlier again when i put this green tip there i am getting fluid so keep the retinal surface as much dry as possible even now the posterior pole fluid has reduced significantly little bit is there but i think we can leave that and now we'll Put gas. Take port banana. Lights on. Ha, me. Port banana. Look, me. Me. Okay. Ha. Twenty. Nay, port banana. I am reducing the air pressure Lens. to twenty now. <laughs> and I prefer to put sutures even in this twenty-five gauge vitrectomy because I don't want any gas to leak. Later on, and we are using a 14% non expansile mixture of C3FA. So, again, there are various ways of injecting gas. We are showing you one of them. This suture I am passing is again in reverse. This I have learned from Professor Pradeep, sir. You can pass a, in this direction also, but inadvertently, if it goes on to the aura, that is a small risk. So, I have learned to pass it in the reverse direction. Professor, he'll only turn right. Since it's an air filled eye, he will put some saline. And if there are no bubbles, that means there is no leak. Dr. Ravi, there is no leak here. Cut. Reverse. Artery. 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 Now we are clamping our infusion line. And instead of the machine air, we are attaching the C3 effect mixture to it. We want to wash off the vitreous cavity well with the C3 F8 okay. mixture. We have taken about 50 ml of the gas. We should, okay. We should uh, thankful to the professor Devan Singh Pityal for giving us the opportunity. And at this moment, we must remember the professor L.P. Agarwal, who is the founder of RP Center, because of his effort, the RP Center is at this stage. And uh, we must respect or remember all those people who have worked in the retina, Professor P.K. Khosla, then Professor yes. Tiwari, yes. then Professor Raja, Professor S.C. Yes. Garg, and our colleague who has gone outside, Professor Lalit Barma, Dr. Dinesh Talwar, and uh, lastly, Professor Afil Kumar, who has initiated the immunity in our key center so i was balancing the pressure with the vent as my dr ravi was injecting through the infusion we were balancing the high pressure with the vent and allowing some gas to escape like uh, Ron was mentioning the other technique which was actually uh, reported sometime in 2000, uh, 2008 to 2010 was to blindly inject 100% of two pieces gas okay? 
Now this is reported but not followed uh, by most surgeons because the dynamics of the gas were not did not know what the dynamics of the gas is. And uh, I think the uh, shift cardinal of Okay, we have a next case. If uh, you may allow, then we can move on to our third case. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Can we have the slide for the third case? Uh, there, there's one more question from Dr. Preeti. Uh, Next case. Who is doing it? Rohan, would you be able to take a question? My name is Go ahead, sir. Yeah, this is by uh, Dr. Preeti. She says, uh, in your experience in cases with unknown or not found retinal break, during 360 degree laser, doing 360 degree laser really saved you and your patient. Is there any situation like that? Not any the break at all. So yeah, I not found a break and you. Uh, yeah. yeah. So in that situation, definitely I would do 360 laser and now with this wide angle uh, system and especially under air, you Lagan. can see even more periphery. So the laser can go right up to the aura. So. And from the aura, we do three to four rows posteriorly and uh, cover it well. And we should be sure that posterior to our laser again, there is no open break. And then leave it. And that has saved a few cases, definitely. Yeah, this is again by Dr. Preeti. Can you elaborate more on what you meant by reverse passage of sutra during no, no. post closure? Yeah, I'll just show you. So that just means that we are holding the needle this way. So the tip is going not towards the aura, but it is going towards the limbus. Hey, but that... So that's the only thing. Second case ka bata do. Yeah, what you're actually trying to emphasize here is, you're passing this suture anterior posteriorly. You have a tendency if you go a little deeper or in myopic eyes, you either hit the aura anteriorly or the retina posteriorly. If you go deep and you don't realize that, but when you pass the suture circumferentially to the limbus, okay, you're not going to have this risk. So that's a small. Point, but sometimes it does happen that, uh, and uh, it was more likely when we had a 20 gauge, you're trying to close the port, and then you suddenly have a bleed. And uh, the situation you end up with the vitreous bleed just when you're completing your surgery. Okay, but the, passing the circumference in the manner that Rohan was uh, showing you, you want to uh, eliminate that risk. Dr. Pradeep, can we move on to the next question? Sir has already started. So can we have the slides? Yeah, so uh, this is the case with sudden diminution of vision since two months, preceded by floaters. The patient is a known diabetic. Uh, on examination, you can see that there is a, uh, in the right eye, IMSC NS2 with the uh, pigments on the posterior capsule. And uh, in the left eye, there is a, a image of senile cataract NS2. And on fundus evaluation, you can see, you can move on to the next slide. Yes, so in the right eye, vitreous image with mild to moderate amplitude spike. It doesn't seem that there is any TRD, but there might be a focal traction that might be present. In the right eye, uh, in the left eye, you can see there is a diabetic retinopathy, which is partially lasered. So this surgery will be performed by Professor Rajpal and assisted by Dr. Aman, our senior resident, and uh, uh, sister uh, Ramya. So moving on, and I'm handing it over to Professor Arthur. Uh,
uh, uh, sir has already performed a uh, fecal emulsification with IOL. So right now the patient is pseudo fecal. Also was performed on the Ingenuity 3D display system by yeah, Dr. Vinod. Shaurya, what are the parameters? Shaurya? You can do it. Look at how. So, parameters are yeah, the machine parameters. Sir, we are using 10,000 cuts per minute. Vacuum is 500. Infusion pressure is 25. Yeah, I gave you a notice that uh, Dr. Rohan was using 5,000 cuts and you're using 10,000 cuts over here. Uh, Abhinod, could you just tell us uh, why you prefer 10,000 cuts? Uh, sir, I think uh, the cutting is much faster and uh, traction is less. Now, uh, when we were using 5,000 cuts per minute, uh, usually the vacuum was in the range of three to 400. But with 10,000 cuts, if you keep it at 300 cuts per minute, uh, 300 vacuum, that is very less and your cutting will not be effective. So if you are using a uh, cut rate of 10,000, one must move to a higher vacuum of either 500 or 600. And that will give you a very efficient cutting of the vitreous with minimal traction on the retina. Yeah, in this particular situation also, it's important to realize two things. You see, one is the cut rate and the sufficient parameters. So there are two reasons that you can tear the retina. One is because of the suction and one is because of direct contact with the retina itself. So what I have realized is that when you go to 10,000 cuts per minute, you have to go closer to the retina. There is no way that the vitreous is going to come into your port if you stay away like you stay with 5,000 cuts. You have to go much closer to the retinal surface and obviously it means to do better control. So the risk of inducing a retinal tear by direct contact with the retina is much higher when you're using a 10,000 cut rate. On the other hand, if you're using 5,000 cuts, the risk of inducing a retinal tear using suction is higher. Okay, So you probably need to create a balance over there. So please do not use a 10,000 cut rate uh, right in the beginning because, like I said, you will have to go much closer to the retinal surface and when managing retinal detachments particularly, they are at a higher risk of causing atrogenic tears. You know, in that case, Okay, so Dr. Rajpal has to go to uh, auditorium, so I'll be taking on from here. So, but now, Dr. Pradeep, you should discuss uh, even after TRP, DRA needs vitreous hemorrhage. So, what are the causes of vitreous hemorrhage even after doing TRP and whether TRP is adequate or not? This resident should know how to do TRP and uh, what is the adequate TRP. Quite accurate in the situation. Mr. Shaudya mentioned that there probably is a focal traction. And as you're proceeding with the surgery, mm -hmm. you are indeed seeing some focal traction as it is. Okay, the hyaloid there is still attached. If you remember the ultrasound, there was no indicators of obesity in that. At least in the posterior mm -hmm. retina. So in this patient, core vitectomy has been done. So if you see, there is a lot of hemorrhage, uh, which has been cleared partially. I'm doing uh, and clearing the vitreous as much as possible before I go on to attack 
the posterior proliferation. Now, if you see the media is not of that clarity which you would want to have in such a scenario. So, just in a few, once I complete this vitrectomy, so we'll go to anterior mode once again. So, and see if there is any problem in the anterior. Hmm. Which could be anterior segment, which could be compromising our visibility. So, at times, especially in eyes with vitreous hemorrhage, you will find that the anterior vitreous uh, is mixed with blood. So, that could be the reason why your uh, visibility is compromised. And I don't usually hesitate to do a posterior capsulotomy in these eyes. So that will give us better visibility. So I've done the anterior vitrectomy, cleared the anterior vitreous, made up a hole in the posterior capsule. Just a second. Just. So you can see there is a hole in the posterior capsule. So now we move to posterior segment once again. And you would realize that suddenly media has become clear. So now you can see clearly that there is some bit of vitreous hemorrhage, which is there at the posterior pole, some membranes, and some blood on the surface of the retina inferiorly. So this can be very easily removed with the help of active suction. Not only it helps you give you a clear view of the retina overall. It also gives you the overall view of the retina and you so that your perspective is not, not lost during vitrectomy. So you can see most of the hemorrhage has been cleared. Uh, the vitreous is not there in the mid periphery, only in the periphery vitreous is left. So I'm shaving off the peripheral vitreous as much as before I go on to the posterior membranes. It's always a good idea uh, when you go to the posterior membranes that there are no anterior attachments of these membranes because if you are peeling and these membranes have anterior attachments with vitreous, they can pull onto the peripheral retina and cause peripheral breaks. So we have almost completed the posterior vitrectomy. Now we need to remove these membranes. For that, we'll be going to the high magnification lens. So Wet the cornea, please. Dr. Vinod, if I may ask, uh, what would you prefer if the patient has cataract surgery as well as a vitreous uh, cataract with a vitreous hemorrhage? Would you prefer to do a cataract surgery in the same sitting, or would you? Want yeah, to I think uh, I am of the opinion that we should always uh, do a single stay surgery. I in this patient also, in fact, we did cataract surgery. Uh, not only it helps you to give uh, do a complete job at the posterior pole uh, in the periphery, it also helps the patient save another surgery. Yeah, I'll just add a word of caution to what uh, Vinod said, and not be contrary, but a word of caution over here. Okay, again, it is not. Uh, I mean, analytically Amen. proven that a single stage surgery is more beneficial. There are situations where you can end up with corneal edema. The surgery, surgery can get complicated. So not all of you should attempt a single stage surgery when the cataract allows you to perform a surgery without any disturbance of the anterior chamber. Please perform the posterior seg segment surgery first. But the cataract is significant, I think, as beginners, uh, I mean, even now, I'm more comfortable doing a sequential surgery than doing a combined surgery. And the literature is still very gray on this. There are surgeons who are vouch for single sur single stage surgery, but there are many who say that there is post-operative significant inflammation and higher risk of NVI despite an uncomplicated su surgery. Okay, so I would not recommend a single stage surgery in your university. I hope uh, the uh field is not over exposed. So you can see these membranes, these diabetic membranes have typically many attachments. So you can see one attachment here, this vessel being pulled. So we are going to do something, lens uh, segmentation. 
uh, so I have sweared this attachment. You can see this end is bleeding. So this we can cauterize later on. So fortunately for me, these membranes are raised from the retina. So they are not very difficult to remove. All you need to do is trim off these membranes. You can see some of these ends would bleed, but they will automatically stop over a period of time. So you don't need to increase IOP unless they are bleeding profusely. Uh, especially in diabetic eyes, the optic nerve heads are compromised. So you can see all those membranes have already been removed. So now we can go to high magnification lens. Uh, uh, sorry, uh, wide field lens. Yeah, yeah, we know there's a question by Dr. Preeti. Yes, sir. Yeah, doing early caps, uh, posterior capsulotomy increases the risk of fogging, especially for beginners who may take more time in surgery. Uh, What's your opinion on post -cap, posterior capsular removal and fogging? Uh, sir, it is uh, very common. I think it should not be a problem in most of the eyes. All you need to do is uh, layer the posterior capsule with some amount of viscoelastic and uh, it does not bother you again. So you can see we had these membranes which had three attachments mainly, one along the infratemporal arcade at the optic disc, one along the supranasal arcade and another along the suprotemporal arcade. So you can see there is a bit of bleeding from these sides. So, and there's another attachment between these two sides. So these can be removed. And uh, you don't need to go very close to the retina to remove these epicenters. Sister, uh, yeah, one point I'd like to emphasize with regards to intraoperative bleeding like this is uh, if you anticipate that they're going, there's going to be bleeding, it's better to increase your IOP before you actually attempt removing these membranes mm -hmm. rather than increasing the IOP after mm -hmm, you have mm -hmm. the bleed. Okay, keep your anatomical visualization pretty good. So the moment you realize that yes, this is likely, to increase your IOP, then perform the procedure of removing the proliferation. Yeah, we know there's another question by Dr. Winston Padua. Yes, uh, sir. He says, how do you identify Diathermy. the fusion cannula in the eye with dense vitreous hemorrhage? Uh, uh, sir, I think most of the times the it is visible uh, if you look through the microscopes. If you are doubtful, uh, you can put illumination from the opposite uh, uh, port and then uh, identify the infusion cannula. IOP 30. So you can see most of these uh, bleeders are not. Uh, Uh, bleeding too profusely, it's a localized bleed. But again, then you should not let the let a very huge clot form because that itself can act as a uh, center of proliferation in the later stages. So you can see the fovea is clear. There are localized bleeds at the sites of uh, previous epicenters, which we have removed now. Uh, this one I, is bleeding actively, I think, and uh, this one. Again, so we'll have to go to high magnification lens to cauterize these. Chalo. हाँ जी क्या आ गया होने वाला जी मोस्टली हो गया जी लेजर बचा है थोड़ा सा इसमें टाइम लगेगा सो यू कैन सी दिस आर वन टू 
and three. These are three points from where it is bleeding. So we are going to wash off the blood and then cauterize if necessary. For the time being, I have put the IOP to 60. Yeah, we know another question uh, by Dr. Preeti. Uh, she says increasing microscope magnification and removing posterior pole membrane versus using contact lens. What's your practical experience with both viewing systems? Is it worth purchasing macular contact lenses in the beginning yeah. or can one manage with high microscope magnification? Sir, I think uh, posterior lenses are, uh, the high magnification lenses are necessary and uh, without them, it's just not possible to perform the posterior surgeries. Uh, I usually you do wide field contact lens that is min, uh, mini called as XL lens, but uh, you can increase the magnification and do go do away in certain situations, but not in all. So, you know, what she's asking for is the posterior pole membrane. You know. Anji sir, uh, I think uh, it's better to buy a macular lens. Yeah, PT, you don't actually have to get a salam lens or a self retaining lenses. The Landers lenses are pretty affordable. You get a range of these Landers lenses. Uh, so, one site of bleeding has been taken care of. Now we are going to second one. Yeah, so you can still use your simple Landers lenses. You see, the, the reason these uh, simpler lenses are more efficient is it doesn't, there's no loss of stereopsis. Okay, so the plano concave lenses still have the best stereopsis and that's most critical when you're managing these posterior membranes. Okay, so I don't think it's much of an investment getting a set of Landers lenses. So you can see this point is bleeding over here. Another thing you can do is like what I'm doing, you can directly press onto the retina. but at times it may not be sufficient so in that scenario we'll have to do cautery system what's your intraocular pressure we know at this point sir at this point it is 60 in spite of that that particular point is bleeding so it's very high sister cautery So it was bleeding profusely, now it is not. Just a subtle bleeding is there. So I think we need another point of. So if you see macula is healthy, uh, fovea, there are no, epi no ILM stri, no uh, macula edema, so we won't be proceeding with ILM peeling, but if there is any doubt about macular edema or epidermal membrane, I like to peel ILM in these cases. Uh, okay. Khatam kar rahe hai. Five minutes, okay. Yeah, uh, a few months ago, I learned some, uh, something from Dr. Yeah. Parijat while I gone there to watch his ROP surgery. Okay, ji. He told me something about the pinch test. Moon se nahi hat sakta. The incision line to keep the general bleeding and And if you apply that in these cases also, you're going to appreciate that if you just inject gas and leave the patient, the next day you're going to have a hemorrhage. So doing this pinch test, even in patients with diabetes retinopathy, will help you identify the bleeders intraoperatively itself. Okay, and you can immediately diatomize these bleeders. So Sister IOP 35. So that really saw that So once our traction has been relieved. The bleeding has stopped. We can go to air fluid exchange. Uh, normally, I would do with the soft tip cannula, but uh, because I want to complete the peripheral vitrectomy with cutter, 
so i am not changing the instrument नहीं दिख रहा फिर सो यू कैन सी दिस लार्ज चंक्स ऑफ पेरिफरल विट्रस यू कैन इजिली डू अंडर एयर सो यू कैन सी विद एयर इन सी टू यू कैन सी द पेरिफरल विट्रस विच वॉज नॉट विजिबल अर्लियर एंड अगेन हेयर द आइडिया इज नॉट टू शेव ऑफ द विट्रस बट टू डी बल्क द विट्रस मोर विट्रस यू कैन बस लेजर जस्ट चेक दैट ऑक्सीजन इज गोइंग ऑक्सीजन देखो आ रही सो द पेशेंट इज गेटिंग लिटल रेस्टलेस सो विल जस्ट वॉन्ट टू कंप्लीट ऑफ दिस सर्जरी बैक फ्लश एंड देन लेजर Pardon, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah, this is from Dr. Vivek. Uh, in this PDR case, would you put tricot to check posterior hyaloid shiasty? Uh, not always, sir. Only if I have a very significant doubt, I will put tricot in these patients. It's not common to have uh, uh, posterior uh, layers of vitreous once you have found the correct plane. Laser. So, sometimes we make in these cases the blood itself acts as a good screen. No, that is just coming down. No, is is got in diabetic patients. Mask not be as critical as in patients with rheumatoid detachment or if you doing a macular surgery or. Just five minutes, lagey, boy. Yeah, Doctor Rajpal is uh, here with me now. One fifty, one fifty, one. Decrease the power one twenty. Decrease the duration also. Rohan, just for the time being, what is the good PRP? I mean. PRP is very important for the resident point of view, and very important. You know, you must do the PRP carefully, and uh, and that is the one thing which will. Uh, yes. So whether you are doing a surgery or whether you are doing a slit lamp PRP, a good PRP like sir said is a must, and you should know how to do it. So what we generally do is that we laser from the arcade. बस अभी खत्म कैसे करें ना? अभी दो मिनट रुको. Laser कर रहे हैं. आपको oxygen लगी हुई है. Oxygen से समान. छोड़ दें बीच में. 300 micron laser to the disc. And from the macula again you can leave about two days. अभी पांच मिनट लगेंगे बस. दो. But that is all that you leave and from there you go on up to the far periphery. Earlier they used to say that. बल्लू भैया. Uh, yes go but now with our wide uh, lenses we can go up almost up to hmm. the aura and if you use lio even definitely you can go up to the aura so it's a good idea atte hataya to hua hai bhaiya so because even uh, like doctor arpal said oxygen lagi hui hai aapko so that is when we have oxygen lagi to hui hai aapko theek hai ab ji ji aap band kar de nahi one thing is pdr does not cause decrease in vision it is the sequelae of pdr which causes decrease in vision which causes all the this should you should understand patient of pdr can have a 6 by 6 vision it is sequelae vitreous hemorrhage fractional detachment all these factors which causes decrease in vision and you know pdr is one of the important pdr with high risk in the exam if you are asked the indication of prp then pdr with high risk but in certain cases which rohan will tell in which we uh, we, we are also doing prp can you tell rohan so with early treatment of diabetic retinopathy study has already given certain uh, situations where you can go ahead and do early prp 
so if patient has a very severe npdr and the other eye has not had a good outcome or patient is unable to follow up uh, regularly which is a common scenario in our setup if the patient is not maintaining good diabetes control then probably it is a good idea to do a prp a little early uh, high risk criteria definitely we don't wait if we see pdr we are generally going ahead uh, with prp but even before pdr is what sir probably is, wants to mention so if you feel your patient is not maintaining a good diabetes control cannot follow up regularly other eye has had a bad outcome then go ahead and do a prp in that state. another interesting question is vitreous hemorrhage with pdr so what are the various possibility which you can do a patient of pdr present with vitreous hemorrhage if a patient has had a recent bleed then wait for some time wait for a week two weeks give some prop propped up position some of the hemorrhages uh, settle down on their own and even through the hemorrhage if you can see some peripheral part of the retina you straight away start prp in that quadrant if the bleed is not clearing on successive examination say two weeks or one month now probably we will not wait for three to six months about a month period would also be sufficient if you are sure that the bleed is not clearing and it's a dense bleed then you can go ahead directly and do a vitrectomy you know it is said in vitreous hemorrhage people are doing now in pdr diabetic vitrectomy early they think there is a traction going on you must understand there should be a no traction posteriorly some people do ultrasound see traction if traction is present then the surgery should be done early like in this case prp is already done but traction is also there you know the because of the posterior vitreous hyaloid and all these things because the pvd because of the adhesion multiple adhesions are there so so in this case uh, you saw that traction was relieved and there was traction which you could identify in the pre operative ultrasound itself and the bleed is not clearing for a while so not a bad idea doing a vitrex what so is the like idea of uh, anti vegf giving before surgery we are routinely giving anti vegfs when we find that the case is complicated and there is significant fibrovascular proliferation which we need to dissect because giving anti vegf reduces the vascularity and on table it makes it little easier the things bleed little less but if there is not much fibrovascular proliferation if it's just a simple case of vitreous hemorrhage you can go in directly and at the closure of surgery you could give an anti vegf but if there is significant fibrovascular proliferation initially which you can see and you have to dissect the trd and all the proliferation then give an anti vegf wait for 2 3 days and go ahead and uh, do the surgery even before so, doing prp you must see whether the macular edema is present or not that is very important one thing which pradeep will highlight is good examination pradeep will highlight examination of a retina patient diabetic retina patient so would the aapki when i think we'll, we'll can we have that later sir ha ah, later okay then okay. aapki ah, presentation jab ah, hai ah, so there's a question that's why uh, vinod ah. again there's a question for you uh, from dr preeti Uh, what's the minimum number of spots you aim to put with endo laser in pdr cases if the patient gets uncooperative <laughs> uh, so as much as i can there is no definitive but definitely i want to cover the periphery anterior to the equator because that is the part which will you will not be able to do uh, later on on slit lamp So some people might uh, have started saying that once you have done a vitrectomy, why do you do a PRP? You have already removed the highlight, you have already removed the traction. But then uh, it's a good idea to do it for various reasons. One, it also covers the capillary non-perfusion area, so definitely reduces the subsequent VEGF in the eye, and that VEGF would also be contributing to some amount of macular edema. And I have also seen that if you don't do a adequate PRP. uh some of these cases later tend to develop new vascular glaucoma so again uh, just a vitrectomy would not suffice if you can do prp as much as you can on table like dr vinod said do it if some part is left you can complete it later on on slit lamp uh, dr ron if i may interrupt you so uh, i think uh, we so we'll just finish this case and with this we can end the uh, Thank you, Doctor Sawyer. Yeah. yeah, so we'll just finish the live surgery session over here. I think all of you might have gained a lot from this uh, live interaction while doing surgery. I, I would like to thank all the surgeons, Professor Ajpal, Doctor Rohan Chawla, and Doctor Vinod Kumar, as well as all the OT staff and everyone involved in bringing these live surgical uh, session in the morning on a Sunday. So thank you, everyone. So over to you, Doctor Rohan.
So thank you, Shorya. We will break for 15. Is there any question? Any, we have five minutes before we go for a break. If any question is there, please you can put in the chat box. Yeah, thanks, Preeti. Uh, Preeti says the session was nice. Uh, okay, so we'll take a 15 minute break here and then we start our uh, other sessions. We have interesting sessions on uh, imaging, diabetic retinopathy, uveitis, and ROP. So please be with us. All of you can take a 15 minute break and join us again. Uh, just a minute. Dr. Pradeep has to see. Yeah, uh, again, there's a question by Dr. Preeti. Uh, what are the ways to control and clear intraoperative bleeding? Rohan, you will. Yeah, uh, Preeti, Dr. Rohan is just telling you about these. Yeah. So, first of all, like we said, give preoperative Avastin that reduces the vascularity itself. But yes, definitely you will have intraocular bleeding. So, if it is minimal, the first step uh, can be you can uh, increase the intraocular pressure, raise the bottle height to 60. But don't keep it for too long, otherwise you'll get corneal edema. So you raise the water light for some time, the bleeding will stop, then you can coagulate that uh, bleeder. So identify the bleeders and coagulate them early. So uh, don't leave them, because if you leave them and they bleed, and you get a significant bleed on the surface of the retina, then it's a problem at the end. You have another membrane there to tackle. So uh, you should always stop the bleeding remove your cutter and stop the bleeding as in where it is coming from. You can even use direct vitrectomy cutter pressure <laughs> on small bleeders on the retinal surface. You can also use laser. Laser also acts like a diathermy and some of the bleeders which don't have traction can also uh, coagulate by the laser. If it's bleeding right at the disc, then it's a problem. You can't do laser, you can't do diathermy. Then the only thing you can do is raise the bottle height, close the ports and wait for some time. All bleeds generally would stop. They say even a bleed from the aorta would stop if there is sufficient pressure in five minutes. So all bleeds will stop, but you have the surgeon needs to have patience. Just hold your hands, wait for a while with the high pressure in the eye. If yes, corneal edema develops, then you will have to do a endo, uh, epithelial removal. But we can manage most of the bleeds. But don't leave bleeders, active bleeders. Keep uh, managing them in some way so that you don't get second bleed membrane. So there's another question. What is the extent of endo PRP? So that's the same. So we'll go from the arcades up till the aura. And like Dr. Vinod pointed out, it's a good idea to do the peripheral one on table because it's easier. The posterior one, you can always do laser uh, later on slit lamp. And what you have to leave is just about 300 microns nasal to the disc and two disc diameters from the fovea in all directions. So basically the posterior pole, the rest of it laser. Okay, thank you everyone. We'll just take a short break and we'll be back with you in 15 minutes. Thank you. Thank you. 
Good morning once again. So we have had a short break and I would again request Professor Rajpal sir to start the next scientific session. I hope all of you are still logged on and even if you are also having a tea break, please join us again. Thank you. Over to you sir. Uh, I have time over here. Good morning everybody and uh, uh, we must thanks to the Professor L.P. Agarwal who has started the RP Center and we must not forget. And we must also forget the, all the people who are pioneer in the retinal surgery like Professor P.K. Khosla, Professor H.K. Tiwari, Professor S.P. Garg, Professor Ajad, and those who have left the RP Center, Professor Lalit Varma, Dr. Dinesh Talwar, and recently Professor Tul Kumar, who is the, one of the pioneer in the vitro retina surgery in RP center. And uh, presently we are having a uh, team of expert. All are very good in surgery, like Professor Pradeep Venkates, Professor Rohan Chavala, Dr. Vinod, and Dr. Sare Ajad. Parijad Chandra, along with Rohan and me, are pioneering uh, along with Sare Ajad in the ROP surgery. So we are in a, in a matter training the people in vitro retina. We have got the 50, 56 senior resident and we have got around 15 senior resident in vitro retina unit. So now I I, I ask Vinod to start the first session. Uh, good morning, everyone. I hope you enjoyed the live surgery. We tried to keep it uh, very live in the sense nothing was uh, kept away from you. This is how we normally function in our OTs. And uh, now we'll be starting the session on imaging. And I think uh, all of you are aware that imaging has been the most significant change over past two decades in the field of vitro retina. So first speaker is Dr. Nawajish. Uh, she is a senior resident with us now, and uh, she is very hardworking and very energetic senior resident. She'll be highlighting few facts about what is new in the field of retinal imaging. Dr. Nawajish, please. Good morning, respected faculty members and my dear colleagues. I'm Dr. Nawazish Sheikh, Senior Resident RP Center, and I'll be presenting on what's new in retinal imaging. The first modality I'd like to talk about is the OCT, which provides us with a non-contact optical biopsy of the retina. The spectral domain OCT introduced in 2006 is well established in all our clinical practices, and it can be combined with the confocal scanner, scanning laser of thalmoscopy, such as the spectralis system for better retinal imaging. One of the drawbacks is that with its 
840 nanometer wavelength the imaging deeper to the rpe is poor in such cases we can utilize the enhanced depth of imaging in which the zero delay line is shifted posteriorly that is it shifted to the outer retina and choroid instead of the ilm uh, the SS OCT or the swept source OCT combines a, combines a longer wavelength of 1050 nanometers as well as increase increase scan speed such as systems such as Topcon comprising of the Triton Dry OCT. Due to this longer wavelength, not only can we visualize the retina in patients with media haze such as cataract and vitreous hemorrhage, but we can also visualize the deeper choroidal structures such as the dilated hallows layer in patients with CSE and the choroidal vasculature in patients with choroidal hemangioma. So this was the basic difference between the two. Uh, the OCT could get integrated in the surgical microscope such that it can provide a real-time feedback during surgery such as this video clip that is not only showing the ILM, but it's also showing the shadowing by the instruments. Further on, uh, we can do a 3D reconstruction of the OCT to provide us with exact localization of vitreous traction and which will allow us for better preoperative planning of surgery. <clears throat> uh, conventionally, OCT is usually used to visualize the posterior pole or the macula, such as this 6mm OCT scan in a patient of CSC in which we can barely visualize the subtle NSD. But a larger 15mm OCT scan with a field of view of 55 degrees not only allows us to see the NSD, but also demarcates the exact NSD edges. We've got the ultra wide field OCT now, which comprises of 23 mm OCT scan through the opto silver stone, which allows us to visualize the retinal periphery, such as this case of peripheral retinoschisis. And it won't be long before we would have an entire section of the eye as an OCT. The second modality would be the OCTA available on a multitude of platforms such as the Zeiss Angioplex, the Spectralis and the Triton. Uh, similar to the OCTA, it allows us to visualize the foveal avascular zone through the 3 into 3 mm scans as well as the 6 into 6 mm scans. Other than this, we can even visualize the uh, beyond the arcades of the retina through the 14 into 14 mm montages. It's equally efficacious to evaluate retinal vascular findings such as venous loops, NVE, and NVD, although it lacks uh, in patients with leakage. The third modality is the fundus photo, which comprises of conventionally comprises of 20 degree, 30 degree, and 50 degree imaging. Because of this small field of view, we can montage these images to provide a larger field of view, but it's time consuming. To combat this, we have the ultra wide field imaging, which provides us with a 200 degree field of view of the retina, which comprises roughly 80%. And these images are pseudo color because it comprises of the red and green wavelength. The angiography as such has had limited evolution since its introduction in 1961 and 1971. But the basic change that has come about is the ultra wide field angiography. So this image roughly comprises about 102 degrees showing the NVE block fluorescence and CNP. So this was a patient with right eye vasculitis sequelae. This small field of view requirement of different gazes for periphery was time consuming. But this single field image of 200 degrees not only shows the above findings, but also enumerates the peripheral CNP areas, mandating us for better decision making, such as this case of right eye Coats disease who underwent one sitting of laser, but there were still persistent areas of peripheral CNP areas, hence air augmentation was required. Similarly, the ultra wide field ICGA helps us uh, comment on the pathogenesis of PEHCR in which we can see asymmetric dilated choroidal vessels and asymmetric dilated vortex ampullae as well as polyps at the posterior pole. Other adjuvants to this imaging would be red free imaging, fundus autofluorescence. So this was a patient of senile choroidal dystrophy imaged using the 55 and the 200 degree. Future directions for this would be the fluorescence lifetime imaging of thalmoscopy, which basically allows us to measure the lifetime of fluorophores. This would allow us to differentiate between the lipo, uh, between lipofusion and melanin, the different fluorophores in the retina. The clinical utility of which is yet to be determined, but it has some uh, utility in early diagnosis of AMD, Stargardt disease, hydroxychloroquine toxicity, and MACTEL. But this is time consuming as it requires up to three minutes for imaging of one single eye. 
Another new imaging in development is the retinal oximetry. Since we can directly visualize the retinal vessels, we can uh, use it as a non-invasive assessment of retinal blood oxygen saturation. So it, the potential for its use in the early diagnosis of diabetic retinopathy, but it's still a research tool. It would not be complete without commenting upon the adaptive optics in which we reduce the optical aberrations of the eye so that individual photoreceptors are visualized through a Hartmann-Shack sensor in the form of Voronoi images. Again, the clinical utility is yet to be determined. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Nawazis. And Dr. Nawazis has done a lot of work in the OCTA and RP center. Her thesis was on that. So could you elaborate some of the important advantages of OCTA as compared to angiography for the... So OCTA is basically a non-invasive dialysis angiography, which provides us with in patients with uh, pregnancy or in patients with anaphylaxis to the dye, we can easily use this. Even in patients with chronic kidney disease who are skeptical about injection of the dye, we can go ahead and do this. It's equally well to pick up uh, new vascularization elsewhere new and new vascularization at the disc and retinal vascular abnormalities the only drawback of the OCT is that it has a very small field of view but there is currently multiple research going on to increase this in the form of montages and uh, it does not allow us to visualize a leakage as we can see in an FFA and before preclinical uh, before clinical manifestation of diabetes you can detect certain changes in diabetes Yes, sir. So what? Huh, tell so, me so what I saw in my thesis was that we could detect preclinical microaneurysms. Normally, micro uh, microaneurysms become visible at more than 30 micron size, but in OCTA we were able to visualize this in patients with no clinical DR. Okay, we could okay. pick up these microaneurysms as well as capillary dropout areas. Okay, thank you, Dr. Nawajis. Now you, I will invite Dr. Vinod. who will be talking about imaging retinal disorder, how to proceed, as you must have seen surgery of Dr. Vinod, and he's a very good vitro retina surgeon who is in RP center. Now he will be giving his talk, Dr. Vinod. Uh, thank you so much, sir, for the kind introduction. Uh, so I'll be speaking about imaging in, imaging in retinal disorders, how to proceed. And we are all aware that uh, uh, retinal imaging has revolutionized, revolutionized the field of uh, retina over past two decades. And I hardly find a vitro retinal person who is not interested in the uh, field of imaging. And uh, with that, we have now several imaging modalities are available and it has changed the way we practice retina. And with so, so many of them available to us, it is often difficult to decide which one to choose in a particular patient. Of course, given the choice, we would like to do everything in every single patient, but that is of course not possible logistically. So Dr. Nawajish has given us a fair idea about how, what all is available with us. We have standard color photographs with various monochromatic filters. We had various wide field imaging systems and also multicolor imaging system, which is available on Spectralis platform. We, ha we have various kinds of autofluorescence, which are there. Most commonly, we use short wave autofluorescence. We have uh, dye angiography in the form of FFA and ICG, which is available on both uh, CL CSLO based, that is confocal scanning laser ophthalmoscope based cameras. And they are available now in wide field fundus imaging systems. Uh, Dialysis angiography, as we talked about, is the latest frontier. And of course, we have OCT, uh, which is available with us for past two decades now, three decades almost. And it is the first test usually done, which is done usually because it is non-invasive. Again, we have various kind of generations of OCT and our old friend that is ultrasound, which is time tested. Now, what is this concept of multimodal imaging? This is when we do two or more methods of imaging to improve the diagnosis, treatment, or prognosis of the patient. And of course, these should be done, these should be done in a short span of period. And what we do typically is combine one uh, sort of NFAS imaging system, which could be either in the form of angiography or uh, head-on photographs, and combine it with one cross-sectional imaging, that is OCT. 
now which one to use in a particular patient there is no preset algorithm and we must do a good clinical examination in a particular patient and make a differential diagnosis and then we can uh, do particular imaging to decide what uh, which is the diagnosis now remember decision is aided by the knowledge as to which lesions are better imaged by a particular modality it is something similar to uveitis that we don't do all the investigation in a single patient but uh, we do history and examination take good history and examination then decide which one to proceed with so i'll give you a few examples about color photograph have a look at this particular patient you can see a red lesion beneath the macula we do a oct it shows us a elevated macular lesion along with a overlying macular hole which is not very well visible on the color photograph we go ahead with monochromatic imaging you can see on red free images you can very nicely see the macular hole but on green free you can see the uh, choroidal lesion now just to confirm the diagnosis in this particular patient we went ahead with faicg which confirmed presence of a window defect due to macular hole and a choroidal lesion and this was a patient with macular hole overlying choroidal hemangioma coming to multicolor photographs these are basically a combination of infrared green and blue laser light reflectances this is multicolor imaging infrared uh, uh, which is a combination of these three and infrared is basically used for the lesions of choroid and the outer retina while green and blue are used for the retinal and the retinal surface respectively now have a look at this oct scan you can see a mac, uh, macular erm with a pseudo hole but the moment you go to a color a multicolor image you can see all the aspects of a epiretinal membrane along with its secondary effects on the retina this is uh, the re uh, green reflectance image of a fibrovascular proliferation in a pdr patient you can see all the small vessels of neovascularization can be well highlighted on a single image and is very good for the reflectance but don't fret if you don't have multicolor imaging or these kind of system uh, on fast oct which is available in most of the oc system oct system is as good as for epiretinal membranes as is for multicolor imaging and of course red free images are there in most of the photographs but if you don't have you can do fluorescein angiogram or octa for the uh, documentation of scene now a lot of, has been talked about uh, subretinal drusenoid deposits which were very difficult to see earlier uh, document earlier but with the help of newer imaging systems for example multicolor photographs you can see how nicely they are visible and you can see them on autofluorescence as well as infrared reflectance imaging also so while it was a challenge to make a diagnosis of sdd earlier now with the help of imaging system we can make it very easily now have a look at this particular patient the fundus almost is normal uh, the OCT looks almost normal, but moment you go to infrared reflectance imaging, you can see a lot of these bright lesions, which are nothing but choroidal hematomas of neurofibromatosis 1. Thereby just highlighting again the fact that certain lesions are highlighted better by the certain kinds of imaging. Uh, coming to wide field imaging system, you can see this epidural membrane at the macula you can see we have made a montage but there's no obvious lesion but moment we go to ultra wide field imaging you can see in the retinal periphery there are some telangiectasia with exudation we do a fa and it's a very typical picture of a coats disease which has probably secondarily led to epiretinal membrane another patient you can see a macular hole a young patient no history of trauma so it's again cause remains dubious but what is curious in this particular patient is that you see there is disc edema in both the eyes the moment you go to a color image you find there is a cystic circus and you know that the disc edema in this patient is probably due to a neurocystic sarcosis uh, coming to autofluorescence just few uh, to highlight images you can see some yellow lesion in both the eyes uh, oct is suggestive of subretinal fluid or hyperreflective space in the subretinal space moment you go to autofluorescence you know that you are dealing with a case of bestrinopathy and now we know that autofluorescence that is short wave autofluorescence is indispensable for retinal and choroidal dystrophies and it is the standard of uh, uh, care for documentation of geographic atrophy in patients with amd in various trials as well uh, a similar patient you can see pprca but infronasal lesions are not very clear, which are very well seen on patients uh, in autofluorescence. Now have a look at this particular patient. Uh, right eye, you can see some yellow scar at the fovea. 
uh, OCT shows some subretinal fluid, left eye almost normal looking fundus, but the moment you go to autofluorescence, you can see so many changes which are there, not only in the macula, but extending inferiorly in the form of gravitational tracts, and you know you are dealing with the case of CSE. Similarly, in patient with choroiditis, while it will explain good vision in a patient like this, where the foveal island is paired, at the same time, in a patient like this, it is very useful to decipher the activity of the lesions. Uh, irregular hyperfluorescence would suggest that lesions are active, while the black area suggests that the lesion has healed. Now, certain few other cases, if you have a look at this particular patient, this patient presented to us with vision of 6 by 60, uh, minus 5 diopter, diagnosed as ametropic amblyopia elsewhere. You do IAF, there is some lesion which is there in the fovea in the form of bullseye. Go to OCT, there is a subtle, very small EZ defect right at the fovea in the both eyes. We know that this patient is probably a case of cone dystrophy and full field RD, ERG would confirm the same. So at times, anatomical changes can be seen by imaging, but you will need a physiological test to confirm the diagnosis. Uh, again, a very interesting case. This patient was referred to us with some vision of 6 by 24, uh, which happened after cardiogenic uh, uh, shock. You can see some macular lesion, dark macular lesion. FFA had been done earlier. You can see almost normal. ICG was normal. When we went to OCT, you can see there is subtle loss or attenuation of EZ at the foveal area in both the eyes. And also there is thinning of the outer nuclear layer. You go to octa, superficial plex is normal, but in the deep plexus, you will see there is circumscribed loss of uh, deep plexus. So this patient was diagnosed as bilateral AMN following shock. And this particular case shows us that how subtle findings in certain patients will require best of all imaging to interpret. This is my last case, uh, a patient who clinically appeared as clinical uh, choroidal hemangioma. When we went to FAICG, you can see FA findings while they match choroidal hemangioma, ICG remains hypofluorescent. So we went ahead with ultrasound. Again, uh, the, uh, the lesion was some choroidal excavation with some internal attenuation. Uh, OCT, again, a large choroidal lesion with overlying fluid. We were not sure of the diagnosis. We went ahead with MRI, you can see there is Hyperlesion in the T1 weighted images while hypolesion in the T2. Uh, so we, which was suggestive of melanoma, but uh, we were not sure. Again, we went with the PET scan, which showed that there's no active uptake. Uh, we waited for some time, but uh, six months down the line, uh, we retained our diagnosis of choroidal hemangioma. The patient underwent uh, double dose PDT and is doing well. So what we, I want to tell is imaging may sometimes be difficult to interpret and clinical equipment is supreme for decision making. OCT has already been talked about. I will sp skip this slide just to say that several of our current uh, diagnoses are based on OCT and is the single most important investigations we do nowadays. And often it is the first and the last investigation. Uh, we often get asked, is diangiography really necessary? Uh, in AMD, uh, Octa is fast replacing FA and ICG. Probably the only indication of uh, ICG would be PCV, where you want to uh, see polyps, which are not well seen on Octa. In vascular disorders, most of the findings can be picked up on Octa as well, but limited field of view is the only current in, uh, limitation of Octa. Uh, I feel inflammatory disorders, uh, diangiography has an edge because the leakage, which cannot be seen on Octa, can be seen on diangiograph. And also the disc leak, which is a very important clinical marker of uh, activity, cannot be seen on Octa. So to conclude, retinal imaging has improved by leaps and bounds. Different imaging modalities highlight different features of fundus lesions, and choice of imaging is guided by the clinical features. And remember, interpretation of the imaging must be in sync with the clinical scenario and not the otherwise. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Vinod. Any questions from the participant? See, please put your. Uh, you can put your questions in the chat box. We'll try to take as many as possible. Uh, Dr. Vinod has nicely summarized the imaging. So, uh, in view of uh, the time, let's move on to the next speaker, Dr. Sanket, who would be talking about an unusual case of AMD.
डॉक्टर संकेत इज अ सीनियर रेजिडेंट एट आर सेंटर चलिए स्टार्ट द प्रेजेंटेशन आई थिंक वन वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट मैसेज विच डॉक्टर विनोद गेव वॉज अबाउट वॉट आर दी पॉजिटिव पॉइंट अबाउट ओसीटी एंजियोग्राफी एंड वॉट आर दी ड्रॉबैक सो यू हैव टू बैलेंस इट आउट एंड डिसाइड वॉट इमेजिंग टू यूज and another important case okay so we have the presentation let's go ahead good morning everyone i'll be discussing a case of amd an imaging surprise so a uh, patient a uh, 63 year old male he presented to us with a diminution of vision in right eye for past 6 months which had worsened over past 2 weeks and he was diagnosed as a type 2 diabetes mellitus 2 months ago and on oral hypoglycemic agents so on ocular examination his best corrected visual acuity in the right eye was hand movements close to face and left eye was 3 by 60 no further improvement in pinhole and the anterior segment was within normal limit both eyes this is a fundus clinical picture of the right eye showing a breakthrough bleed inferiorly along with a subretinal bleed this is a fundus clinical picture of the left eye showing hard exudates at posterior pole along with ped with subretinal bleed this is the oct of the right eye which was suggestive of type 2 cnvm with subretinal bleed along with the fluid subretinal fluid suggestive of active amd and this is the oct of the left eye which was suggestive of fibrovascular ped along with subretinal fluid so we went ahead with fluorescing angiography and icg of the right eye it showed uh, the media was hazy because of vitreous hemorrhage and we could see we could not see because of block fluorescence and sinusins however we could make out some amount of pooling in inferiorly this was the fa and icg of the left eye the fa was suggestive of ill defined leakage and the icg suggested of a polyp along inferior temporal arcade along with a branching vascular network so on examination of the icg peripheral of the left eye we could find another peripheral polyp then we went back and carefully examined the fundus of the left eye and we could find nve along with associated collaterals then we went ahead with fluorescein angiography and we could find a localized nve in the superior temporal quadrant and a peripheral cnp areas suggestive of old uh, superior temporal brvo so we came to a diagnosis of right eye neovascular amd with breakthrough bleed with query pcv and left eye pcv with old superior temporal brvo with neovascularization so for management we uh, injected intravitreal avastin in the left eye followed by peripheral scatter laser of the superior temporal cnp areas however in the right eye we went ahead with a pass pen of vitrectomy with intravitreal avastin and injection tpa along with sf6 and uh, later on the left eye received monthly injections avastin uh, four injections were given so this is a post op day 4 of the right eye post surgery uh, the best corrective visual acuity was similar which was hand movements close to face uh, there was a large discform scar and we decided to not uh, undergo further intervention in the right eye this is the left eye uh, as you can see in the left uh, left eye at presentation there was subretinal fluid along with the fibrovascular pd however at four weeks post first injection the subretinal fluid has reduced and the best corrected visual acuity from 3 by 60 to 618 and uh, hence we continued monthly avastin injections uh, up to four so the take home messages from my presentation was careful peripheral fundus examination is must for correct interpretation of imaging and nve can mimic polyps on icg and prompt management is necessary in amd for better visual recovery thank you uh, thank you dr sanket i think uh, uh, the main message we wanted to convey in this particular patient was that uh, when we looked at the periphery of uh, peripheral icg of this particular patient we were surprised to see a polyp in the periphery but uh, once we did a good clinical examination and fa corroborated our findings we knew that we were not dealing with the case of polyp but it was a, peri a peripheral brvo again just highlighting the fact that no imaging modality should be interpreted in isolation we must take into clinical picture into account uh, before we interpret these findings and of course we know that it is very important to treat all patients of amd at appropriate time to preserve the vision now this patient had already received four injections and now is on treat and extend uh, 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 regimen for the uh, preservation of vision so
viscosity of the left eye, sir? Right. Uh, go to slides. Yeah, yeah you're seeing those uh, pseudo cystoid changes over there, no? Yes, sir. Sankit will be able to tell us what that is. Yeah. Okay, they are this typically outer retinal tubulations. These outer retinal tubulations are a poor prognostic feature. Okay. okay, so because we don't see it very often, so I just thought I'll emphasize on yes. that. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So you. that's a very nice point highlighted by Dr. P.V. sir, that whenever you mm -hmm. see outer retinal tubulations, which are nothing but uh, hyperreflective core bounded by a hyperreflective boundary, and typically you see them in outer nuclear layer. So if they are present, uh, they are poor prognostic sign. But remember, at times, microaneurysms can be seen as similar to outer retinal tubulation, but remember, they are seen in the inner retinal layers and not outer retinal layers. Any other questions? So we can move to next presentation by Dr. Devarun. He is a senior resident again with Retina Services. So he'll be talking about a case of uh, uh, unusual case of central serous chorea retinopathy. Dr. Devarun, please. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I will be presenting a case of steroid into CSC. A 54-year-old female presented with a history of diminution of vision in both eyes since the last six months. She was a known diabetic and hypertensive and had a history of use of skin cream, which was probably steroid in origin. On ocular examination, the best corrected visual acuity in the right eye was 6 by 18, and in the left eye it was 6 by 24, and rest of the entire segment was within normal limits. Fundus examination of the right eye revealed a large PED along the supranasal quadrant, and in the left eye there were multiple PEDs along the superiotemporal and the inferiotemporal quadrants, and a large PED along the supranasal quadrant that extended anterior to the equator. Uh, so spectral domain OCT was done, and it revealed the presence of intraretinal edema and uh, uh, the presence of NSD, as can be seen here. And swab source OCT revealed presence of an increased subfoveal choroidal thickness. Fundus fluorescent angiography of the patient revealed presence of multiple smokestack patterns as can be seen here, along with the presence of in-blocked uh, leaks at the posterior pole. And endocinin green angiography was done, which revealed early hypofluorescence as can be seen here, along with pooling of dyes in the PED in the late phase. So a diagnosis of multifocal CSC, probably steroid induced, was made. The patient was asked to stop steroids and focal laser was done to the leaks. On follow-up, at one month, the vision improved in the right eye to 6 by 12, and there was the, the resolution of PED, along with resolution of intraretinal edema and neurosensory detachment, as can be seen here. However, in the left eye, there was a sudden onset diminution of vision to 6 by 60, and ultra-wide field uh, opto CP of the left eye showed multiple hypopigmented areas corresponding to bare choroids, suggestive of RP evulsions, along with presence of an inferior bullous detachment. Fundus fluorescent angiography done at this stage revealed presence of multiple window defects and leakage at the sites of NSDs, as can be seen here, along with masking of the hyperfluorescence by the scroll RP edge. Swap source OCT done at this stage revealed the presence of a wavy scroll RP, as can be seen here, along with the presence of increased depth signal, suggestive of a bare choroid. So the patient was kept on a regular follow-up and tab aplanarone 50 mg and topical carbonic anhydrase inhibitors were started for the patient. On follow-up at six months, uh, vision in the left eye improved to 6 by 36, and there was a resolution of exudative detachment and PEDs, along with multiple hyperpigmented changes and the posterior pole, and multiple window defects could be seen on FA. The right eye maintained a stable vision of 6 by 12 with resolution of PED, and also there were multiple window defects visible on FA. So, Steroids in any form can lead to CSC. RP tears, though reported, multiple RP evulsions are rare in cases of CSC. And since other eyes showed resolution in this case, exudative RD was probably as a case of RP evulsions. Uh, certain risk factors are to be kept in mind for RP evulsions, like uh, PEDs with an increased surface area and a larger linear diameter, increased vertical height of the PED, and an inverse relationship has been found between the duration of PED and RP tear formation. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Debaru. Uh, so uh, it was a very unusual case because the patient had very large peripheral PEDs. 
so it was an unusual case because the patient had large peripheral PEDs and uh, unfortunately on follow up, uh, the patient uh, developed multiple RP blowouts and that probably led to exudative RD in the left eye while the right eye uh, gradually improved over a period of time. Now there is a question from the audience, Dr. Preeti Jan, that what is the efficacy and role of focal laser in CSCR against PDT? Also, is it judicious to go for focal laser due to limited availability of PDT? So, I think I, I'll answer that question. Uh, so, basically, if there are extrafoveal leaks, uh, we always go for focal laser in first go. Uh, PDT has not been available. The dye vertiporphyrin has been available has not been available with us for past two years now. So PDT is something which is very useful in these cases of chronic CSC. So unfortunately, we don't have. So the only left option we are left with is in such cases is probably doing focal laser. And especially if they, it is in the area closer to the uh, fovea, the leaks are close in the area closer to the fovea, one may go ahead with the subthreshold laser. But uh, again, you have to weigh your risk. Uh, against the benefits you are going to obtain from focal laser. Okay, so we'll go to the next part of this session. That is the quiz. Uh, the okay. Dr. Sanket will be showing us few uh, cases, spotters, and I think uh, yeah. we can all take our guesses. Okay, so uh, we have three questions for all of you, and we'll be giving you one minute. So. We'll take the quiz. So the first question is a 36 year old male who is actually retro positive who and the fundus picture is sh as shown below. So what is the diagnosis? Okay. 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 So can you tell the points in favor of CMV retinitis? Okay, so this is the diagnosis is correct. It's CMV retinitis, and it has a pizza pie appearance, and also it spreads along the vessel. So that's how it we can differentiate it from progressive outer retinal necrosis. Okay, so second question. Second. Okay, um, a 14 year old boy refer was referred from outside as a case of CME. Uh, the OCT picture can be seen here. So, what is the most probable diagnosis in this case? Excuse me. Okay. This is the fundus picture and the answer is correct. It is X-Ling retinoschisis. So what are the points in favor of X-Ling retinoschisis? Okay. The multiple sciatic cavities can be seen and there, are, there is a specific spoke wheel pattern as can be seen here. So this is the last question. So identify the imaging modality and what is the classical sign shown here and what is the diagnosis? First, identify the imaging modality. ICG, okay. So the answer is right. It's an ICG and it's a classical smokestack appearance and the diagnosis is CSC. So ideally, we, we characteristically see it on FFA. So this is a corresponding image of FFA. And so that's it. Okay, thank you, Dr. Sanket and Dr. Devarun for those nice cases. I think the message we wanted to pass out again was that it, you have to carefully look at the images before you make a diagnosis of CSC. Oh. Sorry. So now we will start with the next session, which is uh, medical retina. And the uh, first presenter is uh, uh, Professor Praveen uh, Vashisht, who is uh, the head of uh, uh, ocular uh, uh, com community medicine over here. And he is a very important person and he has conducted and uh, been a part of uh, many surveys. Uh, with uh, in association with WHO and the Ministry of Health. Uh, over to you, sir. 
Thank you, Dr. Shorya. <clears throat> I'll be sharing some of the findings of National Diabetic Retinopathy Survey, which was conducted from 2015 to 2019. The entire survey was conducted by RP Center for Ophthalmic Sciences with the help of with the support of local institutes. And uh, I was principal investigator for the survey. It was just published in IGO. In fact, this survey was conducted along with National Blindness Survey. And the key objective of the survey was to assess the prevalence of diabetes and diabetic retinopathy <clears throat> along with sight threatening diabetic retinopathy among people with diabetes. And, and it was conducted in 50 plus age group. And the report was released by a health minister of India. The strategy which was used for this survey was RAB survey, rapid assessment of avoidable blindness, along with DR. It was version six. It was WHO approved methodology and International Center for Eye Health. They developed this strategy. In fact, it was conducted in 21 district all over the country and in covering 17 states. And the selection of these district and cluster was by PPS sampling. In each district, we covered 3,000 people above the age of 50 years in 60 different clusters. And total 63,000 people were uh, covered under this survey. The clinical protocol was standard clinical protocol for diabetes retinopathy. It was dilated fundus examination using indirect ophthalmoscopy. And of course, we grade for retinopathy, maculopathy. And it was based on Scottish classification as given by ICH. <clears throat> where we assess for retinopathy in two different four grades and maculopathy in two grades. And STDR was when it was proliferative DR along with clinically significant macular edema. As you can see, this is the prevalence of diabetes in different districts where we conducted survey. The overall prevalence of diabetes was 11.8%. And you can see in South Indian state was much higher, like in Thrissur, Kerala, it was 29.4%. But in North Indian state, Madhya Pradesh, etc., it was quite low, except in Punjab, Kapurthala, it was slightly high. About known and <clears throat> new diabetic, nearly one third diabetic, they were not aware about their diabetic status. And we did uh, random blood sugar for these. If the blood sugar was more than 200, they were taken as diabetic. And known diabetic, they were getting treatment previously, then they were taken as non diabetic cases. <clears throat> The duration of diabetes, as you can see, uh, nearly 25% patient, they have diabetes more than 10 years, 41% patient, their diagnosis was one to four years, and nearly 5% only in la last one year. Uh, this is a significant finding that nearly 60% patient, their that diabetes was not controlled. The blood sugar was found more than, more than 200 milligram deciliter. And very shockingly, more uh, so, 85% people, they informed that they, they, they were taking some oral treatment. Very shockingly, 90% patient, they were never examined for retina. 90% of the diabetic patient, retina examination was never conducted. If you see prevalence of diabetic retinopathy, nearly 16.9% of the diabetic patient, they had diabetic retinopathy. 7% they have maculopathy. And 3.6% have sight threatening DR. The major risk factor for DR in this survey were duration of diabetes, which is more than 10 years, poor glycemic control, and patients who are on insulin treatment, they have higher prevalence of diabetic retinopathy. You can see that most of the diabetic retinopathy, it was mild DR, 11.8% out of 6.9 is basically the mild DR. If you look for the prevalence in different states, you can see it is much higher in southern part, in Thrissur 22.3, in Kadappa, it was 27.3 and lesser in the northern part of the country. It was much higher in urban population compared to the rural population. As far as blindness due to DR is concerned, there was no significant difference among blindness among diabetic patient and non-diabetic patient. And, and in fact, among the diabetic, the major cause of blindness was cataract. If we see the, the priority of the government and PCB, you can see even at this stage, nearly two thirds of blindness is due to cataract. And diabetic retinopathy just represent 1.2% of the oral blindness. The second leading cause of blindness is, is corneal blindness, mainly known trachometers corneal opacity, which is responsible for nearly 7.4% of blindness. So overall, we can say that yes, diabetes is an important public health problem in our country. 
nearly 16.9 percent patient they have diabetic diabetic patient they have diabetic retinopathy 3.6 percent have sight threatening dr <clears throat> the people who are not going for retina examination probably the awareness is very low the services are not there this may be the reason uh, dr is responsible for just 1.2 percent of blindness so priority as far as npcb is concerned is still cataract but definitely for such a high magnitude of dr and diabetes we need to have a program where we can have screening at primary level and treatment available at secondary level for diabetic retinopathy thank you very much Yeah, thanks, Praveen, for this update. Uh, there's one query that I've always had. Uh, it's believed that uh, Indians are more protected against developing diabetic retinopathy and there may be a genetic protection. But what uh, confirms the whole situation is like even in this study, indirect ophthalmoscopy was used as a screening modality. And that's the least sensitive of all the methods for screening. So is it certified by WHO or any other agency that indirect Ophthalmoscopy is an accepted method for screening. Sir, as far as this kind of cross section survey is concerned, they, they suggest yes, indirect ophthalmoscopy. Even we have better methods, but for a study which, which is a household, like household visit is there, probably this is the only method which we they can conduct, sir. And it has been certified, but it is approved by WHO, this survey actually. No, no, not the survey methodology, mm -hmm. the method of detecting diabetic retinopathy. Like if you see, the ICO classification, it says dilated ophthalmoscopy. It doesn't commit itself to any one particular method, but we know very well that indirect is the least sensitive of these methods. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's one thing that you really need to pay attention in your subsequent surveys because this particular wrong screening method is being projected as us being protected from diabetic retinopathy, which I feel is not true at all. I mean, moreover, because we have a very poor control in our population. Mm -hmm. And way back, almost 20 years ago, when I was a full officer, we had done a similar kind of a thing in a small population in our laser room itself, um, 100 odd eyes. So even at that time, they were in RP center, most of them in and around Delhi, almost 85% of them had not been told that they could develop these complications and they, that needed an eye evaluation. So it's just not in these small districts, but even in urban centers, the, the problem, the problem, it's very problematic. So I think it needs to be addressed very strongly. So, right. so <coughs> Dr. Uh, Parveen, so we, what are the factors, you know, as you know, people are not aware of, even physicians are not aware of. Uh -huh. So what is my idea is even the undergraduate are not aware of all these things. So can you propose for the ministry that all healthcare workers, they should know at least that diabetes have a retinal involvement. And number one, now these days, which you have already told you, undetected diabetes, you know, undetected diabetes now is the targeted population. If you detect uh, diabetic early, and then you can have a control of blood sugar. And second thing is control of blood sugar is also very difficult to maintain. So uh, can you propose to the ministry? Sir, definitely, sir. In fact, there is a suggestion lack. Right now we have ASHA worker. They are posted for every uh, 2000 population in ASHA workers there for every 2000 population urban area, 1000 population rural area. Probably they are the best messengers. They can do a question about whether patient are diabetic or not. And those who are diabetic, they should Tell them that they should go for eye examination, retina examination at the higher level. Probably this can be the best strategy. Thank you, sir. Welcome, uh, you. Professor Titiyal, who is the chief of RP Center. Uh, Dr. Parveen has highlighted, so we would like the chief, that the retina uh, diabetic screening should be known to all residents. It is not the retina senior resident and the person who are coming, as we are aware, that hardly 10% people know that retina is affected. So in the undergraduate teaching program, in the postgraduate teaching program, in the BSc ophthalmology, even paraclinical, they should have a word with it. We are getting a doctors who are having a macular edema, diabetic retinopathy, and they are not having aware. So the awareness can, on the behalf of chief, and you can take to the ministry, that this should be awareness in the undergraduate curriculum, postgraduate, and other paraclinical. Thank you so much. Uh, now I would like Professor Rajpal to welcome and felicitate our chief. Professor Titiyal, sir.
सर फ्यू वर्ड्स सर गुड मॉर्निंग फ्रेंड्स इट्स वेरी ब्राइट डे टुडे नॉट ओनली फॉर आरपी सेंटर नॉट फॉर दिल्ली फॉर एंटायर कंट्री एंड गेटिंग इन टू द आस्पेक्ट ऑफ लर्निंग इट कम्स थ्रू अ ट्रांसमिशन फ्रॉम योर टीचर्स टू स्टूडेंट्स एंड फ्रॉम स्टूडेंट्स टू पेशेंट्स and patient to teachers so it's a, a cycle teaching is always a cycle it never ends in one person so it has to go to a everybody transmission through various means it may be audio visual which we are seeing today here it may be through a live surgeries we had a wonderful live surgery session today from our vitoretna faculty three cases were shown and the transmission was absolutely fantastic things if you see clearly you can also memorize those things clearly in your uh, practical aspects of your own learning curve as well as that would remain for a life long in your memory bank also so this learning which is a process which i talked about we in rp center also are looking for a continuing the medical education from a system which we built up not today for a very very long time in so many decades rp center has been pioneer in conducting workshops i remember those days where the workshops were held in a few institution in a earlier days and the rp center workshop used to last for a two weeks because there nothing uh, for people to see and learn in those days so that those were days and whatever we used to do those days in terms of uh, didactic lectures they were all printed and those cyclo style copies were sent to all the medical colleges of this country and the, those were like uh, today you have so many you know literature in your hand through various uh, you can say web portals those day, those day you had those cyclo style printouts only and uh, even our teachers they used to take lecture for our mbbs students and those were also cyclo style uh, copies and they were given to all the students and uh, even you don't come to classes we used to get in the hostel rooms also those were uh, you know you can see the uh, ethics behind the teaching in rp center we hope to continue similar ethics conduct in rp center today uh, this is a special workshop retina is always a special part in the ophthalmic practice it is very difficult for a general people to understand because most of us can't see as clearly as other people can see what uh, professor rajpal was talking about uh, we should all be able to screen screen the retina thoroughly as a general ophthalmologist also and take care of a disease which may be a absolutely blinding like a diabetic retinopathy in a long term and the, no reversal so disease which is not going to be reverse has to be prevented before it begins before it starts so there is a implication of a doing good surveys which our community departments are doing along with the ministry of health and those surveys will give us the idea what is the prevalence of a disease what is the incidence of that particular blinding disorder and what should be our measures to tackle those issues and that we all are trying very hard to get into all aspects of uh, preventive medicine curing the disease if not then rehabilitating these people to a best possible means to save their day to day activities because ultimately it is a person's daily activity which has to be uh, safeguarded by us in terms of vision and the quality of vision we are talking about Retina workshop for RP Center is the first workshop for this year, 2022. We hope that this year will be better than last year in terms of a situation which is prevailing in the country world over. In fact, and hopefully this will go off, and we'll have a absolutely normal uh, work in RP Center in next few weeks or months. And the training part, which is a major uh, aspect of uh, getting 
delayed or a opportunity of getting decreased to our resident doctors or fellows that will also come to a normal aspect i hope that uh, we all will work in that direction to improve all aspects of our training education and the patient care you all know that uh, despite the pandemic situation in the country and delhi also a restriction of our normal uh, admissions we still are doing many uh, important work in rp center in regards to emergency services which is 24 hours the retina services are going on because it is a very critical for a patient because they can get blind retina people the faculty the resident doctors are doing surgeries which i like to really give a commendable effort from retina faculty that they are doing a good work for rp center as well as we are covering the peripheral areas also despite having a pandemic situation you know that our opds strength wise the maximum amongst the aims in this situation we are seeing almost more than 300 patients a day which is a large number for any institution so i would like to uh, really uh, congratulate the retina faculty led by uh, professor rajpal professor pradeep bankates vinod sorya and uh, uh, rohan they are doing a wonderful job not only supporting their own uh, units they are supporting the entire center center and the country in fact because without the retina help it will be difficult to complete the the requirement of our community in ophthalmic care cataract we all are doing across the country good job but how many retina centers are there which is supported by the excellent teachers and the more capable surgeons and physicians those are very few in that regard we in rp center have a huge role in uh, producing people of that caliber with, with who can serve the country rp center is apex institution not only for a government it is for us to develop a people who are at that caliber to support the requirement of a country and maximally required is a super specialized areas in that retina is one of them then i can understand pediatric ophthalmology corneal section and the important areas of uh, oculoplasty and uh, tumors because these are area where you have a very little uh, resources in the country very few centers who can produce that caliber super specialized people so i hope that uh, these workshops will incite many people to join us for a subsequent workshops also and in you know, the annual uh, cmes and people will apply for a short term training in rp center which uh, we, we are going to support everybody especially people from government sector so that they can also have view of rp center what is happening in the premier institute as well as get some insight training for themselves also so that they can start basic programs and a super specialized program in their center their institution and their colleges also so we have a huge uh, role to be you know taken forward the entire faculty of rp center the resident doctors staffs working all the time in a very uh, specified manner to conduct themselves in a manner where we can give services to entire country so hopefully that our academy programs will have you can say impact on the entire country i am very thankful to uh, entire rp center family for supporting our uh, venture in all three fields of research teaching and the patient care and retina faculty thank you again for a wonderful uh, conduction of your uh, workshop wish you all the best hopefully that uh, people will have more question answer to be discussed subsequently thank you again thank you sir thank you for your kind words uh, now we have a, also professor namta sharma who is a hai secretary she would like to give some comment on the talk she is doing good work as far as diabetes screening is concerned we would like her help as far as rp center is concerned for the work we are doing in the country thank you so much uh, i think sir i uh, would like to congratulate the entire retina department of our center for uh, doing this uh, retina workshop uh, live surgery and now the sessions which are going to be uh, followed subsequently i'm sure it is going to be a treat to watch and it is nice to see dr praveen vashish who is le leading the diabetic uh, retinopathy uh, survey throughout the country and i'm sure uh, it is going to give good results which will help in the uh, uh, making of the policy subsequently by the government as far well as 
the diabetic retinopathy is concerned. And uh, like Sir said, it is nice to see that in from the COVID times, we are now again back moving back to the uh, physical times and hopefully uh, this is going to stay forever and we wouldn't have to go back again. So thank you and uh, wish you all the best. Thank you, Dr. Namta Sharma. Thank you, ma'am. No. I, I would again like to uh, thank uh, our chief, Professor Dutyal, sir, for his constant support and uh, encouragement for uh, to us in this endeavor. So uh, before I may proceed with the next lecture, if I could just uh, uh, ask a, a question that was there for uh, Professor Praveen Vashisht. Well, uh, Dr. Abhidnya had asked if there is any role of uh, smartphone uh, uh, photography and screening in diabetic retina. Yeah, definitely. Uh, smartphone can be used for screening. In fact, a lot of uh, programs, apps are coming. And with the help of that, we can take photograph and send to higher level for screening. And in fact, now we are running a program where optometrists, they are able to screen for DR and they can refer patient. Probably when we have such high burden of diabetes and diabetes within a country, it is time that the optometrist, they should be able to screen at the, at the primary eye care center, at the vision center level and refer such case, patient to the higher level. Thank you. Okay, sir, another question for you. We'll just be taking this as the last question. So, uh, uh, Dr. Gayatri Murugan is asking if Optos wide field imaging is used in UK for screening. So, what thoughts? I, I could not that? get it. Optos wide field imaging is being used in UK for screening for DR. So, uh, sir, I, I'm not aware of that. Sorry. Okay. I am not. So, I would just answer this by saying that Optos obviously can be used in such uh, centers where they can afford. Obviously, Optos is quite uh, 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 financially not viable for screening in India, at least in a developing country like ours. So now we, I'll move on to the next uh, talk, which will be given by uh, Professor Rajpal. So we have already talked about the disease burden. Now we will see how we'll be managing the disease burden of diabetic retinopathy. So he'll be talking on diabetic macular edema and PDR. Uh, thank you, Chief Sir, uh, for uh, giving us opportunity to conduct a workshop on retina. So before starting the workshop, I would like always to thank Professor L.P. Agarwal, who is a pioneer in the uh, field of retina, who started the retina center in the Ames, and subsequent people who have helped in that. Professor P.K. Khosla was the first one, and, and then the Professor H.K. Tiwari, Professor R.V. Ajaj, and Professor Atul Kumar, and those person who has left the RP Center, like Lalit Verma and Dinesh Talwar, and recently Professor Atul Kumar. So most of the thing has been discussed as far as the uh, epidemiology has been, uh, epidemiology uh, by Parveen Basist, and we have discussed a lot of things in the morning. So whenever you have to give talk on the diabetic retinopathy or the, uh, in the, uh, uh, lecture or the uh, you have to uh, discuss following thing prevention epidemiology pathogenesis screening method investigation and various clinical studies management of PDR and DME and the surgical management so already discussed early detection of diabetes mellitus this I am highlighting for this how many years that the detection as you know 30 percent of the cases are undiagnosed and routine fundus examination, dilated fundus exam is very important. And then referral to appropriate ophthalmologist and the institution for the early institution of the therapy, PRP or anti whichever is the best. The one of the important thing is in type one, uh, you require five year, uh, you have to examine five year after diagnosis of diabetic, diabetes, while in type two at the time of diagnosis. And in pregnancy, so, uh, soon after conception and early trimester. And one of the important things you should remember the classification of diabetic retinopathy. Basically, di non proliferative diabetic retinopathy. This is classified into if there is no retinopathy, then uh, we have to review after every year or one month. And very mild, where there is a micro only present, then we have to review after 12 months. And it might be a micro aneurysm or retinal hemorrhage, ex date cotton growth spot. We can uh, review after six to eight months, and most of the most important the control of diabetes, other systemic factor, which is very important. In moderate, severe retinal hemorrhage is one to three quadrant, 
or mild irma, significant venous bleeding in one quadrant. And then is the severe. Severe is four to one rule. This can be asked in the exam, and this is very important. You know, in severe diabetic, severe NPDR, one of these should be present. Severe retinal hemorrhage in all quadrant, significant venous bleeding greater than two quadrant, moderate irma greater than one quadrant. Significance is this: the progression of PR, PDR is 50% in these cases in a year. And in a very severe NPDR, you have to have two of these: either severe retinal hemorrhage in all the quadrant, or the significant venous bleeding. One of these three should be present in this to call it a severe NPDR. Because in severe NPDR, progression to PDR, which is a life-threatening, uh, which can cause blindness due to sequelae. Is very important. So it's very important to early follow up these cases. So another thing, PDA required proliferative diabetic retinopathy as such does not cause decrease uh, blindness, but the sequelae of PDR, like vitreous hemorrhage or the TRD, causes a decrease in vision. PDR requires the presence of newly formed blood vessels or fibrous tissue or both arising from retina or optic disc and extending along the inner surface retina optic or into the vitreous cavity. These PDR can be divided into mild, moderate, mild to moderate or the high risk or advanced diabetic retina. As I have already told you uh, that in high risk retinopathy, high risk PDR is the one condition where we should do laser photocoagulation uh, in these cases. But once the advanced diabetic retinopathy is there, then like in, in those cases, there are vitreous hemorrhage and tractional retinal detachment or the dubious IRS, their role of pass planar vitrectomy is there. These are the some of the clinical features you can see in first case. First, uh, this is a mild NPDR. And in the second case, you can multiple hemorrhages all the quadrant and some micro -anorism. And in this case, you can have a soft x rays and the hard x rays also there. And this is a condition where this NVD is there, which has blood caused the vitreous hemorrhage. So investigation, FA and OCT are the investigation of choice. FA is a gold standard of effective diagnosis and monitoring treatment decision diabetic retinopathy. It can detect the leakage also and the CNP area. The OCT is complementary non-content non-invasive rapid image acquisition invasive tool. It is an optical biopsy. We have a SSOT, three SSOTs in RP center and use, useful for diagnosing any type of DME and deciding management, this OCT. A role of FA. Everybody should know what is the role of FA at present day. To classify macroedema, whether it's a focal, diffuse, ischemic, or mixed, because treatment depends on the which type of macroedema is this, or to see the peripheral ischemia, or there is a disproportionate visual loss or suspected neovascularization. Although for new for clinical examination, very poor for NVD or NV clinical examination, best. But suppose you suspect in a case where we have done the PRP, there sometimes we have to use the fluorescent angiography and in non response to treatment. As you can see, there's a fluorescent angiography where there are multiple hemorrhages, uh, multiple microneurism, and this is a focal leak. In such cases where the focal leak is pre present, there's the role of focal laser. You know, these days a lot of being talked about the anti vagina and anti vagina but certain times there's a focal leak which can extend to the macular, macular area and uh, can be away from that area and if you can laser then there are chances that the macroedema may not progress this is a case of diffuse diaptic macroedema everybody should know what is a diffuse diaptic macroedema the leakage and uh, all over the leakage is there and you should be able to see cnp area you see a lot of cnp areas is there in the periphery also and uh, this uh, generally uh, people do mistake just to early phase but as far as diagnosis or DME is concerned, you must have a late phase because if the microneurysms are present or the leaky vessel, they manifest a little bit late. So at least you should take a late phases of to diagnose diabetic macroedema. Initially, people do mistake in that. So 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 you must have a late phases of diabetic macroedema because uh, late phases of FA in these cases. And whenever you have to give, you have been given FA, you must say which phase is this. Very important. Without deciding the phase of FA, you should not discuss. Start. Beach. 
स्टार्ट में तो कहाँ से ये नहीं वो करो ना उस साइड से करना ये ये so one of the uh, suspected like you can see in this case this feature is retina and vision is less so in these cases we are not finding any cause of decreased vision so in such cases where feature retina is present and vision is less in diabetic patient the fa will help to show that there is a uh, the fz is increased and there is a macular ischemia is there so these are the cases which, which respond less to the steroid where st uh, we don't give anti vegf or the laser because they will worsen these uh, macular ischemia so this is important to differentiate that is the role of f fluorosensitivity we have a optos which will so a 200 degree of uh, uh, field where we can see the cnp areas as you can see in this case cnp areas and leakages are there and vd is also there lately oct has been there which has been discussed by dr nawazis in the morning but this is a newer tool, tool where we can have a with a patient where we don't have to give the dye like uh, and the patient where we cannot give the dye like kidney disease or high, heart disease where we cannot give the dye fluorescent dye there the role of oct is there we can detect microorganism microvascular abnormality capillary non perfusion foveal level scleral zone and new vascularization also like here we can see in the periphery we can see the nve with the oct a without uh, giving the dyes here also in the periphery this is a kind of, this is a fluorescent angiography and this is the octa angiography where you can see the nve in the periphery so octa will definitely have a certain role but uh, adjunct to fa this is again a fundus photography where you you can see the nve here but on fa there is a leakage but that same thing can be uh, reproduced with the octa like you can see nve all these thing in cnp area also lot of work is done as per oct is can for the early diagnosis of diabetic retinopathy and macular ischi macular uh, 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 vessel density is one of the parameter which is being talked about as per early diagnosis of the macular edema is concerned or maculopathy is concerned diabetic retinopathy now there we have to classify diabetic macular edema uh, center involving non center involving and these are the oct based class which everybody should know like in this case there is a lot of uh, macular edema is there and nsd is also there and here there are sister spaces and here the vmt is there traction is there this is the condition where we have to exclude because here the treatment is basically uh, is uh, surgery and these the oct biomarker has been talked about for the prognosis of the patient before giving a injection you must see the oct biomarker like hyperreflective spike is there which is associated poor prognosis drill you must understand drill and uh, the uh, iso junction and recently retinal nerve fiber thinning associated severity of diabetic retinopathy has been shown so these are the condition where retinopathy doesn't occur high myopia glaucoma cori retinitis and this is the P prp pictures fa picture of a prp done in a case of diabetic retinopathy and management of diabetes one of the important since being control of diabetes and other factor which is very important for the control of uh, before starting of the treatment in any case of diabetic macular edema or diabetes so first initially in the dme in, uh, etdr so laser used to be done modified laser with a, but now recently treatment anti vegf these are the three drugs which has been used these days uh, as per anti vegf is concerned and these are the various studies which are which has undergone which has shown that anti vegf has been affected which antibiotic to use is a uh, questionable uh, but the thing is for poor patient we are using bifosphonate because we, which is cost effective as compared to and aflisprid and there these are the various study uh, recently there is a latest drug bromsolol which has been used for the anti vegf now the question is how, which method to be used initially three dosing what we are doing is initially three dose is given and if that is effective then we titrate on the basis of uh, macular edema or not this is a flow diagram where it is seen if the macular edema if vision is good vision near vision these are the two important criteria which has been taken uh, you do conservative but if the vision is less than 69 or near vision less then we have to give anti vegf for the uh, treatment and various studies have been done 
for the uh, or, uh, role of anti vegf in the macular edema so this is the basically flu diagram uh, this is the theme i give monthly injection till normalization of oval contour or the visual equity is greater than 612 stop further treatment follow up monthly continue monthly injection if improvement continue but put end point not reached if they, there is a no response after even a three injection non steroid responder non non anti vegf responder where the dm is not responding to anti vegf then we can try the other molecule like initially role of steroid in dm initially ivt used to be there but uh, because of glaucoma we have shifted to implant of ozodoc dexamethasone indications are reconstant or persistent dme or vitrectomy with macular edema first line pseudophagia or if the patient is stroke or all these things which I, I, I have already told you change of molecules which is steroid check control dm or st and these things according pdr the pdr high risk case prp for is the treatment of choice recently protocol s has used anti vegf but uh, this is controversial now i would like to show surgery of this patient the indication of a vitrectomy is the you should know the complication of anti vegf which are these and uh, with for vitrectomy vitreous hemorrhage is one and then the macula involved retinal detachment and vmt are the two condition uh, in addition to other thing combined regular where vitrectomy can be done so this is a surgery this is a case of you know uh, if not treated properly there is a uh, trd tractional detachment and uh, retinal hemorrhage is also there and in the surgery is very difficult in these cases where trd is present one of the concept i would like to tell you is in vitrectomy you just do the reduce the traction tractional retinal detachment just remove the traction and then do the air fluid exchange but uh, in case of combined or if there is a break then we have to do the total air fluid exchange and putting of the intraocular substitute now this is a case where you can see the vitrectomy is done now there is lot of traction is there now you can see the fibrovascular membrane thick pvd which i am trying to remove with the cutter we are cutting there various technique available for the uh, doing this case so we have lot of thing we have discussed in the morning as far as the vitrectomy in dioptic retinopathy is concerned so thank you so much thank you so much sir for enlightening us about the latest in the management of diabetic retinopathy so there was a question that was there from dr anand tripathi and he had asked if there is a patient a one night patient and has npdr would you have a lower threshold for managing ah, yes yes this we have uh, discussed in the morning if severe npdr is there and the patient is socioeconomically can't follow up in indian situation in severe npdr we are doing uh, uh prp or one eyed patient professor pradeep antes is there who has got lot of experience and dr rohan chawla in addition to vinod professor pradeep antes is one of the pioneer in the retinopathy treatment he will discuss uh, yeah one thing that uh, you should again take take some caution over here although we say that they should be lasered don't rush through with your uh, laser okay you have a larger window over here so if you're going to do a 360 degree laser you're going to induce uh, macular edema in these cases so you space out the number of sittings that you're going to do the prp and that's a safer approach than to rush through with the prp in these cases so as we have already discussed prp i have not skipped the thing but it is important that we must do a proper prp in cases where high risk cases is present but in in a situation uh, anything dr pradeep और कोई क्वेश्चन है लॉट ऑफ थिंग वी हैव डिस्कस इन द मॉर्निंग बिकॉज ऑफ शॉर्टेज ऑफ टाइम इट इज वेरी डिफिकल्ट टू डिस्कस एन अदर थिंग इज इफ मैक्लो इडीमा इज प्रेजेंट विद कैटरेक्ट सो व्हाट इज रोहन योर प्लान ऑफ एक्शन सो इट्स ऑलवेज बेटर टू ट्रीट द मैक्लो इडीमा फर्स्ट सो एज फार एज पॉसिबल इफ द मीडिया अलाउज वी कैन गो हेड एंड डू द फोकल लेजर फॉर द एक्स्ट्रा फोवियल लीक्स एंड इफ इट इज अ सेंटर इन्वॉल्विंग इडीमा देन गो हेड गिव द एंटी वेजे फर्स्ट एंड देन डू द कैटरेक्ट सर्जरी देयर इज नो हरी वी कैन ऑलवेज वेट if the cataract is advanced and we are not having a very good visualization then these days we can also combine the anti vegf injection with the cataract to perform the cataract surgery and at the end give the anti vegf injection 
if you think there is not much risk of steroid response, even a, a steroid implant can be given following cataract surgery if macular edema is present. Diabetic macular edema is a finite disease as compared to ARMD. As various study, in the first year, you can have a seven or eight injection, second year, three, four injection, third year less. So within three to five years, various studies, the injection rate has decreased. So this you should understand that in diabetic macular edema, it is a diffuse diabetic macular edema. It is, a, it is a finite disease. It can be control if treated early there are various issues which can be discussed later on uh, any other so this okay. is just uh, i think due to shortage of time we'll just take one last question huh. uh, this is one question what is your view regarding single spot laser versus pattern laser for prp so professor Pradeep, yes sir, we, we 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 are doing this uh, pattern laser as you must be doing professor pradeep your opinion we have done a study on this and uh, there are uh, advantages and disadvantages of this but this takes uh, this is a shorter period we can do in a one sitting also okay yeah one but, one thing that established now is that and uh, your pascal laser completes the procedure earlier, earlier but the risk of having a recurrent proliferation is also higher yes okay, yes probably that is because you're not delivering adequate energy to uh, destroy the retinal pigment epithelial cells so you have to be cautious over here that the procedure is uh, efficacious as far as the surgeon goes but for the patient it's not as efficacious so please be a little cautious over here and also pay attention to the spot size that you're using and the distance between the spots you have to set that correctly and only then will you get an adequate uh, area of coverage and an adequate uh, energy delivery in these cases okay as of now a single spot is considered more efficacious, although more time consuming. Yes, this is the what my experience is. We have done the study on this and we have seen then cases where we have used the Pascal, there the re, uh, rebleed rate is more. And uh, uh, in addition, so we most of the time we have to do the PRP, just shortest of time we can do all these things. But you should remember what Pradeep Venkates has told you. The one of the important factors is before doing a PRP, you must see slit lamp, you must see the macular edema and minimum edema, which can be detected 300 micron. And if the vision is less and all these things, you can go ahead with the PRP. But main important is to rule out the macular edema because once you do the PRP, macular edema is going to increase. And one thing which I have not discussed is the side effect of PRP. And if there are side effect of PRP, you should tell to the patient before doing and one of the important thing is after PRP patient can have vitreous hemorrhage you must explain that because of the PVD induction after PRP during that period there is a PVD induction and there is a traction on the NV and the vitreous hemorrhage you will say you must explain all the complications before uh, all the side effects before doing a PRP or the macular edema. We have not discussed subthreshold. Can you put some point on this micropulse laser, which initially Pradeep and Tisa produced one paper, and now recently you are doing so one line? Subthreshold is a new kind of laser where we uh, in, give less energy so that collateral damage is less. And we are using it now for some cases of macular edema. And we have also found it useful for the, uh, central serous retinopathy, which was discussed in the earlier session. But it is still under full investigation full whether area. it is as efficacious as standard laser. Okay, collateral damage is less. Thank you so much. So we'll move on to now other diseases of the retina. So I request uh, Professor Dr. Sharia, who is also a consultant with us, uh, to talk on managing vasculitis. Thank you so much, sir. So I'll be talking on managing retinal vasculitis. So I assume that the first step is already made that we have made a diagnosis of retinal vasculitis. So, okay. So I think the first step is actually making a diagnosis of retinal vasculitis and that has been made. The second is to actually find the cause of retinal vasculitis. So as the study was done at our center, we found that in majority of these cases, this retinal vasculitis that is seen in the Indian subcontinent is basically a single organ vasculitis. And we do not need to go in for battery of tests, unlike in the Western population, where we might need to find other causes of retinal vasculitis. So we should go in and give particular tests only when we there is a suspicion of any particular entity. Moving on to ocular investigations. Obviously, since it's a vasculitis, the most important modality is the frontus fluorescing angiography, preferably wide field angiography. And it helps us in telling the whether there is activity or the areas of ischemia and NV and NVDs. In certain conditions, which I'll be discussing, it also helps in 
telling which particular entity it might be. OCT again is again a non-invasive uh, modality which tells about the status of the posterior pole in the form of cystoid macular edema, ERM, or a TRD which might develop in due course of the disease. So few cases. So uh, in this case, as you can see, there's a typical cuffing that is being seen along with disc edema and a active retinal vasculitis with hemorrhages and something like a candle wax dripping. And when you do an FFA, you can see it's mainly a periphlebitis. So it might raise a suspicion of sarcoidosis. And in such a case, it might be prudent to go in and then order investigations like a serum ACE or a CT chest. Again, in another case, if you are having a patient who comes with a complaint of oral ulcers and on fundus evaluation, there is vitritis, a focal retinitis patch, and on FFA, you see this typical fern type leakage, which is then suggestive of a diagnosis of Bashers. And then in such a case, you can go ahead and investigate and do an HLA B51. And in on the contrary, if you get such a typical sort of a picture on an FFA where you see these uh, aneurysms on the disc and at the bifurcation of the arteries, then you are basically dealing with a single organ vasculitis, which is uh, Irvan, and we don't need to investigate these patients any further. So to treat vasculitis, we then need to go to the third step, which is basically which phase of the disease it is. So basically, we there are two stages that need treatment. One is the active stage and then the proliferative stage. So in the active fa phase, we it is basically uh, managed with corticosteroids. And in rare cases and severe forms of vasculitis, we might need immunosuppressives. So the first form of steroid that we use commonly is the periocular steroid. And most commonly used is posterior subquinone injection, which gives and works well for 8 to 12 weeks. It is given most commonly when we have a single quadrant of involvement or as an adjunct to systemic therapy when we have macular edema. Another form of treatment which is new is the supracroidal injection of primacillinone. However, this is not been tried specifically in retinal vasculitis. However, it has been tried in non-infectious uveitis in the PHT and Magnolia trials. And again, it might be another treatment option in future for vasculitis. Moving on, the next form of steroid therapy is intravitreal, and intravitreal can be given in the form of either triamcinolone, acetonide, or implants like dexamethasone and fluoresinolone. Point trial, which was again done in non-infectious uveitis, has shown that intravitreal, uh, uh, intravitreal uh, injection of steroids have a better efficacy than periocular. However, the mainstay of treatment always remains systemic steroids in such cases, and when multiple quadrants are involved and bilaterality is there, then we start. Uh, the patient on oral steroid, one milligram per kg body weight. And after we see a response to treatment, then we can then start tapering the patient. And it can be tapered slowly over a period of three to four months. Or, and we again keep an uh, eye on the potential side effects of the oral steroids. So as you can see, most of these patients are well managed on oral steroids. And with steroid therapy, there is complete resolution of the disease process. However, select few patients like Bashir, Sarkaid, or Cecily with aggressive forms of disease may need immunosuppressions. The commonly given immunosuppression that we start ourselves is azathioprine and methotrexate, along with which we keep a, uh, keep a uh, watch on the CBC, LFT, and KFT. However, new, newer uh, immunosuppressives like adalimumab and rituximab have also been seen to be efficacious in certain case reports tried in Bashir and Sarkaid and also SLE. However, these are started only in conjunction with the rheumatologist. So now we go on from the active stage to the proliferative stage. And the proliferative stage is actually best managed by a laser. So it is guided by the fundus fluorescein angiography. And depending upon how we have it, we then do either a sectoral or a panretinal scatter. And mostly we intervene at this stage of, uh, at the stage when we have a new vascularization uh, developing. and uh, we need to go on and do a regular follow-up for these patients because they might need some additional treatment in the due course of the disease. Now, few entities where we might need to go in early is one such like an IRWAN, which is an aggressive form of vasculitis, and we might not wait till the time we have a new vascularization, and we might go in and do a uh, panretinal photocoagulation. And as you can see, after the photocoagulation, there is a resolution of the disease. Again, as I said, need for additional treatment might be there on follow-up. And in such cases where we have some skip areas, we need to then add on treatment. 
so the role of uh, anti vegf is uh, not exactly clear how and when we use it although it is routinely used before uh, vitrectomy to reduce intraop and post operative bleeding however it can also be given post laser once we had have, have no skip areas and we have done a substantial amount of laser we can probably go Someone has put a comment that there's no, uh, they are not able to see the screen, but I think we are able to see. Kindly check your uh, uh, network. Is the transmission okay? Okay, it's okay from our side. Thank you. Okay, fine. So as I was saying that in cases where we have done an extensive laser, we do not have any more areas to laser. In such cases, we can then supplement uh, with anti-VEGF. How frequently and uh, how many can we give is still not clear. So some patients might then present uh, in the proliferative phase with a non-resolving vitreous hemorrhage, fractional lateral detachment, or secondary RRD. And even at times during the best of our efforts, even after our regular follow-up, they might end up in these situations. These patients are best managed with vitrectomy. Few select patients where there might be recurrent vitreous hemorrhage, which actually clears off very quickly. And we are actually in a dilemma whether to just keep lasering this patient. We should look in for a area of persistent traction which might be the cause for the regular bleeding and this again would be a good candidate for vitrectomy so just sharing a short video how to proceed so in a case of vitreous hemorrhage you basically just go and make a hole in the posterior hyaloid remove the subhyaloid bleed all the preretinal bleed the clotted blood any membranes that might be there on the posterior pole and after doing an air fluid exchange we can augment the laser Okay, so another case, this, so vitreous hemorrhage with a uh, tractional detachment. Again, we follow the same principles of making a break in the hyaloid and then removing the blood. And after that, then we follow uh, segmentation and delamination as well as diathermizing those trimmed edges. And in the end, we do an air fluid exchange and we do, uh, if we have made a break, we can then put oil. So to summarize, uh, the active phase can be well managed by periocular and oral steroids, and rarely you would need immunosuppression. And proliferative phase, the best is to do a good comprehensive and early laser to prevent uh, no conditions like non-resolving vitreous hemorrhage, TRD, or secondary RRDs, which later have to be managed only by a surgical intervention. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Shorya, for a comprehensive talk on managing vasculitis. Uh, we'll go ahead with the unusual case of diabetic retinopathy. Dr. Aman is a senior resident with us. He'll be presenting this case. Uh, there's again a comment. Please uh, kindly check. Webex seems to be down for some people. Facebook and YouTube, they are able to see. Kindly please check Webex. I hope the transmission is okay. If you are able to see on WebEx, please put on the chat box if it's okay now. Yeah, Dr. Raman, proceed. Uh, a very good morning to respected chief sir, faculty, and my fellow friends. Uh, today I'll be presenting an unusual case of diabetic retinopathy. Slides. Please switch on Dr. Raman's slides Slide. and check WebEx transmission. So a 53-year-old male presented to our OPD uh, uh, with chief complaints of diminution of vision in the right eye. Uh, he was uh, experiencing this since three months. It was gradual and onset, non-progressive. And he's a known diabetic on treatment. And there is no history of any other systemic illness. So on ophthalmic examination, his best corrected visual equity in the right eye is 6'9". Uh, rest of the ocular examinations are normal. On a dilated fundus examination, he, we saw microaneurysms, hemorrhages, and few uh, hard exudates, which suggested us of a diagnosis of moderate NPDR in the both eyes. In the left eye, there was uh, there were few cotton wool spots at the posterior pole also. So we made a provisional diagnosis and went ahead with ancillary investigations of fundus fluorescent angiography and an optical coherence tomography. So the OCT in both the eyes were uh, uh, non-significant. So uh, there was there was just some non-center involving DME in the left eye with the cotton wool spots visible. 
uh, in the fundus floris and angiography uh, just a minute i mean just pause on the fundus floris uh, they are checking the webex uh, please confirm can you see the slide on webex now is it okay can you see the slides okay thank you go ahead uh, so continuing uh, in the fundus floris and angiography of the right eye uh, this is the early phase and this is the late phase in which we can see extensive cnp areas uh, throughout and also at the posterior pole there are uh, capillary non perfusion areas and there is this hyperfluorescence suggestive of an nvd similar picture was seen also in the left eye uh, these are the uh, this is the nvd which i was talking about in the left eye also there are uh, there is extensive cnp areas and there is an nvd uh, which hi which was hy hyperfluorescence in the late late phase so we changed the diagnosis to a uh, uh, proliferative diabetic retinopathy and we started both eye pan retinal photocoagulation but the question which arose was why was there such a disparity between pdr and only minimal macular edema in a 53 year old with a good diabetic control and there was marked extensive cnp areas 360 degree so a further systemic investigation was ordered and patient was uh, uh, advised a hemogram with smear a serum homocysteine and a complete blood count so on follow up the patient presented with a tlc raised tlc count with 25% immature blast cells with a uh, new, uh, increased neutrophilia so the patient was referred to irch and he was then diagnosed as a case of cml and the patient was started immediately on imatinib therapy so this was the follow up uh, ffa image in which uh, the uh, prp has been done but there are still uh, few cnp areas present near the arcades and the nvd can be seen uh, this is the, uh, the right eye and the left eye uh, ffa image on follow up the patient uh, the right eye uh, was doing well and the patient uh, had good visual equity with a, a good prp done and in the left eye subsequently patient developed vitreous hemorrhage even though prp was completed so then uh, vitrectomy was passed in a vitrectomy was done and the patient on follow up is uh, doing well and uh, has a good visual equity of 6 by 9 so coming to the discussion the main objective of uh, the talk is uh, situations where patient would have progressed to pdr and not yet developed macular edema which we generally see in patients probably in younger patients with a good rp pump in which macular edema doesn't occur uh, uh, so uh, easily and also associated ischemic factors like venous stasis in our case a cml so this was a departmental publication in which we saw patients with cml had accelerated proliferative diabetic retinopathy uh, uh, which 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 is generally uh, the patients uh, we saw three types of patients in which patients had cml and they presented to us for a retinal screening and uh, dr was picked up or patients of diabetes which in which in, uh, like in our case there was extensive cnp and when uh, with further investigations eventually we saw that the patient had cml and treatment was started so there is a need to alter screening guidelines for retinopathy in cases of diabetes with cml and early detection and aggressive management may help preserve visual equity in such cases thank you thank you dr aman very good case and it is important you must remember in all cases of diabetes vitreous hemorrhage or retinal changes you must see the peripheral um, uh, peripheral smear we we generally don't do i have also seen few patient where vitreous hemorrhage was due to cml or all these things so you must make into consideration sometime we get systemic disease diagnosed just on the basis of uh, this thing rohan anything what we wanted to highlight is that whenever you get a disparity between PDR and macular edema or you get an asymmetric diabetic retinopathy, then you must think that there might be something else happening to the patient. Like in this case, we could pick up CML. So getting a simple hemogram done with peripheral smear in quite a few of these patients is a very easy task. We should not miss such uh, other causes which can worsen ischemia and worsen the proliferative process happening in diabetic retinopathy. Okay, so we'll go ahead. Sometime with... asymmetrical diabetes, you have to check the carotidion, or sometime you have a, you know, the, sometime we see carotidinosis is one eye. That's the another thing, important thing. And that is the thing. Chalo. We'll Next. Go ahead with some quiz some questions. Quiz. Yes. Yeah. Can you please share my screen? Now, Dr. Aman is going to. So, uh, so start, quiz, starting uh, with the first question. Uh, this is a 35 year old with diminution of vision in the left eye since two months. And he's a known case of orbital DLBCL with a history of treatment. He received uh, chemotherapy and radiotherapy. He's a type 2 di diabetic mellitus patient on OHA since two years. So uh, what is the diagnosis? Any resident? Quickly, what is the diagnosis? Patient had lymphoma, radiotherapy, is a diabetic with this picture. Okay, so that answer is radiation retinopathy. Every So again, you see the other eye is normal. 
although the left eye looks like typical proliferative diabetic retinopathy but here you have to take the history the patient initially had not given us history of radiation so this is basically a radiation ret retinopathy causing proliferation yes. next so next a 35 year old chronic alcoholic with a history of recurrent abdominal pain presented with diminution of vision in both eyes with the following fundus pictures what is the possible diagnosis yes so this is a uh, personal like retinopathy these are personal flecken which can be seen so it is generally seen in post traumatic abdominal trauma patients but in which in pancreatitis also it's a, a similar picture next uh, the last question identify the disorder shown on the uh, fundus fluorescein and a hint it was shown in the previous uh, presentation also presentation also yeah yes this is a ca case of Irwan, in which we can see this, uh, these aneurysms present, which are generally at the bifurcation of the artery. What happens, Irwan? Who said? Any resident? What is Irwan? What is Irwan? Tell me, Aman. Irwan, tell me. It's idiopathic retinal vasculitis, aneurysms, and neuroretinitis. So you must carefully also see the arteries. Sometimes you see those knots in the arteries, and there are the aneurysms in the arteries, which is causing this uh, proliferative process as well as macular edema. Okay, okay. Ho gaya? Yes. So next we'll any other go ahead with the next session, session i think next session okay now surgical retina the moderator is dr rohan chavla professor pradeep ana idhar acha now when do i feel tips and trick ah no thank you thank you We have already shown you some live surgeries in the morning. We will discuss some other surgical situation. The first talk is uh, when do I feel the ILM, when I don't, and some tips and tricks for that. And Dr. Vinod will be speaking on it. I hope uh, we are all awake. So I'll be starting off the surgical retina session. I'll be speaking about ILM peeling. Uh, it's a common step in all vitrectomies. And uh, as you have seen and experienced, it requires a great precision. Uh, you can't uh, be uh, moving here and there, and else you would be having red lesions in the retina. And as the indications of uh, ILM peeling have expanded, we are performing it more commonly nowadays. There are some established indications of uh, ILM peeling, and these include full thickness macular hole, whether uh, they are primary or secondary macular holes. Most of them, most of them would need ILM peeling, and we have certain modifications for larger holes that include inverted flap technique. Uh, myopic traction maculopathy is another absolute indication of ILM peeling whenever you are doing vitrectomy whether full thickness macular hole is present or not in these cases. Again, there are chances of uh, de-roofing in these patients. So there is modification which involves we sparing the fovea while peeling the ILM. Now, there are several other indications where ILM peeling has been described. Some people do it routinely, including me, but some people don't like to peel. These indications include epiretinal membrane, vitromacular traction syndrome, cases of retinal detachment, patients with proliferative diabetic retinopathy, resistance, uh, resistant diabetic macular edema, and patients with disc bit maculopathy. When I say debatable, uh, that means some people like to peel, but literature is not uniform on these particular indications. How does ILM peel help in these part, uh, particular condition is that it ensures complete removal of tangential traction. It prevents any reproliferation on the surface of the macula. It improves the elasticity of the retina and also it improves the oxygenation of the macula in patient with ischemic or proliferative retinopathies. Now, before uh, we proceed to ILM peeling, we have to have certain prerequisites and these include good PVD induction with or without tramsinolone acetonide. And after that, we peel off the epiretinal membrane if they are on the surface of the macula. Now, the most important prerequisite for uh, successful ILM peeling is good visualization. For that, you need a clear media. 
uh, we usually stain it with various dyes uh, nowadays most commonly used is brilliant blue and we have to have a good magnification and i personally use a macular lens for the magnification as i told in the morning creating edge is most important and we have used various instruments in the past uh, pinch and peel technique which uh, i personally use uh, using a, a card type alum forceps uh, which has tipped something like this is very very useful and do you do not require any uh, other uh, uh, additional equipment so these are the basics you of pinch and peel technique you go near the surface of the retina you pinch off the ilm and then you start peeling uh, it's better to start uh, pinching technique away from a vessel otherwise you can damage a vessel just in case you hit the retina once you have created the edge depending on the eye and your own comfort level you can start peeling in either direction either clockwise or counterclockwise and remember if you are not able to see the ilm it's never a bad idea to stain the ilm again so in this particular patient as you see i've uh, peeled the inner circle there was a little bit ilm which was there i have saved it uh, because the hole was larger i can use it as an inverted flap and then depending again on your requirement you can uh, enlarge the ilm peeling to the required levels this is the inverted flap technique which was described in 2010 here what we do is uh, we peel off the ilm not entirely but leave some part of it attached to the edge of edges of the hole uh the, here what is said is that the residual ilm acts as a scaffold for the retina to regrow and close this hole and usually i perform it when the hole is more than 400 microns in size uh there are again modifications some people use single flap versus multiple flaps uh, but there are no established guidelines but you can use whatever is comfortable uh, or produces good results in your hands uh, again uh, you may or may not stuff i personally don't like to stuff the hole with ilm peeling i just peel it off and then leave it there uh, for the air to fill this ilm into the hole uh, if the edges if the ilm is too large then you can use uh, uh, low uh, suction cutter to trim off the uh, ilm at the edges of the hole in fact uh, some time back we published this study and where we studied the inverted ilm flap for versus standard ilm flap for large macular holes and we found that uh, inverted ilm feel is definitely useful for larger holes uh, we have been using uh, interoperative microscope uh, as integrated oct for peeling of the ilm and a very interesting finding uh, i saw in these particular patients is that you can see uh, the vertical pillars of the tissue at the edges of the hole as you can see over here uh, which is there after ilm peeling has been done so this is what i named as hole door sign and we found that if present it predicts the macular hole closer in post operative period coming to myopic traction maculopathies uh, of course these patients are high myopes and the biggest challenge is that ilm uh, forceps or the other instruments uh, do not reach the posterior pole in that scenario what you can do is uh, change over to 23 or 20 gauge instruments which are larger you can remove the cannula to get a, an extra one or two millimeters uh, you can shift your uh, sclerotomy posteriorly to get uh, uh, extra one mm or two mm and of course there are longer instruments which are specially designed for surgeries in myopic eyes uh, one another uh, trick in these patients is you keep uh, dye for a longer period so that uh, the ilm is uh, stained densely as many of these eyes would have poorer contrast due to chorioretinal atrophy remember to peel up to the edge of the staphyloma in these cases and be aware of the curvature because the staphyloma suddenly ends you are li uh, likely to hit the edge of the staphyloma and cause a break there okay. coming to retinal detachment uh, uh, again you can uh, do peeling in these eyes it reduces the chances of ilm peeling as i said earlier uh, it is relatively difficult peeling in detached retina because there is no counter force because retina is mobile uh, remember you cannot peel towards the disc in these eyes what you have to do is peel away from the retina and rationale how ilm peeling in acts in these eyes is that it decreases the incidence of erm though it may not change final visual outcome in fact we published this paper earlier we found that eyes in which ilm had been peeled we had extra foveal erm as you can see here 
and that again indicated that these eyes would have gone on to develop epidermal membrane if epidet if phylum peeling had not been done so again in uh, eyes with retinal detachment what you can do is use pfcl for peeling so what pfcl do does is stabilizes the retina and it provides counter force uh, now mostly i do peeling in detached retinas under pfcl it is more controlled uh, one thing you, you need to remember in these eyes that whenever you peel the retina tends to get uh, ilum tends to get scrolled and you should not be worried about it because that is the effect of P pfcl in proliferative diabetic retinopathy ilum peeling is most difficult because the uh, retina is boggy and if there are cyst in the fovea you can uh, cause deroofing of the foveal cyst which can lead to full thickness macular hole also ilum tends to be a sticky and friable in these situations uh, how it helps in this situation it is said that it removes the tangential traction and it also improves the uh, oxygenation of the macula this is my last case uh, at times what you see is uh, you have to do indication for conditions like this this is a patient with altered sub ilum bleed what you can do in such patients is wait but if the blood does not re resolve you can do the ilm peeling and then aspirate out the blood but everything we do has is associated with complications and sequelae so you can see this particular patient has an extra foveal hole fortunately for this patient the uh, the primary hole closed but there was extra foveal hole and this uh, appearance which has been talked about quite a lot is dissociated optic nerve fiber layer literature is divided whether it is a, of any functional consequence or not but remember retinal injury is always a possibility in patients undergoing ilm peeling you can cause deroofing of the fovea if there are cysts and of course one may have dilated side effects though brilliant blue is quite a safer dye so to conclude ilm peeling has become integral part of any vitreoretinal surgery and nowadays we have moved from successful to atraumatic ilm peeling and remember that is must good visualization is the key and of course practice makes a man perfect thank you very much uh, thank you Do dr vinod no because of the time we would like to have a next uh, speaker uh, dr rohan chawla who will be discussing when to when do i go by manual the time uh, i think we should already it is I request all the speaker to be short. Huh. So, Dr. Pradeep, would you like to discuss anything? So, it is, you know, with the advancement in the uh, surgical instrumentation and visualization system, the ILM peeling has become easier. And uh, like we used to do earlier, but now the illumination system and with the ingenuity system, if we operate, this is depth perception also good. Now I request Dr. Rohan Chawla. Thank you, sir. So I would be talking on uh, when do I go by manual? I hope the slides are visible on the uh, next. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So how do we do by manual briefly? So we need a chandelier illumination for that. And there are various types of chandelier. You can use one torpedo 25 gauge chandelier or you can use twin 29 gauge uh, fiber optics. Sometimes we also can use illuminated instruments with the uh, illumination being in our forcep or scissors or even in the infusion cannula. Where do you place the chandelier? Now, uh, mostly people place it in the infranasal quadrant or in the, you can place it at 12 o'clock. So basically you need to avoid shadows. And how does it help? It helps to better delineate the plane of dissection between the retina and the overlying pathology. And other uses can be simultaneous application of cautery while flushing the blood with the other hand removal of foreign body and direct PFCL silicon oil exchange and placing grafts which have recently been started such as retinal tissue or stira. So I'll show you videos of some of these situations. So this is a diabetic patient. So you see sometimes when you get tabletop detachments and you don't know exact configuration of disc macula and you cannot find a plane, you put a chandelier and with one hand you can hold the tissue and lift it so that you can better delineate the plane. And you can identify the small pegs of tissue which attach that abnormal fibrovascular proliferation to the retina. And slowly you can cut these uh, pegs to release that tissue from the retina. And this is a technique of radial uh, segmentation 
which i find quite helpful you see many times the attachments are much stronger along the arcades and at the posterior pole at the fovea and the papillomacular bundle the attachment is not that strong so uh, inside out dissection has been described in literature outside in has been described and this is one method where i go radially inside and dividing the tissue into two and the temporal part of the tissue which is away from the macula if it is not causing traction can also sometimes be left in certain one eyed patients where you want to do as much only as possible to attach the disc and macula and achieve some visual acuity for the patient and not do too much of aggressive dissection and also harm the patient so this radial segmentation is one so you divide the tissue and you also keep finding this plane and these small pegs which you keep cutting with your scissors lifting the tissue with the forceps with the other hand so if you were to use only one hand it would be little difficult although it is possible you can do it with one hand also so just another uh, diabetic video so you see here you don't know where the plane is so just introducing one lip of the scissors you can create a small plane and you can also do some blunt dissection with the scissors you see so close the scissors and push it along and this way you can enlarge the plane i think dr parijat might be also doing some of this in rop surgery so you uh, can do this wherever you find this proliferation so uh, because of time i think i'll skip this video so uh, let us go to pvr dissection so this is a pediatric case where we have uh, the pvd is a problem and uh, the first step is to induce a pvd somehow it is not working so we pull the pvd as far as possible it in the periphery we are not able to dissect the vitreous so here again i have placed a chandelier and i'm holding the vitreous and stretching it so again i have to create a plane where i can later on take my cutter and dissect it a bit more so i will still not be able to remove the entire vitreous but yes again a bit more than what i would have been able to do just by the cutter alone so again stretching this uh, this i'm stretching the vitreous phase itself and this creates some plane between the vitreous and the uh, retina so going to another case of foreign body removal so this is uh, here i put the chandelier through one of my pre existing ports so because i am going to create a fourth port anyway which is a larger port to introduce my magnet or my forceps so i have just put the chandelier through my pre existing port and notice this is a fake patient and still we are able to manage without damaging the lens so a foreign body i have held with the magnet and with the other hand because it is attached i am releasing it with the the vitreous attachments with the cutter if i pull it straight away it is definitely going to create a retinal break there even now it can create a break but yes the traction probably becomes limited so slowly the chandelier is giving me light from the other port and i've held the uh, for foreign body with the magnet and the cutter i'm releasing this freeing the foreign body so uh, once the foreign body is absolutely free you do feel it is not causing any traction only then you should try to remove it from the eye so you see how uh, neatly it has come off from the periphery and then uh, also placing an external magnet there because sometimes then it tends to slip now with the forceps i am able to again also align it in the long axis so you see somehow it just quickly turns in that long axis and you bring it out from the opening and it's out okay so this was one in a more interesting case where patient was operated keratoplasty with a dense vitreous hemorrhage uh, inferiorly and an underlying rd now this dense hemorrhage is very tightly adherent to the retina underlying so with one hand i am trying to remove it and i am able to remove part of the hemorrhage but then i got scared that i have pulled too much i might create a break so again i put a chandelier and lifted part of the hemorrhage with the forceps again trying to create the same plane there so basically i attempt is to decrease the pull on the retina and give me some space between the retina and the tissue which i want to remove so slowly dissecting it again i was able to get away with a major chunk of the hemorrhage and settle the retina okay so the basic take home message is that this surgery has become easier by manual instrumentation has become more available so i would say don't hesitate to go by manual whenever you feel two hands would be better than one and uh, perform the surgery to the best possible uh, result thank you thank, thank you, you dr rohan
and uh, now i would like to, to invite dr ambar to present uh, grt management please we will take question in the last if the time permit you know dr ambar is a senior resident in vitro retina unit and uh, our senior resident can do the difficult surgery you know difficult surgery are most of the time done by the senior resident and uh, you can see whatever the the vinod and the rohan has shown our senior resident are already doing it so it is depend on the everybody is perfect by the third year they are very perfect you know with the instrumentation and visualization everybody is very good in rp center and so is the okay thank you good afternoon everyone i will be talking on uh, how to manage a case of uh, giant retinal tear the the case we are presenting here was a 41 year old pathological myopic male with 11 diopters of myopia who presented with sudden onset painless diminution of vision for 6 days on examination he had a best corrected visual acuity of perception of light with uh, like myotonous retinal detachment secondary to a 5 clock hours of uh, giant retinal tear temporarily with a posterior rip uh, this is the surgical video of the patient Uh, we begin with the vitrectomy starting from the central core of the vitreous cavity then to the anterior flap of the tear then progressing to peripheral vitrectomy uh, we ensured uh, posterior vitreous detachment with uh, by staining with tramsinolone acetonide pfcl was injected to uh, manually set, settle the um, retina posterior to the giant retinal tear after settling uh, the posterior retina uh, we cut off the anterior flap of the giant retinal tear then under uh, pfcl the posterior retina posterior to the grt was endo lasered also the horns were lasered with at least 5 rows of uh, laser spots then fluid air exchange was done to settle the retina anterior to the giant retinal tear keeping the edge of the grt dry once settled then again uh, the anterior retina was lasered with again 4 to 5 rows then pfcl air exchange was done taking care to prevent retinal slippage by keeping the silicon tip at the anterior most portion of the receding pfcl bubble Uh, after the air exchange was done we did a 360 degree barrage uh, with four to five rows and then oil tamponade was given to the patient uh, to summarize the key steps uh, involved in the surgery was as we have to do a radical vitrectomy including vitreous base shaving as much as possible the edges of the grt should be freshened in case of uh, pvr anterior retinal flap should always be cut because if it is allowed to stay it will fibros later on pulling the ciliary body later on causing uh, chronic hypotonia and ciliary body detachment pfcl is a heavy uh, is a dense and uh, with a low viscosity uh, fluid that acts as a surgeon's hand it is used to flatten the retina posterior to the grt but before injecting pfcl we have to make sure we have managed posterior pvr to prevent slippage of uh, pfcl subretinally and uh, retinal slippage is one common complication that occurs in grt patients when we are attempting a pfcl air or a pfcl oil exchange uh, this happens because there is a trough of fluid uh, which is trapped between the pfcl bubble that is lying inferiorly and the incoming air or the oil bubble and this can be minimized by um, doing this maneuver slowly and always keeping the edge of the giant retinal tear dry also uh, when we close the case it is always advised to have at least 4 to 5 rows of uh, endo laser spots around the grt its edge and also a 360 degree barrage is warranted thank you thank you dr amar as you can see the very good surgery done by the surgeon giant retinal tear uh, very good surgery now i will invite uh, dr shea nayak who will be discussing the case of optic disc pit she is also senior resident in vitro retina unit good morning everyone today uh, i am dr shreya naik and i'll be presenting our experience on optic disc pit maculopathy uh, so we had a patient with, uh, who was 37 year old who presented to us with diminution of vision in the left eye for a year there was no significant uh, history other significant history and general physical examination was normal the ocular examination the right eye anterior segment as well as the fundus was normal the left eye best corrected visual acuity was 6 by 36 on fundus examination we could see an optic disc pit in the temporal optic disc uh, and as well as subretinal fluid and an inferior lasered coloboma type 5 according to edaman classification we went we went ahead with an oct we could see an optic disc pit with retinoschisis as well as subretinal fluid of 984 micron height so we we went ahead with a pars planar vitrectomy as we can see uh, a core vitrectomy was first done then a meticulous posterior vitreous detachment was done uh, it was carefully done as the vitreous is strongly adherent to the optic disc pit 
then a laminar inferonasal scleral autograft was taken uh, using the ilm forcep and a 20 gauge cannula it was stuffed inside the pit and fibrin glue was uh, then injected over the pit to plug the pit and then gas uh, air fluid exchange and gas was injected now the post op day 7 showed a vision of 6 by 24 with a decrease in the subretinal fluid of 856 micron what i would like to highlight in this case is there is no miraculous disappearance of subretinal fluid after a pass plane of vitrectomy and it takes time there was another case uh, which which had ret optic dispit retinopathy uh, uh, maculopathy and was operated with vitrectomy this was post 8 months OCT, which shows significant decrease in the subretinal fluid, but again, it takes time for the subretinal fluid to disappear. So what are the treatment options that we have in a case of optic dispute maculopathy? It can be either non-surgical or surgical. Non-surgical uh, usually have co conservative management and oral steroids and ositaz uh, acetazolamide mm -hmm. lasers. So these have usually high recurrences. High recurrences. Uh, surgical options have uh, are macular buckling, which is technically difficult. Then there are vitrectomy and its adjuvants, which there are many adjuvants adjuvants that have been described and all have variable success rates now what is the take-home message most cases have poor prognosis what are the two main prognostic factors according to a recent study uh, they are subretinal fluid connecting optic dispit and macula and any pre-existing headaches their variable outcomes is vitrectomy and it usually takes time for the subretinal fluid to resolve even after the vitrectomy with or without adjuvants and hence should be made clear while counseling the patient thank you thank you dr nayak now I will invite uh, uh, for the quiz. You can continue the quiz. The first question, what is the vitrectomy gauge being used according to the color? It's a purple color. So this is 27 gauge. 20 gauge is yellow. 20 23 uh, gauges orange, 25 gauges blue green, and 27 gauges purple. The next question BBG, what does G stand for? It's brilliant blue green. So there is also something called brilliant blue red, which is used for textile dyeing. Now, what is the stain and concentration used? The stain is BBG has explained. What is the concentration used? Point zero. And what does it stain? Okay, it positively stains the ILM and negatively stains the ERM. Concentration is 0.05%. Now, identify the adjuvant and the specific gravity of it. What is the specific gravity? It's 1.76. It is more than water and hence it descends down and presses on the retina. Thank you. Now, I... Now I will invite uh, Professor Pradeep Venkates, who will be. Talking about the some consideration. He is a one of the consultant in vitro retina unit and he has done a lot of work in dioptic retinopathy. And now let us listen from Pradeep Venkates what he is going to talk. Over to Professor Pradeep Venkates. Yeah, I'll be talking about three uh, diverse topics over here, and I just hope it, you find it stimulating and uh, probably useful. The first is on uh, pathogenesis of dry ARMD. We're all very familiar with wet ARMD. The two ends of the spectrum, okay, one presents pretty rarely, one presents pretty commonly, one presents with acute vision loss, one has a very chronic vision loss, and we all know that there's increased VEGF secretion. Uh, geographic atrophy, on the other hand, presents with loss of RP atrophy. And why does this atrophy actually occur? Now, there's a lot of uh, talk about complement, but uh, when they did studies using 
drugs that have that effect to complement pathway, they were found to be ineffective. So there's also, I mean, still a dilemma on what causes this atrophy. So let's go back and see uh, the VEGF pathway over here. And with ARMD, we all know is there's an increased secretion of VGF. What we are very familiar is that there is hypoxia that stimulates VEGF. But ask yourself, there is no demonstrable hypoxia ever that you see in choroidal neovascular membranes. So there's something else happening and hypoxia is not the main factor in wet ARMD. So in one of those moments, I decided to flip the coin and then I said, is there hypoangiogenesis in patients with dry ARMD? And then I thought this already be described in literature, but to my surprise, there's not a single word on the possibility of hypoangiogenesis. Why? When you look at this, the artist tries to show you what the functions of the pigment epithelium is and then the relation to the photoreceptors. If you look at the VEGF over here, it's almost an outlier. But when you talk about uh, dry ARMD, this pathway is very, very important over here. And look at the arrow also. The VEGF goes into the choriocapillaries and not the other way around. And whenever the body functions normally, there's always a reason why there is these kind of directionality. And this is well established now that the basolateral aspect of the retinal pigment epithelium actually secretes VEGF selectively into the choriocapillaries. Now, what does this VEGF do into the choriocapillaries? One is obviously maintains the health of the choriocapillary endothelium, but also maintains the directionality of the fenestrations. So there are no fenestrations away from the pigment epithelium, but the choriocapillary fenestrations are directed only towards the retinal pigment epithelium as is seen in these in this image over here okay but the next dilemma that we face is that why is this atrophy focal now here you're seeing multifocal patches of atrophy over here so this comes to uh, the fact how do the cells communicate with one another they're no different from human beings they communicate with themselves they communicate with their neighbors through encrypted means or through open channels and they also com communicate distant channels, distant targets over here. So uh, in the pigment epithelium, the communication is largely autocrine and paracrine. So now you know that in case there is hypoangiogenesis, it's going to affect itself or the neighboring cells over here. So then I came up with this hypoangiogenesis concept. And here again, I've uh, drawn from the diabetic retinopathy classification, one where there is a VEGF receptor resistance and the other where there is actually decreased secretion of VEGF. So you could have two types of hypoangiogenesis, the type one and the type two hypoangiogenesis that's actually causing geographic atrophy. Is there any clinical relevance to this? Then I was again very excited about this term therapeutic angiogenesis. And I thought it's something new, but people have used uh, animal models to check this, not in uh, dry uh, uh, ARMD, but in ischemic limb models and in cardiac uh, models. Okay, so therapeutic angiogenesis is one possibility that I think will happen in future. The second topic is on retinal blood vessels. So when we are asked to describe the retinal blood vessel, we normally talk about the, uh, I mean, arteriovenular ratio. What happens at the second crossing? Is there nipping? No, no nipping. One of the serendipitous observations that I had when I was reviewing images a few years ago was this pattern where you see the arteriole is crossing the venule over here. Here the venule is crossing the arteriole. Again, the arteriole is crossing over here. This was this I thought was a one-off observation, but then I started seeing it more. When I looked for it, I started seeing it more, but I wasn't happy with this. So I said, let me see what the prevalence of this particular uh, I mean, course of these vessels are. So you have a publicly available uh, database. You need to get permission for using this database. So this is from a European population. So I use this database. I took 100 of these uh, images and then I had my own collection of 100 images. So I put it all together and you see, I mean, I like to call this pattern the wicker basket pattern. That was the most common kind of a vascular course that you see. So again, what's the clinical relevance of this observation is that it provides structural support, if these tubular vessels are running without crisscrossing, they're not going to be stable. And again, this crisscrossing actually brings on the pressure gradient in a more gradual manner than, I mean, rapid changes. Okay, again, here, it, it affects the pathogenesis of uh, branch vein occlusion. And as you can see in this picture, they're relatively of the same duration. The vein is not much dilated over here. 
a lot of co co I mean, collaterals. Here you see the vein is so severely dilated over here. This is another patient, not much dilatation, but severe ischemia. So to me, it seems that it's not just one crossing that matters. You'll also have to look what is happening before that and what is happening after that. And that probably will help you in, under in understanding branch vein occlusion much better. The last of uh, my topics, uh, Rohan just mentioned about Chandler surgery. You have the conventional method, and then we also have the Chandler endoelimination assisted buckling and the biopsy that we have reported from here. And there are extended indications, like recently we removed a capsular bag IOL dislocation where we had to tease the capsular bag using a bimanual uh, method, and then Umber actually fixated the same IOL. Now, can you actually make a Chandler yourself? Now, this is a Chandler that's available. This is a 25 gauge Chandler costing around 9,000 rupees. So a simple thing that you can actually do, I got this from Amazon, and then you use a endoilluminator that you're actually disposing of. Then you just have to remove the handpiece, and then this is what, and remove a part of the sleeve, okay? And it works perfectly like a, endo, I mean a Chandler endoillumination. Initially, when I did this, I took a 25 gauge, but it just wouldn't fit into a 23 gauge. Then I had to go back, then I, uh, cut away the 27 gauge a 27 gauge fits perfectly into a 23 gauge cannula so you don't have to really purchase a chandelier of course you can't do complex maneuvers like what Rowan nicely showed us just uh, a few minutes ago but you will be able to do simple procedures when you have to do a pfcl fluid exchange when you don't have a double bore cannula or like i said removing a dislocated iul you can use the simple modification of a chandelier endo illumination and uh, I do hope that it helps you carry some of these thoughts and some of uh, the utility of these. Yeah, thank you all so much. Thank you, thank you Professor Pradeep and Kis. Now, because of the time, now I, uh, the next session is on ROP. Now I invite uh, moderator, Professor Parijat Chandra. Thank you, Dr. Pradeep, for a nice yeah. presentation yeah. and uh, innovative ideas so uh, we'll start the uh, our presentation first, minute, uh, huh. first we'll start uh, with the talk by professor rajpal who will give us an introduction to rop and his thoughts about it now hello ah uh, the introduction to ROP. It is my pleasure to say that in RP center or as far as India is concerned, if ROP is there, we must not forget the name of Professor R.B. Ajad who started the ROP screening program in India and all over uh, in RP center as well all over the India. And uh, initially we used to do cryo then laser and initially used to ROP surgery when I was with him. He is 4A4 Buckley and stage 5 ROP surgery when I was with him in ROP. And he has trained a lot of people in RP center and senior residents. And now we with the Parijat Chandra, he has also trained with the Parijat Chandra, me. We have a Sorya Ajat who is doing the ROP surgery and the Rohan Chawla. Now we are a four surgeon from one. It is the dedication to the Professor R.B. Ajat. We must not forget. In the last, I would like to tell, we must remember Professor L.P. Agarwal for his vision, a leadership quality to develop a center or like this in the Southeast Asian, first time in India for that. And our forefathers of the retina, Professor P.K. Kosla, Professor H.K. Tiwari, Professor S.P. Garg, and uh, Professor Ajat, and uh, Professor Atul Kumar. It is because of all them that the things has now improved. It is not the we or the I, I did, I did, I did. I is because of them. So we must remember our forefather who has dedicated their time in the RP. PhD was started with Professor R. V. Ajat. So this is the our contribution RP center that we were the part of Rainbow Trial, which is one of the international collaboration center in which the role of anti vegf in the RP was there. This is just a history which uh, Dr. Parijat Chandra will talk because with the time I am not going to talk much. 
Now I hand over the talk to Professor Parijat Chandra. Over. Thank you, sir, for the uh, introduction. Now uh, I will uh, invite uh, Dr. Ravi uh, to talk about new classification and screening guidelines. Dr. Ravi is a senior resident in our unit and does a lot of ROP. He is an expert in lasers, injections, screening. So, Ravi, uh, tell us what Now, other people are also doing. We must know in Delhi, Professor Sarita Berry is also doing, and people are doing in other center laser inter. We would like that this, they should also do the laser and the anti vaser treatment and screening ROP because of the few last decade, the ROP is increasing. And we would like our senior resident to take interest in the ROP because this is a service which they must do it. Dr. Ravi, please. Thank, thank you. you, sir. Good afternoon, everyone. I am going to discuss about ROP new classification and screening guidelines. The new ROP classification, ICROP3 has established in 1984, expanded in 1987, and revised in 2005, and updated in 2021 March. The updated ICROP3 classification has given few new terminologies. The new terminology is posterior zone 2, notch, stage 5A, stage 5B, stage 5C, AROP, recreation and reactivation, and PAR. PAR is nothing but peripheral avascular retina. Now coming to the zones of the ROP, as you people are aware, the zone 1 is circle with radius of twice the distance from the optic disc to the center of the fovea. Zone 2 is nasal margin of the zone 1 to oral serous, oral uh, uh, nasal ora serrata. Now coming to the new terminology, posterior zone 2. Posterior zone 2 is 2 disc diameter peripheral to the zone 1. That is posterior zone 2. This is the new term given by the ICROP3. The zone 3 is the residual uh, temporal crescent is called as zone 3. Notch. This is the new, new term notch. Notch is intrusion, intrusion by the ROP lesion into the posterior zone. It is 1 to 2 clock hours in the horizontal meridian. The stages of the ROP, as you are aware, the stage one is a demarcation line that is grayish white line parallel to the retina. Stage two is the uh, uh, ridge that is grayish white line elevated from the retina. Stage three is uh, extra retinal fibrovascular uh, growth into the vitreous. Stage four is partial retinal detachment. Stage four is further classified as stage 4A and stage 5, uh, 4B. 4A is macula sparing, 4B is macula involving. Now coming to the stage 5A, stage 5 is uh, total retinal detachment, that is stage 5A, 5B and 5C. The stage 5A is total retinal detachment with optic disc visible by the ophthalmoscope, that is open funnel configuration. Now coming to the stage 5B, stage 5 is total retinal detachment with optic disc not visible. It is due to the retrolental fibrovascular tissue. It is nothing but closed funnel configuration. Stage 5 is stage 5 is nothing but stage 5B plus anterior segment changes. What are the anterior segment changes? Anterior segment changes are anterior displacement of the lens, shallow anterior chamber, iridocapsular addition, and corneal opacities. Now coming to the pre plus disease and plus disease. The first diagram so showing there is no venular dilatation or arterial tortuosity. The second diagram showing mild venous dilatation and arterial tortuosity. Third diagram showing severe venous dilatation and uh, arterial torticity. So it indicates the severe plus disease. Now coming to the AROP. The previously we are calling it as APROP. That is aggressive posterior ROP. But ICROP3 updated as AROP. It is because of aggressive ROP can happen not only in the posterior retina, it can happen beyond, beyond the posterior retina. So what are the features of the aggressive ROP? Aggressive ROP is characterized by the junctionless, uh, junction is featureless, Large avascular loops, in, uh, loops and shunts, significant plus with neovascularization. AROP rapidly progressed to the advanced disease and characterized by the further prominent tunicular, uh, tunica vasculosa lentis, poorly dilating pupil, and neovascularization of the iris. Now regression. Regression could be, the, could be due to the uh, spontaneous or after treatment. After treatment, after it could be due to uh, laser therapy or it could be due to uh, uh, anti vaser therapy. Reactivation. Reactivation more commonly seen after uh, anti wave therapy. It commonly seen at uh, 37 to 60 weeks of postmenstrual age. And this is the fundus picture showing a baby when presented to the clinic at 34 weeks. Anti wave therapy has been given. And after a uh, few weeks after anti wave therapy, a normal vascularization is, has been happened in norm, peripheral vascular retina. At uh, 58 weeks, neovascularization is seen. This indicates the reactivation. 
what is par par is nothing but peripheral avascular retina peripheral avascular retina more commonly seen after anti-vagal therapy as compared to the spontaneous regression see here the fundus the fluorescein angiography uh, picture showing the peripheral avascular retina with venous dilatation and arterial arterial tortuosity so need to laser for this area now coming to the rop screening guidelines rop screening guidelines is given by the rbsk rashtriya bal swasthya karyakram what is the screening guidelines whom to screen you should screen uh, less than 2 2000 grams birth weight less than 34 weeks of gestational age we can also screen 34 to 36 weeks of gestational age with risk factors what are the risk factors risk factors are uh, prolonged cardiorespiratory problems uh, prolonged oxygen support apnea sepsis blood transfusion poor postnatal weight gain and periventricular hemorrhage and etc what are the international guidelines international guidelines are when to screen uh, whom to screen according to the inter international guidelines less than 1500 grams birth weight less than 30 weeks of gestational age or we can also screen between birth weight 1500 to 2000 grams or gestational age more than 30 weeks with with the risk factors when to screen we should screen within the four weeks or 30 days of birth weight or if gestational age is less than 28 weeks of our birth weight less than 200 grams we should screen within two to three weeks of age thank you Thank you, Dr. Ravi. Now I will invite uh, Professor Parijat Chandra, who is the one of the pioneer in ROP surgery in India. You know, and he has worked with Professor R. B. Ajat. Now, in the last decade, I have already told you the lot of ROP cases because of preterm and low birth weight. The cases are increasing, so we would like to have more and more people who would like to take as a ROP as a specialty. Uh, not many people are taking, but I think everybody should know regarding the ROP. Over to Professor Parijat Chandra. You know, one of the important AP ROP or aggressive ROP or June word ROP is increasing these days. When I was working with Professor Ajad, we, we used to do either the stage five or uh, not in between we used to screen there so i have uh, getting a cases where stage 5 is there one of the important thing i generally discuss is people doesn't dilate in a case of preterm baby then most of the people give me answer ki you should give atropine no if people is not dilating then you must think of it is a ap rop because in ap rop people doesn't dilate and uh, because of that we are unable to see and AP ROP is a fastly progressive disease. If you don't treat uh, early, then it is very difficult to do. In the recently past few years, because of the AP ROP or sometimes there's a haze, people doesn't dilate. It was a difficult to do laser in the beginning. You know, if people is not dilating, it is very difficult to do laser. Now over to Professor Parijat Chandra. So thank you, Ravi, for very nicely uh, showing the classification and the guidelines. So now we'll go on to ROP management. So we all know that uh, laser has stood the test of time. It is the gold standard for treatment, and we basically laser the avascular retina. We've been doing it for so many years now. Both eyes are lasered in one sitting. So the early treatment ROP guidelines is what we have been following for so many years. It's been two decades now since this guideline came out. It divided into type 1, type 2 ROP, and type 1 ROP is uh, you know, what we follow now for treatment. So what you will see that most of the cases zone one and zone two with stage two to three are what actually need treatment and zone one in any case will need treatment. So which area do we laser? We basically laser the avascular retina. So you see here this is a case of zone two stage two to three and uh, you laser this case and the disease will go away. Sometimes in cases where the ridge is advancing posterior barrage laser also done in selected cases, but typically you want to do it anterior to the ridge. 
A typical problem which newcomers encounter is when to laser in APROP. So this is a challenge situation because this is what you see. Now you don't know where exactly do you want to laser. So if you see an angiography picture of the same eye, you will appreciate that the blue line is where the newcomer will see that the junction is and that is where he will laser. Whereas you see the red arrows are where actually the vascular retina is and the entire area in between if you do not laser this disease is not going to go away and will continue to progress. So over time we have to develop a sense of exactly looking deeper into the fundus photo and seeing which are the vascular loops and which is the actual vascularized retina. Now this is a picture which we used to uh, see after laser of APROP eyes and if you had shown me this picture five years back I would have been very happy to see this. And we used to be very happy after you know, spending two hours of laser, this is the picture, it would come out, the disease would regress, the eye would be stable and we were very happy. But really is this outcome very good in 2022? So it has, you can appreciate that the problem here is that the child has got a very limited visual field right now. There's a poor macular perfusion, we don't even know it's vascularized or not unless you do an angiography. There's a risk of very high myopia in these eyes. So this outcome is no longer of any use in 2022. We need to do better than this. So uh, anti budgets have come into the fore over the last decade and again these have now emerged rapidly as the first line of treatment in zone 1 ROP. They not only allow rapid ROP regression, allow retinal revascularization which will eventually lead to better visual field and better foveal structure with lesser refractive changes. If you compare it with laser, it is a faster procedure, it causes less pain and is more stable for the baby who are usually very sick and very small in birth weight. So just to show you a few cases, so this case came to us, you know, it, it's a very small zone one posterior ROP which you see, you can't even see the disc, can't see the macula, just some preretinal hemorrhage is there. So uh, a vaccine was injected in this eye and this is what it looked like at two weeks, this is what it looked like at four weeks. And you see the entire TRD uh, which was developing there has gone away, the new escalation has gone away, the retina has grown, you can see it's gone normal to zone two and uh, the disc also you can see. So surgery was avoided, the macula, uh, came back, the vascularization proceeded into the periphery. So all this was not possible if you just went ahead and lasered this eye. Another case which you see here is the pupil doesn't dilate, it's got extensive tunica vasculosa lentis, extensive new vascularization which you see here. Now you can't do any procedure in this eye like laser if you want to do or surgery you want to do because it's very difficult to see behind. So inject and in three days you will see the pupils dilate very well. So this kind of magic is only attainable if you inject anti-VEGF which was not possible without uh, anti-VEGF earlier. And now you can go ahead and do laser or you want to do surgery or whatever you want once all this has gone away. So this can happen very rapidly with anti vegf In just three days you can see that this kind of difference is appreciated. Let's see another case here. This case comes like this. You know, that is the lines I've drawn just to show you that this is the only part of the retina which is vascularized. So earlier we used to go ahead and do laser in these cases. Now imagine if you do laser in this eye, what will be left? There's nothing to, you know, uh, see. So if you inject anti vegf in these eyes, this retina continues to grow. In four weeks, it will become something like this. So isn't this better than just going ahead and lasering these eyes? So we shouldn't be happy by doing laser in zone one uh, ROP where you get such significant benefits with an anti vegf injection. We have also started combining anti vegf with laser. For example, if you see this eye, this, has, this eye is, has a case of threshold ROP. And uh, you see, uh, even if you do laser in this eye, there's a high chance this particular patch which I have highlighted is going to lift up. So you combine anti vegf with laser and in a week you know this is it's all gone. So if you just uh, do laser and keep on waiting it's possible that it might increase in height, increase in width, it might continue to lift and bleed. But if you combine it with anti vegf sometimes it works much better than laser alone. Now while we have talked a lot of good things about anti vegf anti vegf has its own limitations as well. Uh, the biggest problem right now is uh, late recurrences happen. So at around four to eight weeks, you can find the disease comes back. This is very commonly happening. And so if you don't keep a very close follow-up and stay very happy that the disease has gone away in four weeks and stop follow-up, there's a very high chance the disease will come back in a more severe way. And then, you know, it'll be very difficult to treat. So you have to keep a watchful eye. If you feel it's coming back, then you go ahead and do laser in that eye. Or if it's come back very aggressively, you can go and do injection. Now, a lot of people are doing uh, uh, injections in an ICUs, in unsterile conditions, without magnification, that leads to a lot of injection related complications uh, like uh, cataracts are happening and you know endophthalmitis is happening. So we like to do it at RP center in the operation theater uh, under magnification of the microscope and proper monitoring which helps us to prevent these kind of complications. Which drug to use? Uh, we are using ranizumab, we use uh, avastinol cert at times. 
so it's your choice both work very well half dose is being used and usually one injection works uh, very well to bring the disease down uh, thankfully novartis uh, got this approval for ranzumab uh, in the european union as a pharmacological treatment for aropin 2019 and it is approved there so aropin surgery is a different challenge because it's a very small child sometimes you get babies as small as 34 weeks 33 weeks coming in for surgery so you need a very strong anesthesia team which is going to you know take care of the babies otherwise you can spend half an hour just finding the vein and then you do a very strong post operative uh, backup in the nicu so that these babies can safely be uh, discharged so how are the results of stage 4 rop surgery so this is a case which you see it's on extensive trd is developing in the nasal quadrant and uh, after surgery this is what it looks like at 4 weeks so it it really disappears very nicely if you do surgery at the right time the messenger is you have to go in early this photo which i'm showing is also a late kind of a situation although the outcome was good you have to go in much earlier than when a whole full blown trd has happened just to show you another case of 25g uh, uh, which this is typically how a stage 4 rop will look like three types of traction are here this is a tangential traction which you see which is joining from the disc to the trd you cut that this is the vertical traction which is now being relieved here you relieve all the traction which is pulling it into towards the lens it might be at times you can go and that thermize all that and just below the cutter you can see the circumferential traction which is pulling both the arcs together you need to cut that so once you remove all these three types of traction then only this trd is going to fall back so now you say the third circumferential vertical and tangential three tractions were all removed and now this pvd in this area has been done here's another case which has got a more posterior kind of uh, trd so here you see a zone one case where extensive trd has developed there so vitrectomy is done to leave the traction you can see the yellow kind of vitreous is there laser marks have been given just prior to surgery the fresh laser marks you leave the traction and do the vitrectomy all around is now the pink uh, retina can be seen and once you do all that then this is what it looks like at four weeks so you can see the entire thing has gone away so it, all the eyes don't behave in a similar manner this case again is pretty advanced and uh, you have to refer cases earlier for surgery they might not come out like this mostly they will come out worse than this even after surgery so you need need to be referred early we found a lot of use uh, of combining anti vegf with vitrectomy uh, in these eyes so if you see a case like this this case is already lasered in stage 4a rop and there is extensive new vascularization so early we should do surgery in these cases alone but surgery alone in these cases will not help because there is too much vascularization it will lead to lot of intraoperative bleeding lot of postoperative bleeding and still it will go ahead and close itself you should see it's a very small zone one posterior rop and this is the outcome which you get after combining anti vegf with surgery so this kind of outcome is cannot be obtained ever with just surgery alone you have to combine this as anti vegf if you want this kind of outcomes to come out in these selected cases not in all cases we also like to combine both eyes surgery together in one eye if especially if it's a case of uh, progressive bilateral 4a rop there's no need to wait for the other eye it's better to do both eyes together it allows timely management of both eyes there is single exposure to high risk ga because ga is the single most important problem in these very small babies and it's uh, if you can minimize the ga then that's the best way to go about it and the second eye obviously has to be treated like an independent surgery you need to rewash again and change the fluid change the instruments then you should do the other eye and parent counseling is very important just in case uh, something goes wrong stage 5 rop is a big problem in our country surgical results are universally poor but we do give a trial of surgery in these patients in the hope of getting some kind of navigational vision so the recent study from our center where you know we found that uh, if you compare the inborn and outborn babies 22.8% of the babies which were referred to rp center during the year had stage 5 rop and all the babies which came from the inborn screening program none of them had stage 5 rop this is just to tell you that we get a lot of load of stage 5 rops which comes to our center and all of these are potential medical legal cases because you need to screen in time treat in time and if you get a case of stage 5 rop it's mostly due to lack of screening in these eyes this is just to show how we like to operate it these are 23g uh, mvr which is going in through the clear coronal approach these are 25g instruments which goes inside through the 23g ports allowing for a snug fit the lensectomy has been done and the uh, this is this is one of the simpler cases i'm showing you because it's just got some membranes in the center is an open open funnel configuration you see the dense vitreous membranes are there you just have to remove these vitreous membranes and once you keep on removing them the you can see that the funnel is actually open from behind this is the last bit of tissue which you can remove and 
once you get that last pin, you can see the disc is there, you can see the macula is there. Not much dissection is done in this case, but this child was left for blind and it's already previously attached posterior pole in this eye. We didn't do any effort to attach the posterior pole. This is what it looks like four weeks. This is not to say that stage five has a good outcome. Stage five universally has a very poor outcome for surgery. What I'm trying to say is surgery can be attempted and tried in these cases in the hope of getting some kind of navigable vision. Even if he gets 160, 260, 360, he can still become mobile. He can go from one place to the other. He can go without crashing. He can go to the toilet. His life changes. The life of the family also changes. So in the end, rehabilitation is also a very important component of stage 5 ROP. It's not only about surgery. It's not only about telling them you have poor prognosis and letting them go home. It's also about giving them rehabilitation. Rehabilitation is a very important component of stage 5 ROP. In fact, for any blind baby due to any disease, which could be to corneal problem or glaucoma problem, whatever it is, rehabilitation is a very important component to make them independent and, uh, you know, independent members of the society where they can, you know, lead their life on their own. This is just a glimpse of the rehabilitation clinic which we have at RPA Center in Community Ophthalmology. So we showed you a lot of challenges along the way. There's a lot of challenges in surgery, laser, anti a lot of human resource, a lot of effort goes into this. We have an excellent team of senior residents which put in a lot of effort to laser these babies, inject these babies, operate these babies. But what is the best way to avoid all this? The best way isn't it to just prevent ROP. If you can prevent ROP, all these challenges can just you know go away. So why prevent ROP? Because if you have good NICU practices, ROP will not occur. Even if it occurs, the disease will be just in zone three or something which just regresses on its own. So if you can prevent ROP, that is the best way and will avoid all these challenges. So we showed you a lot of AP ROP. We showed you a lot of stage four, stage five ROP. We don't see it at uh, coming from the AIMS and ICU. For the last 20 years, I have not seen any case of AP ROP from the AIMS and ICU, any case of stage four, any case of stage five. And although we do have just a three, four, five lasers from the AIMS and ICU every year, we do hundreds of lasers from babies coming from outside. Just to show you that if you have good quality of care in the NICU, ROP does not happen. Even if it happens, it will be very mild and you can get away with it. So if you can prevent it, that is the best way forward. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Parijat, for having a good discussion on the ROP. When we started, Dr. Vaya Sharma, we used to do in 95 stage 5 ROP surgery. That was the beginning and that is the thing. Uh, we used to have those in the, those days but now these days our only objective is to prevent the stage five and that can only be done by the good neonatal practices one of the important thing which has which uh, dr parijati mandra will tell you the oxygen management you know the mistake by giving a high oxygen concentration i did they you should tell to the your neonatologist to how to maintain the good oxygen concentration dr parijati Yes, so as I said, best and ICU practices are very important and you need to need and maintain a saturation of 88 to 92 percent. So most people, what they do is they maintain saturation of 100 percent in some NICUs. What happens is at night, if you make it 100 percent, you know, the baby goes pink, the alarm stop, everything is nice. In the morning, when the rounds happen, they again make it normal. So we visit a hospital where this was happening. A lot of APRP was happening. They couldn't figure out why it was happening. And realize at night, the nurse was making it 100 percent. And the alarms go off, the baby is quietly sleeping, everyone is sleeping. In the morning, they bring it again back to the normal. So that those are some of the practices which actually forces them to become uh, APROP. So there are very clear-cut guidelines for pediatrics uh, of best and ICU practices regarding breastfeeding, regarding vitamin supplementation, regarding blood transfusion, control of sepsis, maintenance of oxygen saturation. So all those guidelines, if you follow, this does not happen. Proper use of blenders. So it's all very important. and. Uh, it's, it's fortunately now being recognized a lot by the government of India and a lot by the pediatric societies and they are doing a lot to train uh, the pediatricians towards uh, awareness of these uh, best practices. Thank you, Dr. Parija. Now, There's a question. Which, uh, uh, question. Post treatment. How, should... how, how long should the child be followed up post treatment and resolution? So I suppose you're talking about if it's for laser, then mostly after laser, it will just uh, after a few weeks, it will go away. But if it's after injection, they need to follow up and look for reactivation because reactivation occurs in a large number of cases. So you follow up for reactivation. And if you can uh, 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 deal with it in time, that's the best way. You pick it up in time. That's the best way. If still at 8 to 10 weeks, 12 weeks, you still have a large area of peripheral vascular retina, which is left behind. It's better to go ahead and laser it because as the child gets bigger, he will not allow you to examine. The peripheral avascular area will left. The parent will probably realize they followed with you for last four months. Everything seems okay. They'll stop follow-up. And then, you know, the child will develop a reactivation, which is late. 
and then it will be very difficult to manage. So if it's a late uh, uh, case, is not reactivating and a large amount of peripheral vascular retina is left, then you can possibly go ahead and laser it. Uh, maybe if there is a uh, zone one, achha, okay, then let us, uh, next is Dr. Ayushi. Okay, she will be presenting the case of post-injection recurrency. Thank you, Parijat Chandra. So in laser, after doing laser, we should not worry, you know, but after injection, we should have a longer follow-up. That is the point which should be emphasized because of the recurrences. In after laser, uh, it is all right. And there's a difference. Huh. Dr. E.C. Good afternoon, faculty delegates. I shall be discussing a very interesting case in ROP, which is going to give us some key learning points. We have a 35-week old baby uh, born at 30 weeks of pe period of gestation low birth weight of 1.9 kgs twin birth born out of low uh, lscis baby had risk factors of respiratory distress syndrome sepsis and an nicu stay for 10 days the child was screened at agra and was referred to us on examination we have a zone 2 anti rop hybrid picture with stage 3 left more than right owing to the no number of neovascular fronts and vascular loops in this patient we went ahead with intravitreal anti vegf injection lucentis ranibizumab injection was injected half dose that is 0.25 milligram and 0.025 ml in both the eyes sequentially as a part of a single procedure under topical anesthesia and cardiac monitoring and operation theater post injection the child was followed up regularly and at two weeks we can see that the vessel caliber has decreased plus disease has decreased the vessels are straightening and the previously existing ridge with fibrovascular tissue has regressed remarkably the child was followed up regularly and at four weeks we find a development of a ridge which was not that earlier so we have developing stage we call it reactivation and we planned for laser photocoagulation under sedation in phd setting after laser the disease as we can see has regressed and this is a picture at 47 weeks of pma so dealing with a case of reactivation reactivation can occur ranging from 2.5 to 12 weeks post injection and a th from 37 to 60 weeks of postmenstrual age uh, although rainbow trials suggest 20 percent reactivation literature shows ranges up to 80 percent and also seen in our clinical practice Laser is a gold standard for rescue in these cases. Although reinjection can be considered in cases where we have large number of neovascular tissue. And as Sir said, if there are large areas of persistent neovascular retina, even after injection, which is not reactivating, we can still consider laser so as to combat long term recurrences that can occur and have been reported. So, anti VEGF is an attractive treatment option in cases of ROP where it allows for treatment retina to grow beyond the initial zone of arrest and regular follow-up is key post anti vegf injections post ranibizumab we have a recommendation to follow up the child up to 24 weeks of injection or up to 60 weeks of pma and in case where we don't have reactivation we can still go ahead with laser of the uh, avascular retina in case of the disease and which helps in disease regression effectively thank you so thank, thank you, you Ayushi. I think it was a very nice presentation and uh, thank you for presenting this case. So what she tried to basically show you was a recurrence happened a little real in this case at four weeks. So recurrence and reactive or reactivation is a reactivation. If it started occurring, a course which was going downhill has now again come back. So don't keep on waiting. Don't keep on waiting for it to worsen because uh, uh, a reactivating disease can come back even worse than the initial disease. So the moment you find a disease reactivating, you can go in early and treat the disease. Thank you. Uh, uh, now we'll now coming to the quiz questions. This is the first question. Gestational age is 31 weeks and birth weight is 1.3 kgs and PMA is 36 weeks. What is the zone of ROP? First of all, first question is what is the zone of ROP? Anyone? Uh, Batawi. Zone two. Yes, it is zone two. So coming to the question, what is the first line of treatment in zone two? Anyone, please. Laser is yes, laser is the gold standard because of recurrent chances are very less and we uh, prefer to do in zone 2 is the laser. This is laser. zone 2 or zone 2 posterior? Zone 2 posterior. Uh, 
कैसे पता प्री प्लस है या प्लस है सो व्हाई डोंट वी से इट्स प्लस बताओ बताओ इट इज प्री प्लस बिकॉज ऑफ पोस्टीरियर वेजिल्स आर नॉट मच डायलेटेड as uh, it is not uh, in, uh, fitting for plus so, you know, it might be pre plus for one it might be mild plus for another it yes. might be moderate plus so there's a lot of discrepancy between experts they have just put a photograph on the base of which you want to you can't have the photograph with you all the time so so many people call this plus also many people say this is pre plus also so there's a lot of deviation in opinion but the idea is there's an activity going on in the disease there's a new vascularization which is happening so this case needs treatment uh first time fluorescence angiography in rop patient was done by whom in india there is a article on that professor rv azad okay so you should remember okay you should read the all the article coming to the next question we have a 28 week baby birth weight 1.1 kg pma 34 weeks when the patient has presented so what zone can you see in this fundus picture yes very good so it's zone 1 secondary to notch as per the new zone classification zone 3 can go so as per the new classification we uh, mention the posterior zone and we uh, add such the sub, uh, secondary to notch in to it now coming to the third question what does ro mark indicate in given fundus picture what is that Yes, that is laser marks. What is that specially named for that? Yes, that is Baraz laser. Yes, Baraz laser indicated usually in advancing diseases. Uh, given uh, laser marks around three to four to four to five, around four to five layers posterior to the ridge, so it prevents the advancing the disease. So this is showing you an older photograph. This is showing an older photograph. So if this case currently comes to us like this. probably go in for a surgery rather than wait for baraz earlier when the surgery options were difficult or the injection options were difficult in cases which were in uh, small zones we used to try laser baraz the problem with posterior laser baraz which is in the posterior zone is you can go ahead and go very close to the posterior pole it's more preferable to go if you have got a zone 2 anterior or zone 3 where you want to do it but if obviously it's a case of advancing traction it's better to go in for surgery rather than you know pray that laser baraz will take care of something Uh, fluorescence angiography uh, why it was started in children which are the indication definite indication so basically sir we do it in cases as i showed that in some cases where people are not able to make out hmm. what it is so it gives you a very clear picture of what it looks like you know that Although, is the one study done by the parijat chandra from the rp center us in which we have shown that uh, there is a area of ischemia which we were not able to see am i right yes sir oh, in many okay. cases you just not able to make out okay okay so in those okay. cases it works very well oh don't hesitate in uh, treating rop patients at least you should be able to detect and refer early i mean that is the important even you are not treating but even you should know that these are the severe cases which has to be refer uh, very early and as compared to those patient which you can follow ha ah. okay pet now professor Rohan Chawla is going to talk on the pattern recognition in uveitis. Okay. Thank you. So uh, I'll be talking on. I request Dr. Sorry Ajad, who is a pioneer and one of the vitro retina surgery work in the uveitis and trained under Pr Professor Pradeep Venkatesh. I also invite him to be on the chair. So uveitis is a complex disease with uh, various manifestations. and it is necessary for you to understand the and make out patterns in this uh, disease to able to identify the diagnosis correctly so how do we make a diagnosis in uveitis so here you have to act like a physician and less of uh, like a surgeon and you have to think you have to first ga gather the data that is the history and the examination and generate a hypothesis test it by your treatment and sometimes you might find that it is not true and you have to re reflect on it and your diagnosis might change so how do you generate your hypothesis so common strategies are you should rule out the worst cases you should round up the usual suspects first before going to the rarer diagnosis and what we are going to talk about is know the common patterns and make a diagnosis according to that so first of all confirm whether it is actually uveitis or not it could be a masquerade it could be a non malignant masquerade or it could be a malignant masquerade i think uh, there is another talk on that so we won't go much on it 
So it could be something like lymphoma leukemia where you have in adult patients RP changes or vitritis. Once you are sure that yes, I'm surely dealing with an inflammation in the eye, then as we said, go for the worst case scenario, rule out whether it has infectious causes, rule out whether it is a malignancy depending on the age and the presentation. If it is not that, then you classify it into the known patterns of uveitis. So the known patterns have been variously easily dis, uh, classified according to the morphology. So we start with anterior uveitis. So anterior uveitis, this would be the common symptomatology pattern. The patient would have pain, redness. You would find cells in the anterior chamber, keratic precipitates. So based on that, you divide it further. Is it granulomatous? You see whether the KPs are large in size, you can well define. And if you are seeing granulomatous, then this is like sarcoidosis, tuberculosis, lens induced. These are some of the common differentials which the in which direction you would start thinking so this patient had such large keratic precipitates and probably some lens matter itself deposited it's a lens matter induced uh, uveitis in that patient if they are very fine and you cannot appreciate them clearly then we call it non granulomatous most common a variety of uveitis in that would be hla b27 related so again you have to go back and check with a pattern of young male low back ache history of neck stiffness or something else fits into it other associated uh, causes also could be there with HLA B27. In young patients where the uveitis may not be that symptomatic, it may be chronic, indolent, the eye might be white. There you also need to do some screening. But then again, if there is a changes of chronic anterior uveitis are present, band shaped keratopathy, the patient would fit into the pattern of a juvenile rheumatoid arthritis associated uveitis. If you see a hypopion there, then certain differentials which become prominent are HLA-B27, Bechet's or endogenous endophthalmitis. If generally the IOP goes down in anterior uveitis, but if it is high, then it again becomes a different set of pattern and where you can have again different causes. So look for iris atrophy, it could be herpetic uveitis. It may again not be uveitis at all. It might be posner schrossmann syndrome. You might also have to look at the angle if there are a lot of pigment there, Krukenberg spindle or even more of pigment in the anterior chamber rather than cells. It might be pigment dispersion syndrome or something which has been recently described called bilateral acute iris transillumination uh, or bilateral acute depigmentation of iris. Again, in these entities, you do not require to pump them with steroids. So you'll need to differentiate based on that pattern. So fuchs I want to uh, mention separately because this is an ent entity which is which you should be able to diagnose and separate from the other patterns because this is probably one of the most benign type of uveitis where don't over treat and the results of cataract surgery is also very good. So sometimes cataract surgeons become hesitant when they see these patients, but probably they should operate them because they would give them good results. So you should uh, have to identify this stellate pattern of KPs going all up till the top of the cornea and most importantly is the absence of synechia. And some of these patients may also have nodules on the iris and some can have mild vitritis, but not significant. So this is a separate entity with a typical pattern. So why do we need to know this? Because once you say it's fuchs, it's fuchs. You don't need to investigate anything. Not a single penny of the patient you need to spend. And you can go ahead and manage the patient with uh, steroids or cataract surgery if required. So the intermediate uveitis, there would be a different pattern. More prominent history would be floaters, decreased vision, relatively white eye. Yes, you will have some spillover cells in the anterior chamber also. You might have snow banking in the inferior areas. So some amount of peripheral vasculitis or chorioretinitis is allowed in this category. But I, if the retinitis or something extends much more posterior, then I would rather put it in a pan-uveitis group. Cystoid macular edema would be present, disc edema would be present, and you will have some peripheral leakage. But then if it is intermediate uveitis, prominent causes would be probably just sarcoidosis, tuberculosis, and some countries describe multiple sclerosis also as an association. So going on to posterior uveitis, so here also we try to classify patterns of choroiditis, retinitis, but what you have to understand is that once the inflammation starts, it will always spread. But your aim is to identify where it primarily started from. So if it started from choroid, it can later go on to the retina and become a chorioretinitis. Started from the retina, it can go to the choroid and become a retinochoroiditis. But if we know where it primarily started from, then we know that a few certain causes are more common to be associated with this pattern. And we will then investigate only for those causes. So choroiditis, so these would be deeper lesions. You will have these retinal vessels much more clearly visible over them. They will have some leading edges. 
so here you see these are the active patches whereas in the center already spontaneous this is an autoimmune disease healing has started pigmentation has started it may be unifocal ghbc type of lesion it may be multifocal so here again another lesion where centrally already the healing has started whether you give steroids or not and peripheral the lesion is active we do not want this stage to happen we would like to give steroid before the macular involvement is there some patient might just present with a patch right at the fovea there you can't do much or you may not have such leading patches you might just have a placoid sort of lesion with some subretinal fluid better appreciated on fundus autofluorescence and whenever the placoid lesions are close to the disc and patient's vision is less than what you expect you should always investigate for syphilis and this patient did come out to be tpha and vdrl positive so that is choroiditis and retinitis the lesions are much more superficial they will obscure the retinal vessels they may mimic cotton wool spots so in this paper we have described these three different types of retinitis lesions now this is more of a plaque type of lesion this we have attributed more to herpetic causes now this lesion where you see necrosis and some overlying inflammation this and a focal lesion this we have attributed more to toxoplasma and then this is a different category where we see something like cotton wool spots edema some hard exudate star forming and a disc edema so this we have seen generally after post fever that can be due to chikungunya dengue or even the bacterial rickettsial causes so another this is again example of headlight and fog appearance typical toxoplasma so here you see again a white patch obscuring the retinal vessels it's more of retinitis this patient had history of skin herpetic lesions so here also you notice there are lack of hemorrhages which is again a little differentiator between cmv retinitis and a herpetic retinitis because herpes spreads more via the nerves and cmv spreads more via the endothelium so more tendency to cause hemorrhages in cmv although we have an indolent variety in cmv also now this patient again you see this white patch here now this patient also had an associated hypopion so the next question to the patient was do you have oral ulcers and the history was positive so we diagnosed this patient as bechet's disease this is what we are talking of cm typical pizza by cmv retinitis and sometimes again you can have retinitis not just at the posterior pole but spreading centrifugally again lack of hemorrhages young patient immunocompetent patient so my first preference for diagnosis was towards the herpetic etiology and give valcyclovir rather than valgancyclovir if you want to still confirm you can probably go ahead with uh, cytology but that is what i said you will have to then reflect if your treatment doesn't work then go ahead and to the next stage if the patient has associated history of pain significant pain on eye movement and focal lesion and then you see that the elevation of choroid is there uh, you can always go ahead and supplement your examination with an ultrasound if you find fluid there it's a t sign so this would rather than be a primarily scleritis which has come into the choroid another patient we saw with significant choroidal folds and cells in the eye and you do an ultrasound you find significant thickening of the choroid and the t sign so this was a case of again posterior scleritis resolving very well with steroids vasculitis has already been discussed i'll not go too much into detail so you need to know what is active vasculitis when you see the inflammation spilling over from the vessels associated hemorrhages and some retinal edema it is active if you just see white patches along the vessels it may just be healed sort of vasculitis so please differentiate it between active vasculitis and healed vasculitis and then see whether it is only venular involvement or also arterial involvement and this is the some of the common causes so vasculitis causes macular edema which needs to be treated irwan again i will not go into it this has been talked of earlier some panuitis cases have a very grave prognosis so some of them have need to be mentioned separately a patient with multiple neurosensory detachments you see cells also there in the anterior chamber you see an oct full of white dots again inflammation there lumpy bumpy choroid you do an angiography you see multiple focal leaks with pooling in the late stage this is typical of vkh again when you know it is vkh no need for any other long investigations uh, sympathetic will behave like that if you see patches of uh, circumferentially spreading patches of retinitis occlusive arteritis and vitreitis this is a triad of acute retinal necrosis you need to treat with antivirals bechet's disease has already been discussed and endophthalmitis is a separate category which you will diagnose if you have one of these scenarios uh, happening white dot syndrome has also been separated and talked of uh, a lot by many people most of these names have been given by gas and he gave them just based on the morphology 
so if you know what apmpp stands for you will know what to look for so it is acute posterior multifocal placoid uh, epitheliopathy so you look for these multifocal sort of placoid creamy white lesions somewhere near the posterior pole and if you do an angiography you will find early hypo going into a little late hyper may be associated with this leak this is typical of apmpp on the other hand if you see finer granular dots, which may be more better appreciable on a fundus autofluorescence, you don't see anything happening in the choroid, but you see loss of focal ISOS junction and some of these filiform pillars, and there can also be a, a large blind spot. So this pattern, then it becomes multiple evanescent white dot syndrome. Another one is azure, which is a zonal area of involvement with history of flashes and focal again loss of ISOS junction and a centrifugal or centripetal spreading and changing pattern of fundus autofluorescence as the disease progresses. This is a young patient. Again, you see zonal involvement of RP changes and history of splashes and floaters. And with these in this zone, again, you have this altered fundus autofluorescence. If you see the OCT near the peripapillary area, you have loss of ISOS junction. And in the other eye, you have a, a, a parafoveal also loss of ISOS junction. And with time, you see how the autofluorescence is changing. So where probably the RP is now dying out, it is becoming more of hypo. So these are zonal cases. And these three syndromes, there is a controversy on whether to treat very aggressively or not. So that will probably depend on the visual acuity. Some of them would all uh, res just resolve on their own. And you may not need to treat. So all this, for this, you have to be a thinking doctor and a think like a physician. But yes, you also will need to, I think, be attentive to the entire needs of our patient because these uveitis patients, these are chronic diseases. If you put them on such drugs which have side effects also. So you have to be and managing the overall patient and not just be after the diagnosis. So in all, one has to take care of the patient and uh, help him out through this pathology. Thank you. Now I will invite, thank you, Dr. Rohan. Now I invite Dr. Sorya. Dr. Pradeep, anything would you like to comment? Already huh, yeah. covered. So I'll be speaking on masquerade syndromes. So you just uh, listen to the lecture in which you have to think harder and find the pattern of uveitis and recognize how it is uveitis. The next step that you have to do is think even more harder and try to understand it's not uveitis. So masquerade, if you see the literal meaning of the word, then it's a way of hiding the truth. So what seems like uveitis is actually not uveitis and it is some other pathology. So there's no inflammation involved over here. So the AC reaction that you might see or a hypopion, RL cells infiltrate, vasculitis, they're all not of inflammatory origin. And this imposter is what malignant and malignant masquerades. So I'll be first going with the malignant, non-malignant masquerades, which are easier to diagnose in the form of cases. So the first case, if you're seeing an antechamber uh, uh, reaction and some RL cells, and if you see the fundus on a direct ophthalmoscopy, not a dilated examination, you treat it as a case of anterior uveitis and it's not responding to your treatment. When the patient comes back, you see that there is a retinal detachment. So peripheral retinal detachment can present with some form of AC reaction. And in such cases, these, these are resistant to UV treatment with steroids and fundus evaluation is Im imperative in such cases to rule out underlying pathology. So another case in a young uh, 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 child, a patient who presents with signs of anterior uveitis with redness, watering, and inflammation in the anterior chamber. If you go on and look at a careful examination of the cornea, you might see a cell-sealed perf and a foreign body in the angle. Now, this may simulate as an anterior uveitis. This is especially seen in cases where 
in children who do not give a proper history of uh, trauma and also adults which are predisposed by their occupation. So these foreign bodies are occult and they may sit in the anterior chamber angle where we are not able to see and we might be treating them as a anterior uveitis. So this was a male patient, a young male patient coming with complaints of blurring of vision. And if you see the anterior chamber, you are seeing these pigments and you are seeing these pigments also on the anterior lens capsule. Along with transillumination defects that you see, you are seeing a case of pigment dispersion syndrome. So it again can simulate anterior uveitis and there is no use of giving any steroids in this patient. Krukenberg spindle and transillumination defects are, uh, are the points that you should look for to come to the diagnosis of pigment dispersion syndrome. So this was a patient who was being treated outside uh, with steroids and you can see there is this yellowish lesion on the fundus and it is also leaking on FFA. If you see the OCT, you can see there's a neurosensory detachment with some subretinal deposits. Now this is a case of central serous choroidopathy with a fibrinoid reaction which might simulate a focal choroiditis and now this patient was giving, was actually getting a treatment which was causing the main problem. So in such cases, corticosteroid can actually aggravate the situation so we need to uh, find what is the actual pathology. In this patient, it was a 25-year-old girl with a uh, complaint of headache. And if you see in the fundus evaluation, you can see disc edema, macular exudates, flame-shaped hemorrhages, and also few hypopigmented spots suggestive of choroidopathy. Well, you can think that it might be a, a case of neuroretinitis. However, this was a case of hypertensive retinopathy. So it can mimic in different forms. If it is only hypertensive retinopathy, it might suggest these uh, mimic a neuroretinitis. If there is more of a choroidopathy, then it might also uh, mimic a choroiditis. In cases, as uh, Sir just mentioned, VKH, where you get multiple serious NSDs and a lumpy bumpy um, appearance on the OCT. Well, the lumpy bumpy appearance might not be there, but there might be neurosensory detachment. In such cases, it is a bilateral, and if you check the BP, you can see that it is a case of hypertension. This is a simpler diagnosis. If you see RL cells in a patient with pigmentary retinopathy and you're thinking of a posterior uveitis, yield uveitis, well, it's a case of retinitis pigmentosa and you can see the history in which you, they'll give a history of night blindness and ERG will be confirmatory. This will be a little harder diagnosis. So if you see a patient which comes to you with the complaints of floaters and blurring of vision and these are these white opacities that you see on the posterior lens capsule and a glass full vitreous that you can see in the anterior vitreous phase, the posterior segment evaluation shows vitreous membranes and a media haze. Well, then you, are, you should raise the suspicion of amyloidosis. And typically in these cases, they are diagnosed as intermediate uveitis. However, when you do the OCT, there is no CME showing that there is no inflammation. So in such patients, they have a typical appearance of uh, pseudopodia lentis and glassful uh, appearance of the vitreous. They may also have some neurological deficits and they might have a family history as well. So in such cases, vitreous biopsy is confirmatory. So a uh, young boy coming with these sort of vascular changes that you see in the periphery on clinical examination and then exudates that is there present subretinally at the posterior pole with the subretinal fibrosis and you might think that it is a form of some posterior uveitis. However, when you do an FFA, you can see these bulb-like dilatation and telangiectic vessels which then clinch you to the diagnosis of Coats disease. So Coats disease, again, there is no inflammation. It is simply diagnostic on an FFA. So now we're going to the malignant masquerades. So if you see a patient, elderly patient, who is being treated outside an intermediate uveitis and there is some vitreous inflammation, you are seeing these hypopigmented patches on the posterior pole. And when you go ahead and do an OCT, you see that there are these sub RPA deposits and there is no CME. When you do an FFA, then again, there are no signs of inflammation on FFA and you're seeing these are areas of RPA atrophy. It might raise your suspicion and these patients have generally gone to multiple doctors and they have not responded well to steroid. They showed an initial response and thereafter they were resistant to steroid. You might then think on the lines of a lymphoma and when you do a vitreous biopsy, you can see these atypical cells. So intraocular lymphoma can be seen in elderly patients and these lesions may also be detected before the CNS involvement is there. In such patients, you see seeds of vitreous cells and subretinal infiltrates. They respond poorly to steroids and cyto cytology and immunohistochemical staining is confirmatory. Sometimes even melanomas may mimic as anti uh, uveitis when it is of the ciliary body and at times when an amelanotic melanoma may be present, then you, it might simulate as a granuloma or a posterior sclerosis. UBM might be suggestive of the correct diagnosis. 
now this was a young male patient who presented with and was being treated outside as a vasculitis and when we saw the patient we saw that these white centered hemorrhages and we thought maybe it is some sort of a hematological or a leukemic retinopathy and when we gave sent for the cbc and the um, peripheral examination it came out to be cml so leukemias can manifest as a direct manifestation of the leukemic infiltrates on the retina perivascular tissue or the optic nerve as seen in one of the photographs or an indirect manifestation in the form of anemia thrombocytopenia or a hypoviscosity they may simulate either it anti-uveitis or a posterior uveitis and cbc and peripheral smear is is helpful in the diagnosis so again this is a male patient who is a chronic smoker came with complaints of bilateral vision loss and as you can see on the fundus evaluation a yellowish elevated lesion with indistinct margins now when you do an ffa you don't see any signs of inflammation you see a blotchy hyperfluorescence and then on an uhg you see a solid mass with a moderate internal reflectivity so this might be a case of metastasis and most commonly in a male it would come from the lungs and choroid is the most common site of metastasis visual impairment as seen mostly as it involves the posterior pole is due to involvement of the macula or an exudative rd so these lesions are slightly yellowish and plecoid with indistinct margins and can often be multiple and bilateral so so this is a solid mass and on uhg you can see there is variable internal structure and moderate internal reflectivity so on doing a systemic evaluation the patient might be having a primary foci so again a 4 year old child presenting with uh, this sort of a anterior segment in which you see an exudative material with some exudative material even on the iris and leukocoria when you do an ultrasound you see there is an intraocular mass showing calcification and you know that there is a diagnosis of retinoblastoma so retinoblastoma may present under uh, ages of 5 uh, uh, years and may present and mimic any form of uveitis and these may be caught on ultrasound when you where you can see calcification to summarize if you you get a uveitis which is not responding to conventional therapy then it should raise a suspicion of masquerade age though either extremities of age early uh, childhood or uh, elderly patient again should raise a suspicion of a uh, mas uh, masquerade syndrome involvement when you say for example if you have an anti uveitis and you are seeing cells but you are not seeing any kps you are not seeing any posterior synecke then in such cases and the pupillary dilating well then you again think of a masquerade and likewise say for an intermediate uveitis if you are seeing lot of vitreous membranes but you are not seeing any cme then again it is might be a masquerade so a meticulous history examination appropriate investigations reveal an underlying systemic pathology thank you Yeah, what, what Shaudia tells you is actually the the term masquerade syndrome. True masquerade is very rare. Okay, it's more of a masquerade clinical evaluation. You've not taken a proper history. You've not done a clinical evaluation, or you've not applied your investigations correctly. So that's why the term masquerade clinical evaluation is better than masquerade uveitis. Once you go back and see, you will know that the fault is in you, not in the presentation. Okay, yeah. Yeah. Dr. Yes, Mosmi, we have Dr. Mosmi. Yes, he's presenting on rare uveitis entity. Yeah. Good afternoon, everyone. I'll be discussing a rare case of uveitis, where a 14-year-old female was referred to RPC casualty from neurology department with blurring of vision in the right eye since one day. She had presented to the neurology department one one month ago with a history of holocranial headache and dizziness one and half month prior to it, with associated episodes of transient visual obscuration and bilateral lower limb claudication. She also gave a history of sudden onset painless diminution of vision in the left eye one month prior to it. NCCT head was within normal limit. MRI revealed multiple flare hyperintensities in bilateral subcortical white matter, suggestive of cerebral ischemia, with uh, CT angiography revealing moderate to severe stenosis of the bilateral internal carotid artery. A provisional diagnosis of moya moya was made, and the patient was started on antiplatelet therapy. Ophthalmic evaluation was not performed at that time. At present, the patient was referred to RPC casualty for evaluation of right eye to rule out CRAO secondary to moya moya disease. On ocular examination on the same day, a visual acuity of 6 by 9 was documented in the right eye, and left eye revealed a visual acuity of PL positive, PR inaccurate in three quadrants. Uh, the uh, anterior segment findings were within normal limit. 
Fundus rival pallid disc edema with venous dilatation and microaneurysms in the right eye and left eye rival optic atrophy with blunted foveal reflex. The patient was instructed to follow up the next day for further investigation when a sudden drop in visual acuity to 1 by 60 was documented in the right eye. On ultrawide fundus imaging, uh, venous dilatation, pallid disc edema and microaneurysms with venous bleeding was noted in the right eye. A left eye rival blunted foveal reflex with optic atrophy. Uh, fundus fluorescent angiography revealed delayed arm retinal circulation time with abs absence of choroidal flush and watershed area in the temporal retina uh, with optic disc hyperfluorescence. With delayed venous feeling and microaneurysms, cattle trucking of the veins as well as diffuse peripheral perivascular leakage. Similar findings were also noted in the left eye. Uh, on systemic evaluation, undetectable pulses and non-recordable non BP were noted in both the limbs. However, ESR and CRP as well as CBC was within, uh, were within normal limits. Based on the findings, we came to a provisional diagnosis of right eye takayasu retinopathy stage 2 with AION and left eye optic atrophy secondary to ischemic optic neuropathy. Uh, the patient was started on systemic steroid and was referred to rheumatology for further investigation and con confirmation of our diagnosis. Where CT angiography was done and there the, all the branches occlusion and thickening of all the branches of arch of iota were noted and ta type 1 takayasu arteritis based on angiography classification was diagnosed. Patient also met the ACR criteria for Takayasu arteritis. On seven day post steroid therapy, there was no gain in visual acuity. The visual acuity was finger counting close to face. However, there was reduction in the optic nerve infarction as well as a uh, reduction in the retinal ischemia. So basically the most common ophthalmic manifestation of Takayasu is hypoperfusive retinopathy, which when severe can lead to uh, ocular ischemic syndrome. Other findings, other manifestations can be hypertensive retinopathy, which can be secondary to retina, uh, renal stenosis or mixed retinopathy. AION is a very rare manifestation and when it occurs, it usually has a bilateral presentation. So the learning points from our cases, AION in a young patient should raise a suspicion of Takayasu arteritis. Yeah, uh, Takayasu arteritis is characterized by two phases, pre stenotic phase, which is characterized by uh, elevated inflammatory markers and ischemic or pulseless phase. Our patient was in the ischemic phase, so steroid therapy might not provide a pro uh, favorable visual outcome once ischemic phase has already set in. Though eye manifestations in Takayasu arteritis is rare, however, ophthalmic uh, uh, evaluation should not be ignored. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mosmi, for a nice presentation. Now I invite Dr. Prabha. He will be talking on post-COVID candida endophthalmitis case. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm going to uh, present on post-COVID candida endophthalmitis. This was a 60-year-old female who was diabetic, presented to a three-week post-recovery from COVID with the complaint of decrease in vision in the left eye. On examination in day one, the visual acuity was 1 by 60. There was a focal lesion at the deeper level of the retina which was a white uh, with fluffy diffuse borders. On OCT, we found that there was retinal thickening, shadowing there, and there was subretinal fluid there. A provisional diagnosis of metastatic fungal endophthalmitis was made. A vitreous biopsy was done along with that intravitreal loriconazole was injected. On calcofluor coH staining, budding yeast cell was found. So a candida on that endophthalmitis diagnosis provisional was made. Uh, in management, we started intravenous voriconazole, then IV amphotericin was, B was given. Uh, subsequently, TAP posaconazole was also given. But the most important thing was amphotericin B and casfofungin combination injections were given. A total of four injections were given, and with that, uh, we had a successful treatment of this uh, lesion. On culture, we found candida tropicalis, thus proving our diagnosis. So on four-week follow-up, uh, a visual acuity of 4 by 60 was achieved, and we, as we can see, there was a resolution of the lesion. And OCT, there was decrease in the retinal thickening and there was a resolution of the subretinal fluid. Finally, at two month follow up, a visual final visual acuity of 6 by 60 was achieved and we are able to observe a scar at the posterior pole. So, what is the risk factor? We have to keep in mind uh, that if there was a history of high dose intravenous corticosteroid therapy during uh, COVID management, there was prolonged hospital stay, long dwelling intravenous uh, cannula was there, pre existing comorbidities like diabetes mellitus and reduction in peripheral lymphocyte count, which is seen in, with uh, COVID infections. So what are the inv investigations we have to keep in mind? Blood culture has to be same. Uh, serum beta galactomannan level has a doubtful role in diagnosis. Vitreous tap and biopsy should be taken and this should be sent for calcofluor white KOH staining, culture on sebrodextrose agar and PCR. Uh, so this is a study published in Retina in 2007 in which uh, spectral ruminosity findings in candida ophthalmitis was uh, discussed. In this, they had uh, uh, discussed that the candida could spread to the eye through two routes, either through retinal circulation or through choroidal circulation. So if it spreads to the retinal circulation, 
as you can see it only involves the inner layers of the retina and uh, the outer layers and the choroid is spread because the candida has a tendency to grow towards the vitreous while if it spreads through the choroidal circulation and it first involves the choroid then the outer layer of the retina then the inner layers and finally the vitreous so how does how does it matter to us it uh, helps in uh, managing these cases because if it's a primary choroidal involvement systemic antifungal is the mainstay of therapy although intravitreal antifungal should be added so amphotericin b fluconazole voriconazole and posaconazole are given systemically while if it's a primary retinal involvement intravitreal antifungal is the mainstay of therapy but systemic again should be uh, added so voriconazole amphotericin b and casforfungin are made the intravitreal antifungal treatment given so vitrectomy should be uh, used uh, only uh, done only in case in which there is severe vitreous or uh, vitreous involvement so the take home message is if a patient comes especially after covid we have to look for the risk factors the typical appearance of white creamy or focal lesion would be seen it could be a primary choroidal or retinal involvement treatment the intravenous antifungals and intravitreal antifungals as in our case vitrectomy wasn't done and successful treatment was uh, done with uh, combination therapy vitrectomy should be only done in severe vitreal involvements because it uh, responds good with a combination intravitreal therapy thank you thank you now i will invite uh, for the quiz dr mosmi and pranav so this was already discussed so it would be a easier question a uh, 35 year old may uh, uh, presented to us with diminution of vision in both eyes with a visual acuity of 6 by 24 in parts in the right eye and 624 in the left eye what is the diagnosis and the lenticular finding so this is the typical picture of some things in the vitreous something sticking behind to the lens on oct there was no cme Which and again there is something sticking behind the lens kya diagnosis hai एनीबॉडी शोरेस नहीं नहीं कोई नहीं नहीं पूछो बताओ मत ने हाँ <laughs> इसका सुना नहीं इन्होंने किसने बोला वो तो सॉरी नहीं चलो इट्स विटस अमाइलोसिस एंड लेंटिकुलर फाइंडिंग इज सुडोपोडियल लेंटिस सो इट्स अ डिपॉजिशन ऑफ अमाइलोइड विच इज अ हाइलेन एक्सेसरियल मटेरियल कॉंगो रेड ऑन कॉंगो रेड स्टेनिंग एप्पल ग्रीन बायरेफ्रेंजेंस इज टिपिकली सीन ऑन पोलराइज्ड लाइट microscopy and uh, the finding significant was there was no cme in oct as compared to intermediate uveitis in which there would be cme on oct so this is a spot diagnosis a 45 year old male presented with acute diminution of vision in the right eye to 1 by 60 what is the diagnosis typical finding of the vessels finding bata do kya hai isme so vinod sir said it are bolna nahi hai trusted uh. branch angiitis there uh, there could be multiple causes idiopathic cause which is immune mediated is mainly seen in the younger uh, population especially in uh, children in viral it said that uh, antigen antibody complex deposit in the vessel wall like in cmv and aids which gives this appearance it could be autoimmune in which it said that autoimmune the immune complexes deposit in the vessels or and it could be a malignant cause in which they said the malignant cells like in leukemia lymphoma directly the malignant cells deposit in the vessel wall giving this appearance so this is the final question a 30 year old female presented with blurring of vision in the left eye in fundus photography uh, this is the fundus photography picture this is the fa picture early phase and late phase and this is the icg picture early phase and late phase what is the diagnosis correct apmpp why because as we can see apmpp starts for acute posterior multifocal placoid pigment epithelopathy it's a inflammatory chorio retinopathy it's a part of white dot syndrome and placoid typical placoid lesions are seen it could be a, a central it present with central or paracentral scotomas photopsia or metamorphopsia in fluorescent angiography we can typically see in later uh, in later phase, uh, later phases there is a hyperfluorescent lesion as compared to mutes in which it would be in early phase also hyperfluorescent would be there in icg uh, we can say it's a hyposenescent lesion both in early and late phase so it's typical of apmpp thank you thank you thank you or to nahi ha thank you everyone and thank you delegates i hope uh, you gained something from our workshop and uh, we would like to conclude here with a vote of thanks
to all those who participated to make this uh, grand success. So I would like to thank our chief, Professor Titial, for organizing these workshops. Professor Rajpal, sir, chief of our Vitro Retina Services, for allowing us to uh, do this workshop. All of us participate in it together and make it lively. And Dr. Pradeep, Dr. Parijat, Dr. Vinod, Dr. Sharya, and all the presenters who made it uh, very uh, the presentations and put in all the efforts to make the presentations and presented them uh, very nicely. And I would also like to thank our audiovisual team, in-house team, and the team from outside, and our sponsor Sipla, and photographer Mr. Praveen. And thank you very much. And you can join us for lunch outside. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, okay. Yeah, we can have a group photo. A group photo. Ajay, <laughs> <laughs>